Roll back, Chief. Roll back. Who's this, Rick? This is Rick. Roll back. How are y'all? All right, doing good. Good. What's the date today? Today is uh, March 6th. March 6th. 2000. Okay, 2004. I'm speaking from the belly of the beast. I think it's uh, what they call a Sunday. Right. Right, I just want to greet the whole family, and we want to straighten up some more questions that you might have that I may have overlooked. All right. What is the question? Okay, one of the questions is, do you feel that you received a fair trial by a fair? <laughs> that's a joke. I mean, that's a joke. Was, the fair trial stopped on way before May 8th. The fair trial stopped when, way back in, uh, let's say, uh, what is it, 1997, when Seals, Howard Richard Seals, badge number 217 of Putnam County, said he got the first letter, and he didn't do nothing about it from, from 1997 all the way up to 2002, and he was classifying me as a pseudo-pedophile and all that kind of stuff. But then he didn't arrest me. He let me roam and, and circulate among children for a whole 10 years, which means he didn't believe the story he was saying. He couldn't possibly believe that I was that dangerous, otherwise he would have not left me there, or he just didn't care about the kids, one or the other. But that's when the trial stopped being fair. When, they first, when we first got down here and they plotted, hey, the trial is not based on this, this arrest. This trial has been going on day after day since we've been here. They just used everything they, once they exhausted all their means by using all of the, uh, what do you call it, forfeiture this and civil this and uh, property this and we didn't do this with the permits and we didn't do that there and the house is too close to this and the house is too tall and this is too this and there's too many houses here and there's too many. When they finished and they saw it, when they got to the end of that, they still let the judge down and exonerated me from all responsibilities and all charges that was taking place in Putnam County and established that I no longer had any interest in Putnam County and that I had literally been a citizen of Clark County, voted in Clark County, car registered in Clark County, purchased a house in Clark County, social security number and everything there is logged in Clark County, right? They knew that I had got away from them and, and um, they panicked. You follow? Right. So what they did then is they said, we got to come up with something better. And then they said, they started this whole thing. They knew when they came down, the first bogus indictment was already, the which seals that came down and with a bogus grand jury, and that was overthrown. They knew then they was going to do five more indictments until they could confuse the public by throwing indictment after indictment to the public. They know the public's interest is short. Attention span is short. They knew they would lose the public's interest after a while. And by the time we got to the end, it'll look like that's what should be in charge. And they'll forget all of the bogus charges that took place from 2000, May 2003 all the way up to now 2004. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, no, in no way in the world you can say, I got a fair trial. Not to mention that when I, the, the panic started for them <clears throat> after June 30th, while well, in middle of district court, when I made it very clear that I'm an indigenous person, I'm a chief of the Native American Moors, the Creek Nation, that if we are registered with BIA on the 208-1999, and that we are indigenous people, we're not trying to, we're not trying to seek federal recognition and fall up under them. We're saying we we're colonists, and our tribe, Yamasee, was here long before they got here and before 1776 when they set up their laws. And we did a family chart. We had an outside genealogist confirm the family link from the Yamasees from Georgia all the way to Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Indians all the way back down to Georgia and down into Florida, St. Augustine, Florida, where uh, the brother of Ben York went, and that was all, you know, on, uh, what do they call those, Yamasee the bones were recently found. So they knew that this case is more about jurisdiction and sovereignty and, and indigenous status and inalienable rights that we have as a tribe of people as black-skinned Indians in here in the wilderness of North America. And that's where they panicked. So they set out then to get a man that could overrun this here or override the facts of when they take a chance and just do what he wants. And that man was put into place by uh, George Bush's father, which is Hugh Ashley Royal, right, when he chased his descendants he back and found out he was born a Confederate family and in Brunswick, he's from Brunswick. So he moved it there, check this now, he's from Brunswick, right? He practiced law in Brunswick, families in Brunswick, and he moved the case there in Brunswick. He selects the jury from, from whites around Brunswick or Savannah or nearby communities and puts, he made his own jury, then he made it so nobody could question the jury, so nobody knows the jury is so, so nobody could find out whether he picked them and how he picked them. Well, we sat there and we had the moments, like I said before, we have the minutes or the transcripts of the jury selection where he selected them himself. And everybody who came in there, who walked in that room and said, yes, I heard about this case, everyone heard about the case, they read about the case, or they had, but none of them got it from the flyers that the bogus so-called flyers that they claimed that he claimed in court on record that the flyers were responsible for spoiling a uh, budget. All that was part of the plot. There was no fair trial. And now we wasn't allowed to present our evidence. We wasn't allowed to present our witnesses. They had no DNA to verify it. They had uh, the children. Some, some of those girls were grown. There was no kids there. Some of those girls were grown had venereal diseases that I do not have. They had no videotapes, any, uh, what do you call, any tapes with me on any tapes, any pictures with me on any pictures, any audio.
regular telephone conversations of me having any kind of, you know, vote, nothing like that. They had they showed a tape to everybody of me and a bunch of people coming out from Applebee's and we're coming from Applebee's celebrating somebody's birthday and everybody got food. They said, see, look at that. What do you see? You see me walk out and you see uh, my wife walk out. You see a couple of people behind us, another adult and the, and the girl whose birthday we were celebrating. They all had the little uh, doggy bags with them and we got in the car and it was a night shot and that was the best. The man who sat on the stand who said that he was a surveillance man admitted on the stand. Well, I have many, many tapes, but they only showed that one. Why would they only show that one? Because all the other tapes, he said, did you ever catch him doing anything? No, did you ever surveil him on the land? No. He said, well, what did you do? He said, well, every time I surveilled him, he was somewhere outside. Where? Every time I went to Conjures before I went to the restaurant, I went into a Bible store. They didn't want him to show that. They didn't want him to show me going into the Bible store in Conjures, Georgia, in the mall, and buy a you know, Bible to be passed out every uh, Saturday at our classes on the Shabbat. That they didn't want, so he cut it down. But the tape they showed had nothing to do with sex, had nothing to do with racketeering or anything, just me walking up. So they could do that with anybody coming out of any restaurant, right? Let me go back. They had no physical evidence. They in no way tied me to anything. They didn't tie me to no stuffed doll. They didn't tie me in to no videotapes. They didn't tie me to, to no pictures. They didn't tie me into no audio tapes. They didn't tie me into anything. They did not prove their case at all. If I was, they didn't even attempt to. What they did attempt to do is establish that I'm God, or I think I'm God, and, and, and approach it from a religious standpoint of view, which resulted in the jury being so confused that instead of them asking for some pertinent part of the evidence, which wasn't there, they had to ask for something ridiculous as the Holy Tablets. What does that, what does the Holy Tablets of a religious book have to do with a RICO case and a, and a molestation case? Nothing whatsoever. So why are they asking for that? Obviously, because the prosecution was pushing a religious thing because their attempts and their plan is to use this case as a precedent to go after all the black churches up in Georgia, throughout Georgia, because there's a lot of very prominent black ministers now, and they have very large congregations, and they're very powerful, and that means they control many, many, many votes. So the whole thing is a plot that was put together. Jake and them was a part of the conspiracy. They had to figure a way to get this thing to make it look legit. That's why they got Jake York, who had his own charges, put him on salary, threatened him up, told him they'd give him, they'd give him immunity from all, his, all the stuff he did, and we got a whole list of things that he's involved in illegally. It's up on the, in, on the internet if you want to go there. So, no, it wasn't a fair trial. He, the judge himself, who actually was, planned it. He ignored my, my, my request for continuance, which I needed because I was trying to get rid of these lawyers that they pinned on me, which I said was never mind these Caucasian lawyers, and I got this black lawyer, Adrian Patris, and I sat right there in front of that judge and I said, I, my constitutional rights, according to your beliefs, tells me I have a right to get a continuance because this lawyer, after eight, this lawyer, you sent me to New York for reevaluation, right? When I came back from New York, after 90 days of the reevaluation, the psychiatrist said I was sane, he said I was a black Indian, he confirmed everything in his statement. They tried to take that out, but we have it on record, right? When I came back, now, I go before you, I say, okay, now I'm ready. I wasn't planning on fighting no trial with no guy and no law firm because I found out that they were working with Putnam County and they were working with the government, so I was not trusting them. And they, they gave me an Indian guy called uh, Manny, but I found out that this Indian guy called Manny had a Caucasian wife and that he himself works for the government as a military lawyer. So I knew I was in the wrong hands. So I said, no, I'm uh, what am, what am put these people against? I don't need them. So I got a black lawyer. And when I got the black lawyer, I told the judge that we need a continuance so I could work on the case. Because after all, y'all bounced me to like 10 different prisons, so I couldn't be stable, so I couldn't get my, my, my case together. I couldn't find me. Every time I get settled in one place, he'd fly me somewhere else. He cut me off the telephone. He cut me off from pens and pencils at certain times. He cut off my mail at other times. He cut off my business. So I, wouldn't, I couldn't really work on my case. So I have a box of stuff that Garland would bring in. And I'd never see Garland himself, but he would drive these boxes left off of my case, and then they'd move me, and they'd leave the boxes behind. Then that stuff would be lost. And I'd end up in another place where you can't and get that stuff. And it went on like that there. If I was, when I finally got before Judge Wells in making Middle District down a private meeting because he didn't want to have this open, but there's still minutes on it, transcripts, he, I said to him, I need time to work with this lawyer on my case. Because after two years, the prosecution had two years and two months to work on the case, investigate, to find people, to track down witnesses and victims and all that there. And they came up with naught. They came up with no evidence. They came up with nothing concrete whatsoever and nothing that tied me to. What they did is use the law called hearsay. There's nothing no one said I said. It's what other people said. There's no statements of me. There's no tapes of me. There's no videotapes of me. There's nothing that they could, they could have put anybody in that courtroom and had people get up there and do exactly what they did and found that person guilty. You follow what I'm saying? Right. Well, it, up, it didn't matter who it was because it never tied anything to me. If I don't, they, they, they show my uh, bank statements, but then I bring my accountant down from New York for 30 years. I've been working with him for 30 years, and he plainly says, well, this man has never been audited in 30 years. In fact, he's overpaid his tax. I can't even see how you can get a RICO for $10,000. This man deposited 
there's millions of dollars in the bank over, over a period of time. So where that came from, so what they did is the prosecution, uh, Master Wood lied and said, well, so if he was living under another name, Dwight D. York, a bogus name, right? right. A name it doesn't exist, exist that I never lived under, right, which is called a misnomer, which they have on all the documents. But if he was living under that name and he didn't tell you that he was doing another kind of business, would you know? Which is a stupid question, because the answer to the question has to be no. But he never said to the man after that, well, in fact, he didn't, he doesn't uh, work under any other name. He doesn't live under that name, Dwight D.R. He never did any, there's no document. They never put one thing on the screen in the court to show anything where I sign my name as Dwight D.R. Or, or any bank statements or any accounts or any private accounts or any private investments under that name. They just use a trap to trick the jury. Well, the jury is already working with the judge anyway, but to make it look like they're tricking the jury into thinking, well, maybe, you know, well, maybe this man was doing something behind his accountant's back. Right. This would support their, you know, their, their attempt to get a week away. It made no sense. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for running on, but I talk fast. Okay. That brought up another question. Um, yeah. There are rumors that the officials in Edenton know of a person named Dwight York, and they were saying there was a distinction between Dwight York and Malachi York. Oh, yeah. It's very clear. See, they had meetings. They had so many meetings that was going before the Board of Commissioners, right? And uh, Mary Ann Turner got a document. We have the document where she's talking to a person named Dwight York, and she, she separates Dwight York, the son, who's in his 30s, from Malachi the York, the father, who's in his 50s. It's in black and white. She says, oh, I know the difference. I met the, I met the son, but I never met the father. So everybody in Brooklyn County knew all the time that they was using a bogus name. But in order for them to tie and say to the public that I was a previous convicted felon, which I wasn't, they had to use another name. Because they used my name, there were people who went into computers because they know we have police officers and we have uh, FBI agents that are part of our organization. They would have pulled up on the computer and found that I never was a convicted felon. And all those charges they threw out in the beginning of this case in the newspaper, let me look like a monster would have disappeared immediately and I would have been eligible for bond. So in order to do that there, they had to use a misnomer, create a fictitious character, and then feed the public with he's a convicted felon, he's an ex rapist all these things that they later on had to come back and admit was not true privately, but would not admit, they have not come back onto the media and proved it to them yet, and admitted to them yet. So they knew all the time in Putnam County that Dwight was my son. Okay. And not me. They knew that all the time. They knew the age. They knew when he used to come here because he was living down here in Georgia before I got down here. And he used to go to all the board meetings and talk to all those people. Jerome Dean Adams was there. That's before Seals even got in town. That's when they had uh, Sheriff Russo there. And Jerome Dean Adams and Marion Tandem came on the board. They keep on being. But they encountered my son. And they knew who he was. And they know I'm not him. And they know he's not me. They're just deceiving the public. That's part of what they're doing to try to get this case so they can try to take those people's land out there and try to take our women to stop us from propagating our teachings. Right. Today's date is March 8, 2004. This is an exclusive interview with my cool chief, Black Thunderbird Eagle. How are you doing this morning? Okay, for a man who's in the belly of the beast on the house of Patmos, I'm doing all right. Okay. Well, um, I have some questions I think that um, the public would like to be cleared up, man. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I hope about everybody first. Go ahead. Is it true that you did not move to Georgia with any of the alleged victims? It's a known fact. In fact, the parents of the victims that they did have on the stand all admitted, one after next, that they moved down here. So some mother right there told them that she came down with us and we didn't come to no land. We went over to Macon, Georgia. They lived in Macon. Other people lived in um, Savannah, Georgia and different places. I was not the first down here. I didn't bring any children down here. In my vehicle, when I came, there was no children in my vehicle at all. whatsoever. all adults and we have all that log on record and verified. The courts tried to ignore that. Okay. Now, um, is it also true that when you got to Georgia, people had already began to move um, to the land and were already in Georgia? Yes, there was people already living on the land months, months, and months before I came down to the land. Okay. Right? The families were already, some was already settled here, some brothers here preparing the land and all of that. When I came down, in fact, it was abrupt. Right? Mm -hmm. We came down here purposely because the Eagle Rock Mound, Rock Eagle Mound, is right down the road from us. That's why we came here as the Matthew Native Americans was coming back to our own land as indigenous people. But the other family was already down here, not only in Putnam County, but on that land and throughout the young Spotter, Macon, and different places already living there before I even got here. Okay. Now, the land itself um, was originally purchased as a pure trust, or can you explain? Not purchased as a pure trust. A pure trust is a common law term. Okay. Right, where you turn the property over to a company, to a pure trust. Okay. Georgia is under common law. Seals and them will keep you in the new paper and, and play games with people in Georgia and say, they're made using this old common law thing. Look it up and you'll find out Georgia is under common law. Georgia State don't even have a forfeiture law at all. So the feds had to be created to get a forfeiture on those people's land. And they know we had a pure trust. When we went to Jones County Court before Hugh Winfield and the pure trust was put before 
him and questioned. He said, I'm not touching that. We got the minutes to back that up. I'm not going nowhere near that. And he left it alone. And so we left it as that was it. I moved away. I moved to Clark County. Forgot about the land. Had no interest in the land. And was not even visiting the land. That was another lie. I didn't visit the land for over two years. It wasn't there. So what happened is they forced me to come over because they said, we need you to do a quick claim deed because the judge and them won't release this. They won't recognize our pure trust, even though they knew all the times a pure trust was legal in the state of Georgia as common law. But he said he wouldn't use another tactic to force my back against the walls. I said, okay, I'll sign a quick claim deed, whatever it is, just get it out of my hair. So I signed a quick claim deed over to a bunch of owners, and then they established in court in, in the final meeting that I had no interest in the court, and this was Judge Pryor, right, and Lawson, as an attorney for the state, of the, of the county, I think he was at the time, paid a fee of $16, established that America Z York or Chief Black Thunderbird or Esau, whatever you want to call me, has no interest in the 404 Shady Dale Road property. None of the 476 acres were, will have any interest in. It's not mine. It's other people's. They're just justifying trying to steal it. Okay. Now, um, with that being said, the property you said you moved down to Georgia because it was Native American, your Native American roots were here in Georgia. Was right. it also true that the land in upstate New York that's, that's mentioned in the indictments, that was also Native American land? That's right. We had a reservation set up there, signs, there pictures of it. Different tribes we used to come up there. We used to have powwows up there. It was in Liberty, New York, and that's where we used to gather. We were dressing in Native American clothes. We had Native American music. We lived our culture up there before we came down here. It's not something we acquired when we got here. It's not no newfound idea. I was a Native American all my life. Regardless of what religion I got involved in, or what fraternity I got involved in, or what culture I studied, be it Masonics or the Egyptians or the Christians or the Muslims, I was still by birthright and by gene and, and genealogy a Native American, a massive Native American of the Creek Nation in the state of Georgia. From Georgia, we traced our family track and the railroad tracks all the way up to Massachusetts, from the Massachusetts Indians to the Pico Indians, all the way back down to the Cherokee, all the way back down to the, the Creek Confederate. And then even over to Florida, where we found Chief John Horse, whose name was Juba, which was Ben York, my great-grandfather's brother. And he was down amongst the Seminoles in St. Augustine, where they recently found bones. Okay. And you can trace him out also, John Horse, they call him. Okay. And um, is it also true that, because in the, in the trial, they're trying to say that um, these certain alleged victims were traveling in interstate commerce. Um, is it true that the alleged victims moved with their own mothers and fathers to Georgia and That's on exactly. their own? Each one of them. Uh, when, when, um, when Abigail was up there, her father got on the stand. He confirmed that she moved with him. Tatiana Thomas, right, called her Tia, her mother was on the stand, and she confirmed that she moved down with her. None of the victims moved with me. None of the victims was in my vehicle. Their parents are the ones who transported them down there, and they didn't transport them from up on the mountain directly to that land. No, they moved from different places. Some of them wasn't living up on the mountain. They came from different parts of up there in the north, whether it was Philadelphia or New York, and came to different parts of Georgia. And then later, they moved on the land. On, you know, they got permission from whoever and moved on the land. I think at the time, what the people in charge of the land hmm. granted them that right, not me. It had nothing to do with me. Okay. Now, is it is it true that there were no allegations or reports or charges of anything dealing with sexual abuse in New York or upstate? Right. Our organization existed since 1967. Got incorporated in, in as in uh, Nubian Islamic Hebrews and Zolar community around 1973. Okay. Now, from 67 to 73, we had a community set up. There was none. From 73 all the way up to 1988. From 1973 to 1988, there's never been any type of claim of anything to deal with molestation or child or child abuse or sex scandals, nor anything dealing with bank fraud or any type of all the stuff they call RICO or money exchanges. None of these things existed from 1967 all the way up to 1988. They started fabricating their charges from 1988, and it's not backed up by any of the truth. Mm. So you have absolutely no allegations of anything, any children. Don't forget now, you're talking about about four people, four children, and about four adults that are making a statement after thousands of members. There's thousands of members that passed through our organization from 1967 all the way up, and all of them have children, and all of their children are the same ages, and they have sons and daughters, and if you ask them, these are the ones trying to get on the stand to say, which the judge would let them, this is not true. I know these kids. I know the kids are making the claims, and I know him. I mean, we've been knowing him, Baba. They make a big deal about the word Baba. Baba 
a very common word. Baba means father, whereas whether it's Ava, Baba, or Abu in different languages. We are fortunate to speak different languages other than English because we taught them different languages so they'd understand different things in culture. But they would use words and cliches and things to make this, to hype it up. But it doesn't work if people just use common sense and say, the organization started in 1967 and then have no complaints of any type of child molestation through, through the man's whole beautiful part of my life, the whole time from the time I'm like 20-something all the way up to 50-something, there's nothing. And then I wait till I'm 50-something years old. I'm going into the old age, and then I start playing games and pretending, and they're keeping records of me having sex up to something like five and six times per day at my age? Impossible. Right. None of that stuff existed. They created that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's all a plot to take the land and to stop this organization and to prevent our tribe from getting its sovereignty. We are your massive Native American Moors. I declared my sovereignty. I stood up for my indigenous rights on June 30th. And here comes all the noise getting ready to come back in now. Okay? <laughs> okay. And I did my best to make it clear to the world, I do not fall under their laws. They came to our land. They invaded our land. They brought their stuff to our land. You follow? This is our land. Okay. Now, dealing with New York, and that's where the basis of the Massachusetts Indian and some of the Native American roots that you mentioned before, Yes. Now they're saying that there were no, there was no financial um, crimes alleged right. in New York None. or anything of that nature. Right. Now, one thing that's always been put in the public is that Mr. York or Miss Dwight York um, is a felon. Right. Is it? Is it true? Absolutely um, not. I am not a convicted felon, and they know that for a fact. Otherwise, they would have tried to tag gun charges on me. Because that's what they love to do, tag gun charges. They found a bunch of guns, and if I had legal guns in my house, and I'm not a felon, so I swear there's no gun charges. <laughs> Excuse me. Anywhere in this case. Because what they're trying to tie to me is stuff that took place 35 years ago when I was a kid. Mm. And it was done on the youthful offendant. The youthful offendant does not register in as a federal charge. Right. So that was all part of a plot also to stir the public. He's a convicted felon. He had rape. They call rape or statutory rape when I was a kid. I had a girlfriend. She was younger than me. And we got involved and we had a child. It wasn't a thing where I raped anybody and walked away. It was statutory rape. And it was my girlfriend. And we lived and we didn't break up. We had the child and we raised the child and everything. You follow? Yeah. So that's just another ploy. That's another ploy to win people over to make me look like a bad guy. Just like the 100 wife story. Mm-hmm. You have 100 wives, plus he's having sex with 100 children. Hello, who is he? Super, 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 super man or something? Right. These things are impossible that people just use their logic to say the thing they're saying don't make sense. They don't even add up to make physical sense. They're mm-hmm. impossibilities. Right. Now, the, another issue that keeps being brought up, and I know we've discussed it before, but that's the name of Dwight York. Right. Where, where did this Dwight York okay, name come from? The name Dwight goes back in the family now, the relatives, mm-hmm. right, on my grandmother's side. We have our whole family tree up on the Internet and they can see it, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't have a first name. They get my birth certificate, the one issued to me here in Boston, Massachusetts, you see there's no first name. It's just male. Every other person who belongs to the family of Mary and David have first names. All right? But in my birth certificate, of course, there was no first name. So now, they took a name that my grandmother used to call me short, she used to call me Dookie, and different nicknames, right? And that's the name I named my son, Dwight, right? And they took that and got him and his life mixed just off of mine and started making this statement that I had, you know, that my name is Dwight New York. This is illegal. But all the documents they file have the wrong name on it and it's the wrong person. And even in the statements they made in Putnam County where Mary Antonio mentioned the age, the age matches the newspaper articles where the newspaper article, the making, uh, 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 making Telegraph made a mistake and used Dwight York and said age 36 or 34, which is my son's age. Right. So they knew they had the wrong person all the time. So there's a misnomer in the process. Right. right. To get them to sue them for using the wrong name. You cannot try a person with the wrong name. Right. When you can correct the name. And I'm walking around the state with the correct name, Malachi New York, and the feds are still pushing the wrong name. This is illegal. Because right. Because got to keep these people from being able to go back and check these names. Because if they pull these names up, smart people like our organization will go on the computer and try to find out. Does he have a felon? Was he this? Was he that? And they'll find it's not true. So they got to try to keep a bogus name in front of the public so the public won't be able to look up the real name. And right. Not the, the stories are not true. Right. Now, dealing with the tribal and um, the organization, or not just the organization, but the tribe with other organizations within it, moving from um, New York to Georgia, what would cause so many people to move? What is it that would make people want to move to Georgia? I know there's been mentions of you moving to Georgia because of safety for your life. Um, things of that nature. But I, that wasn't the reason why. That's what prompted me to move uh, abruptly. 
Right. I ain't moved for safety. My, I moved down there so I could be back near my ancestors. Right. Not Native Americans. But because there was a threat on my life, that made me speed up and move, you know, a bump. But many people came down because which we're a tribe of Indians. Okay. And tribes move, and, and tribes move from place to place. They're, admi they're admitting that there's another chief from our tribe called Latif on one hand. Okay. They're admitting that there's another chief. There's four or five different chiefs. They have the Shinnecock with us, the Cherokee with us. We have the Navajo with us. We have the Washita with us. These are different tribes, right? right? All belonging to, you know, all, all Native Americans. You follow right. So when people heard that I, as as the chief of one of the groups, you're mounting Native American Moors move, some people started moving there. But other people had already moved down here to be close to the ancestors before me and had their own chiefs that they, was, that they, that they were under their chief. I'm not the chief of all in the Hopkins. I'm not the chief of all the Indians in the world. I'm not their sole leader. I'm not in control of everybody's minds or everybody's thoughts or everybody's finances or who sleeps with who or when they sleep with them. All that is bogus job in the seals and then came up with to establish a monster case. Right. Okay. Now, I know because earlier we were mentioning that there were time periods where no allegations were uh, right. reported, like 67 and 70. Long time. But also in 1993, to, from 1993 when the move to Georgia was done or was, was taking place, right. to all the way to 2002 up until still making still the arrest. No, it was still not until, not, not, don't say the 2002, but then they will use that. From right. 1993 all the way up to 19, uh, 97, there was nothing. Okay. 45, 67, nobody complained. Meanwhile, they're saying that these events started in Brooklyn. Right. But nobody complained. And the people that they're saying it say it happened in Brooklyn, but then they followed us down here. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -mm, so not at all. Follow me down here. Here's your chance. If I move abruptly and nobody moved with me, then you didn't, when you, when you gave me the move, you told me, I don't want to go down there. I want to move with that man because he did this to me. How come then you move down here and live down here and then later on stay here until you finally get put off the land and then you make your allegations? Right. That does not make sense. Right, and that's um, from 88, from 67 to 1988 is 21 years. 21 years of no complaints, whether it was financial or IRS or sexual or sexual abuse or mm -hmm. any molestation. So actually, we have to do it from actually we have to do it from 67 to 97, which right. would be 30 years. 30 years. Okay, mm -hmm. that's do it from Yeah. 30 so. years, no complaints, and all of a sudden that becomes my new nature. I right. Just, you know, that's not the pedophile law. We investigated the types of pedophiles, the different types of pedophiles, and what makes them work the way they do. And there's none that fit that profile. Right. Mm. That is, it's, I mean, it's amazing when you do the facts and you see it actually in front of you. This is, is this case is, it just doesn't make sense. It's a hoax. It's a big hoax. They're setting a precedence to try. First, they're afraid of me because of my books and my teachings and the fast growth of my organization worldwide. Mm -hmm. Then they saw an opportunity to combine the two, to go after all the other black, black men down there because of votes and control. Mm -hmm. So they said, like, we can't get this man. He doesn't do anything illegal. He pays his taxes. He does everything right. we got to come up with the most, you know, what's the, what's the best way? Oh, let's use that new RICO thing we have we use on drug dealers. Mm -hmm. That's why the case looks like a drug dealer takes. So we can just get anybody to get up and say, yes, he did it, yes, he did that, and that's all it takes. And there's no hearsay, so they can't go back and forth and say, well, didn't you tell me this? Didn't this happen when they cut all that out? And that's why the judge locked the case down. This what they made, this, this so-called York case, mm -hmm. is really a drug case. Mm -hmm. They use a drug case, uh, let's say, pattern to lay this case out. Right. The way they deal with gangsters. How are you going to call our organization, we go against them. You got corporations that you talk about, we call ourselves the, uh, the enterprise that's not registered. Yes, right. the so-called enterprise that's not registered is depositing money in the banks. You tell me the banks are receiving money from an uncorporated enterprise, then the banks are corrupt. Mm -hmm. How are you going to have all these different organizations existing at the same time, and then you say the purpose of organizing, organizing and changing the name was so we can hide who we were, but all the organizations are still existing all at the same time, and different people belong to different ones. Right. All at the same time, but you're, just, mm -hmm. but you're making it look like it's better off a facade from group to group, from name to name, to change to change. When you're a Muslim, you pick up a Muslim name. If you're Indian, you pick up an Indian name. If you're Christian, you be, when people you become uh, Catholics and they get baptized, they give them a gift, a Christian name. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever you're studying at the time, that's the name you come. So when we're Samarians, we have Samarian name. We're studying Samarian. Right. We're studying their language. When you're Muslim, you have an Arabic name. When you're Christian, you have a Christian name. Except when you're Indian, you have a Native American name. That right. makes sense. You can be all of those things and still be one person. Right. You can be a Native American by nature. You can join a Christian church. You can become Masonic all at the same time. And you can study Egyptology. Right. You can be young, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, still, uh, and still be the same person without it trying to be some kind of plot or scheme, you know, to, to, uh, to confuse or divert just attention from yourself. How can I try to hide who I am and I'm as public as I am? Right. I'm not only public in the so-called religious world, I'm a public in the music world. Mm -hmm. I talked to you all about albums and groups that I produced. I was on video tapes. I'm all over the dog place. How can I be trying to hide, trying to make it look like I'm COVID and I'm, I got an organization, I'm speaking around, I'm doing all this stuff. How can I do that as advert as I am? Mm -hmm. And you can't, go, you can't go nowhere in the world where somebody don't know who I am. Right. And I'm so 
me by the music that they know 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 me by the Is it true that you did not control who came to live on the property? Absolutely. Look, they, that's the stuff they, they found a couple of lists they call, you know, um, passes and all that kind of stuff they were trying to do. But first of all, well, for the two years, when the two years was gone by that I was supposed to be in Clark County and not living on the land, then who was controlling it then? Mm -hmm. Who was deciding who gets on, who leaves? Who decides? All these people said they'd jump up and left when they wanted, and their sister came back and they came. Well, if they was visiting, my mother visiting, my sister visiting me, I wasn't there. So if they're visiting, if sisters and brothers were visiting, who was giving them a place to come to the gate if I wasn't there? And if I was in control of all of that, then how was I controlling that from another place? Mm -hmm. If I was, they didn't even arrest me on the land. They arrested me in Baldwin County. Right. I was already in custody when they attacked the land and put guns in babies' heads and mm -hmm. threw tear gas around there and threatened people. They knew I was in custody. They just wanted, they were trying to get a Waco. Mm -hmm. You can't get a Waco with us because Waco is one group isolated in one place. We have groups all over the world. Mm -hmm. They can't jump down on all these groups at the same time. They found that out after they got there, after they got their hands into this organization. They realized how big it was now worldwide, spread it was, and so they can't classify it like a little Waco where they have one little denomination in one little area with one little minute. We have ministers all over the place, we have teachers all over the place, we have leaders all over the place speaking different languages. Some of them are speaking a language that I don't even understand. Right. And they're still a part of our organization. Mm -hmm. So they, they have this a big hopes to try to topple the most frightening organization that has ever come along because we get along all races, all colors of people, and all religions. And we get together and we come on, we agree on the things that we agree on and we avoid the things we disagree on. And they can't have that because they need everybody to worship them and look like them and want to be them. And that doesn't work when you get a bunch of people who don't want to be them and don't want to be you. We're not interested in hip hop, we're not interested in your drugs, we're not interested in all your bling bling, we're not interested in your filth, we're not interested in your strip, you're stripping our clothes down and wearing body type clothes. We don't want none of that stuff. We're interested in your perms, we're interested in your color contacts, we don't want none of that stuff and that's what bothers them because without that they don't have control over your mind and they know generation after generation you become more and more liberated from them. You start thinking for yourself and start doing for self and kind like the nation of Islam and them is trying to do in the five percenters and the Rastafarians and all the people who broke away right away they got to be caught. we got to get rid of them. Why? Because they want to think outside of the framework of the image of the beast. They don't want to be them. They want everybody to want to worship them. Everybody to want to be like them. Everybody to want to like them. Everybody want to wear their clothes, listen to their music, their, eat their foods. We don't want that. You're a troublemaker. And that's what I become them, a troublemaker. I'm not interested in what they want. I don't care nothing about what they believe. They're entitled to be. Europeans can be anything they want to be. One more thing. When the European says that Africans need to go back to Africa, Europeans need to go back to Europe. That was, that was the point I was trying to make. They always come out black need to go back to Africa. The problem was, you know, if all the Europeans go back to Africa, I'll go back to Europe. And all the Africans go back to uh, Africa. And all the Indians go back to India and leave us here in our country. Native Americans and visit us on visas. On, you know what I'm saying? We'll be quite content with that, too. And we all eat along. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly what you're saying. Uh, with, um, yep. with with everything that's going on with um, Catholic ministers, mm -hmm. you see that um, you know recently Michael Jackson's been brought up on charges. Mm -hmm. and, um, the internet with the police officers and all that stuff. Right, the exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so basically at this point, is they in your indictment or in this case, um, they superseded the first indictment was just four counts. Right. And um, I mean, it was evident that they didn't have have a case unless they were to get this RICO, um, right. exactly. which they've never done in the state of Georgia before. Right. What What was some of the What was some What are some of the reasons why you feel they went for a RICO charge and um, things of that nature? Well, first of all, I brought my accountant in, the Duke Law Firm from New York, okay. who I've been doing business for over 30 years, from the father to the son. I've never been audited. I've never had any problems with the IRS ever in my whole career. I've deposited millions and millions of dollars legally. I filed my tax. In fact, I've gotten money back. This is the first thing that they claim, which is a part of their setup. Right? Why they did this is because they saw the sex case by going to the Internet again. Uh -huh. If they go up there, they'll see all the evidence. They go from beginning to end, they can see all the evidence. They went up there and saw that they were not going to win a sex case. And the only way that they can go for this man's money and go for the... Uh, community over there uh, and putting them is to create something called a RICO. So RICO is this new law that they created for Gotti and they're using it in the system now to destroy all these kids. They're arresting people. They have people turning states on these. They call it uh, five K's where one inmate can lie on another inmate and they'll take his time away. He'll send, they'll send criminals into the street to work for them and they'll point out other people and they'll just come in and, and their, their word alone means that that person can go to jail for 10, 20, 25, 30 years and even life. 
and this is a widespread thing that you won't know what's going on in the system until you get in here and you see inmate after inmate getting, taking five Ks on their friends. They, talk, they call it bashing each other in the head and they squeal on each other and the government gives them a chance to go out. The same thing they basically did in our case with a bunch of people. They went to them and said, we got charges on y'all and if y'all don't take this 5K and start screwing on that man because we want to topple him, then we're going to lock you and your family up and take your kids, etc. So now what they did is they took one person and they tried to use her age as an excuse to establish uh, a RICO, right? They had to get the RICO because they knew the sex charges wasn't going to stand. So then they had to go back to the original people and go back to them and get them something new to say because this wasn't in their original indictment. So they went back to those original people, they called their witnesses and told them this is what we need you to say. You got to say he structured money. Now my records would show that how would I structure money for $10,000 and I've been depositing millions of dollars over the weeks. But what they did is they counted, counted on the fact that they invaded the land and my house and stole all of my personal files and records and my bank statements so I couldn't present in court copies of my deposits. And then the ones they had fabricated, they presented to the public. One of them, by the way, which they didn't verify, had no date on it or nothing. They just put one up on the screen, and they blocked me from being able to present my own. When my accountant was addressed by Mr. Maxwell Woods from the uh, prosecutor, what he did is Maxwell Woods lied directly to him and said, suppose your client, you know him as Malachi Z. York, you know him as Chief Black Thunderbird, suppose he was using another name, would you know? And he, and he was filing money with another name like Dwight D. York, would you know? And he said, of course I wouldn't know if, 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 if he didn't tell me. And he said, see? And they used that, and they took what they call a misnomer, a fake name called Dwight D. York that I never lived under, right? They can't produce no documents of it. They put that on the top of the indictment, the new indictment, and started pushing it from there because they knew that's a mythological creature which couldn't be traced to a social security number, so they wouldn't be able to backtrack everything if the public went into looking for it because they'd have to go to Malachi Z. York or Malachi York to find my bank statements, my IRS statements, and that's why they keep a fake name on top of all my uh, indictments so that they can't, nobody can't trace out anything when people start, you know, inquiring, people want to know. So they use that one girl, they use her age. They come to find out in the middle of the court, in middle Georgia, right before Judge Worlds, when we brought an, an attorney called uh, Simon Ben Davis, he pointed out that there was a mistake in the indictment by the age. He said, this indict the indictment, not the law, the indictment is wrong, so it has to be thrown out. If that happened, the rape shield law would have came into act. And that means everybody there above the age of 14 could not be, could not be used to testify. And out went their case. So what right. they did is they sat there in court in middle Georgia and lied and said she was underage, only for us to have her mother on the stand as one of my witnesses with her birth certificate, which the judge blocked again. But we have it. Also, the documents is coming back and show that the girl was over age. Then they found out that their whole indictment had the wrong number in it. Through the whole trial, they had 21 and it should have been 12. Mm. And that threw it off because she was 14. And right. that means that the motion that we put in would have been approved and the judge said to himself, he said right to the uh, prosecution, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go with Mr. Ben Davis. Ben the prosecution said, give us another day to prove that we'll get her birth certificate. Suddenly they've, they've had this case for two years and they didn't have it. And they, cause they, they knew they didn't, they didn't have a birth certificate for that girl. So the prosecution was lying just to buy time. And they knew the judge was working with them at the time. So now, boom, we checked the dockets by the time we got to the trial and the prosecution never addressed that motion. So the judge moved on that motion on his own and went into trial, speeding the trial up to rush through it, close the door so nobody would see it, and try to get a hook wink and try to get you a life sentence. That was the whole game. And then to go out to the organization and try to smash that. Huh. That's what the RICO was set up for. That's how it was set up. And it was based around stuff that they couldn't prove, laws that they couldn't prove. They actually said, you know, that I told, I told one person, one of their witnesses, to structure money. When I have a history of depositing money, in fact, I was engaged in buying a church and buying a new temple at the time, and was, we had deposited thousands and thousands of dollars in our accounts. We have more than one account. The account they didn't address is the black bank in Atlanta, where we have most of our accounts out. They came down to small banks in Athens, to Wachovia, and but banks that they knew was whitewashed and would work with them. They didn't want to consult the black banks or the previous banks I've been dealing with for years before I came down here in 1993. You follow? Yeah, that's how they set it up. And so therefore, when they found out recently in the PSI, when we got a PSI, we got it back. We saw that they how they changed the dates around. They changed it from 20 from 12 to uh, 21 to 12. That means the whole trial was being mis was being mishandled and was under bogus documents. They blocked out Solomon Ben Davis's motion. The judge took it upon himself to move on it. And of course, so that they can proceed with this RICO. Hmm. That's
that's how it happened. It was a big, it's a big flaw. It's a big setup because they knew they didn't have a sex case. So they wanted to keep me because they had already locked me down for two years. And they knew there'd be a big stink about it with suits and file. Because I got suits for the torture I've been going through filed against them. I got suits filed against the judge. I got suits filed against Putnam County and the sheriff. And his friend. I got suits going against the prosecution. I got suits and against the marshals and the institution for all of my medical treatment and different things. And they knew that was coming. But they had not come. They know it's already in. But they don't never put that on top of how many suits I got against them. Right. They don't mention all that kind of stuff. They don't put on it. They don't put on top of all the witness, all the so-called victims that came forth on my behalf and said, "You got me in the indictment. I never told you that." And right. people they got to understand. And a woman said, "She said a woman said, I don't understand." And said, "I never gave nobody no interview, no deal. That's not mine." So when I, my attorney turned around and said to the prosecution, "Can we see a copy of the 302 that the so-called agent in California is supposed to have gotten from this individual who's on the stand saying that it never happened?" They said, "Well, we don't know where it's at. We think we lost it." Right. And they never could produce it. This was taking place in the court, but the public wasn't privileged to these type of things. Because right. what they did is the only press they allowed in was the same press, the exact same press that the judge said was responsible for spoiling Middle Georgia. Right. Which was the Atlanta Constitutional Journal and Macon Telegraph, of course, Edington Messenger. That's all. Black reporters came down from Atlanta. Reporters from the Nation of Islam Final Call came. Reporters from the Moorish Temple came. Reporters from a magazine, a black paper, and a Macon call, right. Georgia Informer. And they all had their badges and legal uh, passes to get in. And the judge said no. He blocked all the black press to put in only the press that were part of what he called those responsible for spoiling middle Georgia. Then he pulled the grand jury out of a part of Georgia he said was already spoiled by the parade by Sheriff Howard Richard Seals calling a, a Mrs. Shalom down there in Brunswick and giving her a whole run on the case that she had in the newspaper in Brunswick before the trial came. So Brunswick was also spoiled, but because he put his mouth, put his mouth and said that's the only place you can get a trial, he knew that was the end of the trial. So this trial had ended at least 10 times and they reawoke this trial. Even in the trial, when the prosecution had finished, they had rested, and then when the, when a defense attorney went up there and smashed them down, what they did is open their case after the prosecution let the judge let them open and bring in more witnesses, who, by the way, were proven wrong in both cases. One or two letters were revealed that she was lying, you know, but they brought in witnesses after the so-called prosecution had rested their case. This is ridiculous. This doesn't happen. But in this case, in the Malachi case, in the Hamasi Native American case, where precedence for jurisdiction is an, is an issue here, to identify who we are, let people know we're Native Americans, our bloodline, and this is our land, that's right in them. And then to use this in a, in a more expanded way to go after other ministers. So they got a whole package going, and that's why it's going on like this, and on and on and on. So they can get out the people's mind, and they'll come back on television soon with some more lies, they'll put some more stuff up, they'll get some bogus people to come up and say, they didn't walk in, and they did this, and they got arrested for this, and it keeps on saying, boy, them the Wabi's a bad people, do but they don't never mention your Massey Native American Moors, which is registered by the state, registered in the uh, United Nations, it's registered in Geneva, it's registered to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it's registered worldwide, your Massey Native American Moors in the tribe, and I am the chief for that tribe, and it's on record. They can hide and hide and run and run, but it's going to eventually come to surface. Go ahead. Right. So a lot, a lot of, con a lot of testimony um, that did not make it into the trial was the testimony that um, basically corroborated the conspiracy story. Yes. And I know that um, after the trial, Eatonton Messenger actually had an article that Jacob York actually did an interview with. I believe it was Rob Teacher. Yes. Um, he works for Eatonton Messenger now. He was fired from the Macon Telegraph. That's correct. And um, but actually, the conspiracy. It's it's much bigger than just Jacob York. Basically, what you're saying is he's just, he was just a pawn in the game. Exactly. Or? Jacob York was a pawn. Jacob York they gave, uh, had a store in Atlanta. Right before the trial, Jacob York's store closes and he disappears. Why didn't the prosecution bring their key witness and put him on the stand, Jacob York? Because they knew if Jacob York got on the stand, he got cross-examined. The truth would come out. He was on payroll and there's conspiracy and that is bigger than Jacob York. When they say we're trying to make a conspiracy with his with my so-called son, no, it's no, it's not. It's middle. Georgia and their conspiracy against all black ministers in the state of Georgia. Because once it bounces, once the precedence is set on this case, it's going to start flying across the different ministers. Watch. Unless we make sure that they don't pull that off. Right. And that's what we're working for. And we got worldwide assistance. But the immediate clergy in Georgia better become a part of this. The immediate black politicians in Georgia better be a part of this. And the seen on better be a part of this. While they're trying to throw your attention on a whole bunch of little fringish cases about a, a colored guy raised by a white family having sex with a little white girl, and all y'all go march out there for them, and they're making a fool out of you because he has three other charges they ain't telling you all about. You better get over here where there's a legit case where somebody is being lynched illegally, where all these 
lives are being told and the case is being, you better get on a case and behind something that's strong and it's real because in the long run, my case is being set up to set up all the black churches and all the black leadership. Right. Anybody can come out the framework and say 20 years ago you had sex with them and they can't, they have no proof, no medical record, and they can use that and say, yeah, that's, that's justified because of a new law they have. Right. It's what's called conspiracy that they created actually for drug dealers. And now they, when they figure out they didn't, they didn't got so many drug dealers arrested, now they want to try to use it in other ways. Mm. And, the, and the people in the church don't see it. This whole conspiracy thing was set up just to bust drug dealers that have been squealed on each other. They've been, they got so many people coming in jail. I've been in, I bounce around so many jails. I've seen so many people snitching on people. they got so many people being arrested in jail as a pack of people. So now they got to move around. Let's try to use it somewhere else. Let's go after the ministers. Mm. Let's go after the large corp black corporations. Let's go after all them big black businesses in Atlanta that's fighting them. Right. And then they're afraid of Atlanta because Atlanta is full of black independent businessmen. And they're like, we got to get them out of here in order for us to turn this back into the good old boy self. Right. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely evident, especially with this case and the cases that you're seeing um, that we see are coming up. Oh, yeah. They, um, they came in. Definitely. So basically at... After everything was brought to the forefront and the, the witnesses took the stand and their witnesses took the stand, um, it came down to um, jury deliberation. Mm -hmm. So you had a hung jury. That means the case should probably be over right there. When it's a hung jury, that's it. This judge took it upon himself to read a small portion, right, to scare them again and then threaten. We could tell that that jury was threatened because of the way she responded. She, was, she didn't say yes, sir, like yes, all the white ones. Yes, she said, yeah. Yeah, she had her head down. She wouldn't look up. She's the one who said, you know, this man is being set up. Y'all are going after this man, and I don't believe it. And I don't want to be a part of anything where it's going to be overturned in three months, like the other case, talking about the McMartin case, which is a fact similar to this case, where they did it in California. They set the same program up to go after people out there. Mm -hmm. So the jury, when it came to a hung jury, that was supposed to be it. But after the jury came back with a hung jury, this, this, this lawyer made up his mind. Closed the court down. He went back there. We know he did it himself because we know doggone well if they only release one out of all the charges, the only charge they found not guilty is eight, the, the eighth account, and that deals with Disney World. Why? Because they couldn't foreclose on Disney World because Disney World is too big. That is so obvious. And no way in the world could you tell me if those jurors were able to study all that stuff and understand what RICO laws and RICO accounts are about. Them, them functioning letters they had up sitting up there. No way possible. That was all part of the plot. The judge and them had it all set up like that to fool the public. But it's going to come around. We make it public. Um, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to. And My pleasure to get the truth out. That's right. That's what we need. That's what needs to be done at this point to let people know exactly what took place in the trial. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I heard on the radio that the attorney put into uh -huh. in his closing argument put in that it was physically impossible uh -huh. for these alleged acts to happen yeah. um, through their testimonies and how many times they said it happened yeah. per week, per month. And one of those, he, in the closing arguments, he said over a 1993 to 2001, which is an eight or nine year period of time, right. you would have had to have sex 11,568 <laughs> times. 11,568 times? Yes. At my age, 50, what, uh, 57, 56? Right. Okay, that sounds good. Ain't, ain't that much of in the world. Okay. <laughs> and the alleged sex acts per year, this is for continuing for a nine-year period of time, would have been 1,446 times. Wow. Yeah, and 121 times per month. Hmm. And he was mentioning that this is continual. Right. Like nonstop, so that's probably around four times a day for a nine-year period of time. <laughs> well, that's only part of them. See, what they didn't do is think about all the witnesses that we put up for so-called victims. If they were adding in what they was claiming and how often they would have it been, because the other people was making reference to them being with them, right? Right. So if you would add that on with it, mm -hmm. and then add the one that deals with all the victims that didn't show up, the people they couldn't get, mm -hmm. you know you would have at least ten times as much. Right. It would, it would literally come out to thousands of times a day. That's it's physically in impossible. It's a physical impossibility, and the judge recognized it because he mentioned doing a doing the trial, I realize which way you're going. I see what you're doing by, by asking these people how many times. And then we noticed that as we got near the, the, near the end, the people started lessening the amount of times. People said, oh, eight times a day first. Oh, twice a day, every day. Oh, four times a day. But then as we get near the end, it's like one person got there and said, I've been doing it for four years and we only had sex twice. Hmm. We got that silly because they was taking them, the prosecution was taking them in the back and they weren't telling them what to say. Right. They were telling them how they saw how the case was being to look ridiculous. Especially a, a man my age, pretending to claim them having sex over coming out to 
Right. And the whole point is they're not taken into consideration um, on another note of your medical illness. Right, I suffer from androedema. Right. Well, I suffer from acute androedema. In fact, I, I, have, I have passed twice and was necessitated back to life. And I've had several seizures while incarcerated because of them not knowing what androedema is and giving me raw medication mm -hmm. over this over his, uh, last two and a half years. And um, what it does is it reduces your testosterone level and it cuts down your sexual drive. So for Two years before the arrest, I had but already was, was already diagnosed. With, two years before May 8, 2000, I was already diagnosed with, you know, hereditary androedema. Right. And they called it acquired androedema. Right. right? And a third of, of one third of the population of people who have that die. Mm. Right. Well, but I, and of course I've died twice. But by the grace of the Most High, I was, my, my doctor was available, Doctor William Thompson. He brought me back. He had this all on record, this whole law. Right. But it brings down your sexual drive anyway. You have no interest in sex because your testosterone level drops. Right. That's the only way they can keep you from having flare ups or swellings that you know, which can result like something very similar to an allergic reaction. Right. You know, it, it goes around your heart, around your brain, could be around your eyes, or could be in your throat, any of the soft tissues. Right. And it affects you for life. So what I've been suffering for the last two years, though it appears there's no side effects, the fact that they've been giving me the wrong medication down the line. Five years from now or whatever, I will, there will be um, a side effect to it. Damage will be made, has been made. Just them being sustained by them giving you something like Benadryl that's a suppress, just suppress it, but it's, lo it's building up inside anyway. And so down the line, I, I know, they, the doctor explained that down the line I will have um, some complications because of the way I've been treated while incarcerated for the last two and a half years. Mm. And that's the damage, and that goes into the torture suit. And that's definitely a part of the torture suit, which is in the hands of the United Nations now. Okay. And we're going before the floor of the United Nations within the next three weeks to present our case for the second time. We've done it already in Geneva. It's been accepted. It's been logged. Right. And it's and on, that's on, uh, on with under investigation. Is going. The people down here haven't felt the investigation yet, but it's definitely in the making. This okay. case is not going to be shoved under the rug with just giving me a bunch of time and tossing me off to some remote prison forever. It's not, it's not that kind of case. They're right. And then it's, it's already in the making to be exposed. Okay. So, yeah, it was impossible for me to be having sex like that. And for, for, the, and for each witness to get up there and be put on, a victim to get up there and get put on the spot like that. After saying it never happened, now, mind you that. After saying it never happened, they said, well, you said it never happened. And then you're saying so-and-so. And then you can see the poor, the poor these, young, these young folks have been brainwashed. They have been rehearsed. Some of them was brought down from New York and they give them the 302s and tell them to study it. They didn't, they couldn't study it well. Some of them said they never had an education. Then they left the land and went out and got a high school diploma and they're in college now. Some of them said they didn't eat well and they was, you could see that they were obese when they were coming into court. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a big charade. And they didn't right. want the public to see it. They didn't want the public to see the people sitting on that stand. Right. Because when they saw them up there and people started saying, this never happened. This York never molested me. That was just messed their whole case up. All you need is one or two people saying it. Right. And that was it. In my case, he had over 30 saying it. Mm -hmm. And they still went on. Right. And added them in the PSI as if they said yes. Right. When they when it says they said no, in it. Right. And then added points on it, try to boost up my rating so I get more time just because they got, they, they want them, they're setting a precedent, but we're not letting them have it. Right. We will fight them to the end. Right. We're fighting for our rights and for our justice as Native Americans. I'm a Native American. The state of Georgia has no jurisdiction over me. I'm a Massey chief. They have no rights over me whatsoever. If I also lift that, 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 that's a big hoax there. That'll be exposed, and then we'll move on with the federal who has no rights over me. We were here before they set up. We were colonists. We were in this country before they came. They have already proved in Brazil, scientists have dug up their notes and found, did the research and found that the original people in this land, North America, were not Mongoloid, but were Negroid, the all Macs originally. And that the Mongoloids came, and that the Mongoloids came later with a man called Hu Shen, or what they call the Z tribe, XI tribe, and then they mixed in with us. And then Africans were brought here through slave trade, and then they mixed in with us. So we have this, the uh, Yamasi, the Creeks, the Seminole, the Shinnecock, the Cherokee, the, you know, there's quite a few tribes here, the um, Iroquois, the um, Ararat, the, uh, they, the Caribbean, they call them Ararat, they call them Caribbean, they moved down to Beto, they went into Jamaica, they was in Brazil, at the Maroons, they was in Haiti, we moved all over the place. So, you know, we, we, but this tribe here, that I'm the chief of, Georgia, is our base from here straight up to Massachusetts, was our land. For the Massachusetts Indian to the Massey Native American Creek, or what we call Bali or Guali, which is another word we use, Geechees, which is you find in Savannah, Augusta, uh, you find them in Brunswick, <laughs> you find them in all 
all throughout Milledgeville, Putnam, Bowen, Jones, all in this whole area where all the mounds are. And the Washita tribe mixed in with us along the way. Mm -hmm. We are the reason to Yamasi, also spelled Yamasi, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a black tribe that was here before the Africans. We're not descendants of the Africans. We were here when the Africans were brought here on three separate occasions. They brought Africans here. First they brought them from the Ivory Coast, then they went and brought them all the way from East Sudan, and then they migrated here on their own because they came with a treaty uh, from Morocco and set up in the 17th century. And, uh, Seti, Mohammed Seti I, and he made a treaty with George Washington. So you had the black Moors came over from Morocco, you had the African slaves brought from the West Coast, and then you had the Nubian slaves who brought over in the 1600s uh, by uh, Prince Charles the Navigator. So you had three groups of Africans who came here with three different characteristics for the way they look. And they mixed in with us who was already here. Mm -hmm. That's why some of us look African and some of us do have wavy hair, some of us have long noses, some of us have thick lips. It's, you know, it's a change taking place. Um, you mentioned you mentioned your tribe and with everything that's going on with the case and the things of you know that have been coming out in the news. What is the state of your tribe? The tribe got so much going on. I mean, it's amazing. We got rich. We got documents all over the world now. People from all over the world are becoming conscious that this is real. We did a family chart. Like I said, we had an outside genealogist who's a specialist in the family chart for my family, for me and my sister brother, all the way back to Ben York of Lewis and Clark Expedition, all the way back to his father, who was a Mali and Moor, right? All that's been traced. We have the Native American side of my family was here, and the ones that came in as Moors. That's why we call ourselves the Yamasi Native American Moors of the Creek Nation. But we are Native, we are Yamasi Native Americans first, and some Cre and some of the Moors came over here mixed in with us. So our tribe is our tribe is on the ball. The tribe got all kinds of things going on right now. They got documents, our letters circulating in the world, they're being translated to every language right now, and we definitely got a response. So we got the verification of our jurisdiction status beyond a shadow of doubt that the state has no jurisdiction and never did over any of us in this case we're all part of that tribe legally. Right. But his name and family is registered as on the roster of our tribal Today is April eighteen, two thousand and four. Speaking to you from the belly of the beast. This is Malachi from Melakazi, York. I'm a Nubi Ra'akata, Murduk. I would like to speak on Kathy Johnson, my wife. First of all, we have three children. The oldest is 16, his name is Lisa. That's, uh, that, that's my son. Then I have another son, and I have another daughter by Kathy. Our relationship goes on for over 16 years. According to the state of New York, there is no common law marriage recognized. But in the state of Georgia, it's a seven-year recognition. That means we moved down here around 1993, and it's now 2004. Why would I say 2004 and not 2002? Because I got arrested in 2002, and they would make it look like it stopped there. But no, but Don Baskins and Woods, Maxwell Woods, for, from the federal and the state, kept on going on television and keep the saying, calling her my lead wife, my front wife. All the news, they were my lead wife. So they established her as a wife, and the common law of Georgia established her as a wife. So they knew when they got on television the other day on Channel 13, started telling people that we're going to use his wife to testify against him. They know by law they cannot do that. They know by law they can't bring up any part of her case in my case whatsoever. However, I'd like to establish that she never said the things that they said she said anyway, because we had our people there at all times watching, and we had the tape of it, where she was, when, when she went through her whole plea, not once did she mention anything about me doing anything that they said on television, or bringing children to her, nothing like that. In fact, she told them, I don't see why I have to sign these papers if I'm not guilty. And her lawyer steals, who, by the way, goes to the same university that, um, that um, Garland went to, the same university that Judge Wells went to, the same university that this Judge Fitzpatrick goes to, the same, went to, the same university that Lawson's father was the, the head of, the same university that Adrian Patrick, who was my attorney, went to, the same university, Don Bassett, I can go on and list all, all of them went to the same university, all alumni. Right? So the same people were out there saying the same thing because they all worked together. It was all a pattern. So her, Lord Brian Steele, who pretended he was to be, to be so unique, he was hired by the Garland firm. Now, we noticed he back, way back in June, I made it clear that I never hired Garland. And I put him on the spot while in court and it's on the records. And I said, tell him to show a document where I signed it or show him a telephone call where, where I made, where I gave him a, a verbal agreement of any form or fashion and he never was produced. They let Manny tag along and they hit the uh, Garland. When I, when, it, then when I got to court in front of George Royals, downstairs, of course, in a private conference, conference of the what he kept doing, having private conversations so the world wouldn't hear what's going on in this case. But anyway, down there in the front of Patrick Adam and the prosecution, I made it extremely clear that I did not want anything to do with the Loeb, the Garland, the firm, and Manny. That means, let's make it clear that 
all in and then put together their own package of lawyers who are working with the state and the feds all the time. Mm-hmm. They have one of these women called, her name is called Janet Singer, Singer, and she was put on one of the girls. Then another one called Nichols was put on another one other girls. Then had another one. And then they had uh, Manny, who was really, was, Donald was going to take my money, but make Manny, because he looked like an Indian, they were going to try to pass him off as black, and make him my teacher, but he has a Caucasian wife. Then they had another guy who's ex-FBI agent called Joe Bagani used to walk around with them and he's supposed to disrupt and go to the witnesses and distract the witnesses and, and, and pretend that they told him stuff to help all seal it in. Then Sten Gollum put together his own accountant to try to trap my family into doing something illegal. Then he put together his own psychiatric team, which is Mrs. Eldridge, and never works for him, and they was going to pretend they were helping me while they was going to put together contra reports about my condition. Right. Uh, Fortunately for me, when I got in the court and I made my declaration of independence from these people, made it clear that I'm an indigenous person sovereign, right, and they don't have no jurisdiction over me, which they haven't to this date been able to prove they do, but they just went on anyway. On that same very day, they decided we better lock him up and send him to New York. Why they sent me to New York is because they were trying to get New York to pick up charges. They were trying to shift it up there because state down here know they can't get no fair, I can't get a fair trial anywhere in the middle district. In fact, with Woods and them getting on television the other day and coming on three or four days in a row down here in Georgia, they made the possibility of any, especially down in Covington or any of the middle district or Oklahoma, there's no way possible I can get a fair trial. They knew that because they did not want to go to the court because they can't go to the public because their witnesses have all purged themselves or we have since then found more information pertaining to them that reveals how phony they are and how much they were lying. Some of them and some of them who just want to turn around and tell the truth. And this is going, this is going to be the shocking information that they know. So they know that they could never put Kathy Johnson up on the stand and say she's testifying against me because we have common law rights down in the state of Georgia, especially after having been living here since 1993, which is on record. And we have multiple amount of, multiple amount of information for everything from our uh, Property, property owning, people's verification, our census list, our children's medical records and everything else to verify that we are, in fact, husband and wife by law. Now, so they can't really use that's all part of the game. Now, what you understand, like I was trying to say, what they were doing is they had put together a team, and all of them were working together against the Nawapians. It started a while back. It started back before 1997. It started back in 1993 when we got here, when they realized who we were, and they didn't want us here. And a bunch of good old boys got together, and they even had Negroes working with them who were the southern part of this country who don't want, who looked at us as northerners, and they didn't want us down here. If I, they plot and they planned and they schemed to put together all this information. Look at it like this. The feds just dropped the charges on, on my wife, Kathy. They dropped all charges. Now, how do you drop all of these charges? If we're, if we're so notorious, if we got all these sex charges, hundreds of sex charges, all this abuse, all this strategy, the children need psychiatric treatment, treatment so they're trying to get restitution, all of that, but you just dropped the charge. And she ended up doing just two years, and she did six of that, six of that, six months of that already. If, if, if you follow what I'm saying, I, that tells you right there that they know the case is shallow. Right. Why had, why had our people, why did they have our people take a plea? Why would they make them take a plea? Why are the other two girls allowed to take an alpha plea? And I mean, an uh, alpha plea is to say, I have not done anything, but y'all got so much stuff against me, and it's going to be so corrupt, and I know I'm not going to get a fair trial because of what, how the federal government works now in the system. I'll take that just to try to get probation and get out of here. Right. right? She never, she never, Mr. Ba- Mrs. Baskins and them never, ever, had Kathy say any of the things to them that they put on television. That was all a big hoax, right? There's no children in this case, first of all. That's why they keep on hiding everything. There's all adults. And then when they try to claim it, oh, these things happened 10, 15 years ago, but their problem came in with that. Mm-hmm. The problem is, they say it happened 10, 15 years ago and it happened outside of Georgia. Then why are the charges down in Georgia? You can't be charged in Georgia for things that happened in New York. You can't be charged in putting them for things that happened in Baldwin. You can't be charged for things you got to be charged in court, especially when it's a state case. That's right. You know so what they actually was doing was lying to the public again. What they were going to do is just maneuver the population, do what they feel like doing, and get their point across. But it's backfiring as we come down now. Parham, Sakina Parham's mother wanted to get up there and tell the truth about her daughter, mm-hmm. and she has a lot of information that we have since put on a, a, a affidavit tape. You know, and a bunch of other witnesses who he was trying to avoid getting on the stand. As far as Jake's sister getting up there and spending, uh, mentioning money, yes, these people were getting up, they were getting concessions already from the government. They was on the payroll. Sakina Parham was on a payroll. Jake York or Yakub Muhammad was on a payroll. They was all being paid or threatened, one or the other. Right. And told, if you do not cooperate with us and help us put this man away, and we what we want you to say, we're going to take your kids away and we're going to put you in prison. We want you to go out and we want you to recruit people. You go find these people, we'll pay for it. We'll fly you around. And we got the investigation. We pulled up the receipts. We pulled up the money 
attack for the fight that the government was mo moving um, to keep upon him here or, or moving another one here or moving there. All that's been accumulated, gathered, to, to verify. Jake is now under investigation. Why? Because little Kim is under investigation. Little Kim goes in the public because they're getting her for perjury and then right. she's facing 30 years now. What's the perjury? She says an open record. Well, the people on the back of my album, they're the ones who are doing all embezzlement. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have anything to do with that kind of stuff. The person in the back of the album is York John Records, which is Jake York. He calls himself, you know, Big Papa. Right. And so that's the one that they're now investigating. But they're getting to find out that since his friends got on the stand in our case, but the judge wouldn't let it go public, but we still have it, get out for David Tate, where they told what took place and how they planned outside of Atlanta, what houses they met in, when they met in these houses, who gathered, how they plotted, and they were going to take down this man. Because uh, they, they was promised a whole bunch of money if they succeeded in taking me down. Favorable protection. what they said in the court. Okay. Now, they, now they tried to close the case down so nobody could see it. Next thing they did is now they closed off all the minutes. But we brought in some real professional lawyers now who are not playing and things are going to turn around. It's our turn for them to see what's going on. They're going to try to trick you. They're going to try to fool you. But it ain't going to work. You follow? So yeah. I want to make it clear that Kathy did not take a plea to take to get on their side and say that she agrees that she did anything. She told them standing over there. Her father stood right there and said, I know, honey, that you did not. I heard it. My statement was taken. I know, honey, that you did not um, do these things, but, you know, you got to take a plea. A lot of times, here's what uh, Brian Steele tells us. A lot of people who didn't commit the crime take pleas because it's to their best interest. So take this here and do the three years because Malachi, they say, is not going to take his state plea off. Malachi does not have a state plea. Let me repeat. Malachi does not have a state plea because the concession was that the state plea and the fed plea goes together. And when I pull back on that bogus federal plea, the state plea went down with it. So there is no state plea. That's another hype, another lie that they're putting out there. That's when they tricked her with to make a thing. I got hundreds of years coming and all that kind of stuff. It's a big game. That's a reality. You follow? Yes. And so, any question you want to ask for um, yes, um, just recently Don Baskins um, got on public TV on the news saying how the Duwapian organization were threatening um, different witnesses. Right. But um, to my knowledge, wasn't it her that put out the names of those particular exactly. witnesses? Exactly. Don Baskins went out there when they thought they had a plea, and they put all these names up with their names, their addresses, their ages, and everything about these people, right, and then turned around upon us. And then most of the people she put up on the screen or on television were not even their witnesses. They came on my behalf. The so-called victims came to court on my behalf. That's why they closed this thing down. They got four people sitting there, and every one of them became uncredible. They found out that the girl called Belora, who calls herself Crystal Harding, uh -huh. has a felony charge. She's in a, she's in a federal facility locked down for possession of a deadly weapon and stealing a, and stealing a car. The children in the school in Athens have come forth, and they're starting to reveal who the boyfriend, his name is Eli, is the boy from a Safala Roach. And how he admits, and they admit, and she, that she told them who took her virginity, just like she told her mother when she was in the middle hospital, who testified on the stand, Pamela Roach, right, that her daughter told her she was still a virgin when she left the land, and said, before I leave, I'm going to go down and tell Baba goodbye, which doesn't sound like something you would say to somebody who molested you. Right. Uh, her friends have come forth, right? The next one is David. We know David. Uh, Noel has already recanted three times, but his sister took the stand and told them in open court that David spent two weeks with us, two weeks with us up there, and during that period of time, he said, I can't take this anymore, it's not fair, I need a pencil. And we got those sisters' affidavits already done. The court tried to block it. The sister was on the stand. They tried to make her look like she was saying that he never went to Manny or he never met with um, Pagani. What she was saying was during the period of time that he stayed with us for two straight weeks, during that period of time, he never saw Pagani and he never saw any Manny. When he got back down there, because Manny and Pagani was working with the system down here, because they worked on the garland part of the plot. You follow? Yeah. Then they tried to set it up, and then Pagani offers him some car, some um, tickets to a game, and that's supposed to backfire in the case. Oh, and then, then they pretend that Pagani's going on the stand. That's all part of the whole Georgia plot of trying to rip off uh, prominent black leaders, intellectuals, and wealthy pe black people to take their money, get them incarcerated, put a big fine over them, give them leader time. All these, you see it's after all these baseball, football players, and everybody, all these ministers. It's mm -hmm. a game that's backfiring on it. So, yes, they got on the television and outright lied to the public. You follow? Yes, um, I'm glad... And nobody got threatened by us. Those are our, that's our family. We don't threaten our family. We sit down and solve our own problem. I don't care what y'all tricked them into doing. Those are my people, and I love those people, and I'll die for those people. But you will never convince us or anybody else that the Nawapians will ever raise their hand against the Nawapians. We are nonviolent people when it comes to our own people. That's right. Go ahead. Um, I'm glad you... I want to mention some more, sir. Okay. I gave you a list earlier. Do you remember the list of the different people that all attended the same school in this case? 
Yes. Do you remember that list? Yes, I do. Could you tell me some of those people so the public can hear which people attended the same school? By the way, the judge did an office, a guy coming called Cedric. Uh-huh. Became, or pretended he was an assistant for um, Patrick, but what he did, in fact, was put a motion in that he knew was going to backfire. Later on, we found out, because we caught him on tape talking to Woods, and hopefully they forgot the tape was on in the court, and everybody saw him, and he brought down, he said, oh, we was dumb. Oh, we were talking about a baseball game, but actually then he jumped, he wasn't sitting in the court, he never signed in legally, he never filed a record, but the judge let him act as an attorney and even cross-examine witnesses when he wasn't even supposed to be there. I never approved him being there, just like I didn't approve Manny being there. Right. Manny was not supposed to be there, nor was Manny supposed to be there through the jury selection, by which, by the way, the judge picked the whole jury himself. Mm -hmm. That's why they hide in that one black juror who wants to tell the truth. That's right. Yes, I do. And we okay. hope she hears this and comes forth so we can straighten this out. I do have the list of everybody who went to the University of Georgia. I want people to hear this as a reality. All of these people who are on both sides of this case went to school either together or attended the same school and are alumni. This was a concentrated effort. Some of the FBI agents, some of the marshals even attended the same school. Could you read off some of the lists starting with Judge Royals? Yes. Um, the first person who attended um, University of Georgia was Judge C. Ashley Royal, who is the uh, presiding judge over the federal case. Conflict of interest. Go ahead. Don, attorney Don Baskins, who is the prosecuting attorney for the state case. Um, attorney Fred Bright, who is also the prosecuting attorney for the state case. Mm -hmm. Max Wood, which is the attorney for the prosecuting attorney for the federal case. Mm -hmm. Edward Garland. Edward Garland, who became, who called himself my lawyer, who put up the bogus plea and tried to set me up for a thousand years. Go ahead. Yes. Steve Bradley, who is also a prosecuting attorney for the state case. Okay. Attorney Cedric Davis. Cedric Davis, the one that Judge Lee, uh, Ashley World Cut said come into the case during the trial, but he did not file. There's no record of him ever. We looked it up. He's not been filed to come into the case. A lawyer cannot walk into court, especially in a federal case, and just get on the case because he says he belongs to the Adrian firm. Him and Adrian have two different practices. He told me right in the court, this is my secretary. I asked Adrian, do you know his secretary is right? He said no. So he can't possibly have had the same thing. He walked in and showed me a picture with his secretary and with Richard Moultrie and the marshals that was there all in the same picture. That picture can be subpoenaed if you want to verify it. So Fred, uh, um, Cedric was not working under uh, agent. Frederick is from Millersville, uh, Baldwin County, which is, you know, Massey, which is Seals Boys, and Adrian is from Clark County, and that's in... Um, uh, and that's in Athens, Georgia. So he allowed, the judge allowed him to come in and practice law without registering. Mm. But when it comes down to my new lawyers now, we got to have a hearing tomorrow to see whether or not these qualified Yale lawyers, Harvard lawyers, to see whether they're qualified to get on the case. But Cedric was allowed to walk in in the middle of a trial. And then, like I said, put in a motion that the judge participated, violating the law, participated in backing up the prosecution by having his personal secretaries find cases to knock it down. Come to find out, the judge and Cedric were friends. They go back a while, they did trials together against different black people, and he's a, he's a part of a set of things. A big plot going on against the New Orleans. Go on. Who else went to school with them? Attorney Brian Steele. Brian Steele, which was Kathy Johnson's, who sold her out. And the reason why they did that, they needed a plea to make it look like she's pleading against me so they can hold that up in the court and say, see, if his wife pleaded guilty, it must be true. So Brian Steele, and our lawyer met with Brian Steele before the plea and broke down all the stuff we had, just a fraction of it. Actually, we got a lot of stuff, but more stuff and how it's impossible for this case to go forward. And that's when he realized that Brian Steele was part of the plot also. Mm. All the people from which college is that again? The University of Georgia? It is, University of Georgia. And they all the he, he put Kathy through the ring anyway, knowing that this case is going to get overturned. But they're hoping that they, they, they could use her to say her case, to use her against me. And then going to tell him and say, maybe going to get his wife to testify against him. That's to talk to people in the population who don't know a wife can't testify against a person. And Kathy wouldn't testify against me anyway. She made that clear. Right. It's called spousal testimonial privilege. Say it again. Spousal testimonial privilege. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, also, um, Janice Singer, attorney. Janice, Janice Singer, Singer, who was put on Shamkin, uh, uh, Chandra, Chandra, Chandra Lampkin. Mm -hmm. They made her, her attorney. So when we got in the court and those people wanted to come down, like Chandra wanted to come and testify, in my case, that she didn't never say she did anything in her plea. That was not, that was an alpha plea, which right. means she didn't do anything, mm -hmm. right? It was, it was Janice said, no, she can't because she might get in trouble. They all were working together. And they sent the letter while the case was going on. Patrick received the letter in the middle of the case so he could show it to me. That's all part of it. I see it right there. 
when the parade was held by the Nwapians in our Grand Lodge, a Masonic Lodge, and our Shrine of Temple, and our tribe of Native Americans uh -huh. went down to Brunswick because they invited us down here. Uh -huh. What happened? We find out by taking pictures. We got SEALs officers in disguise down there, tagged them down there, followed them down there. Uh -huh. To our knowledge, they passed our flyers, they downloaded so they can start the case. So the judge says, well, we spoiled Brunswick. No, in actuality, the fact is that College of SEALs spoiled Brunswick by a telephone call to who? What's the name again? Karen Sloan. of the what, Brunswick? Brunswick News. And they had already in the newspaper every person that came into the jury room for selection of the judge would say, when it was one of the people he wanted to put on, he had a code. He said, come on around down here. That's when his good old boys or girls that he was planning on keeping on the bench. And then he would ask them, did you hear about this case? They'd say, yes, we're on the radio, the Brunswick, and this. And they, and he would tell, they would tell them over and over again. Not one person didn't hear about the case. But then, well, the kids, you know, this, uh, this got to go, well, I have a deadline. Yeah, but that don't mean nothing. The law says that these people only know about the case of conflict. And people came in the room admitting that they were outside before they came in and discussing the case. How I'm guilty. I took a guilty plea. This man is one guy except him, and he's naked to call himself an Indian and put the headdress on. You know what I'm saying? He needs to be buried under the jail. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. These people had this thing already planned. He, the judge let all that go on and still put those people up there and call them jurors. That's why they don't want the eyes to see what's going on. Mm. There's a big old plot. So he has a conflict of interest when it comes down to the Richardson case. Right. Because Richardson case is related to the York case. And now, Ethel Richardson is the mother because the father was the real Supreme Grand uh, Master on the land in Putnam County when I had moved to Clark County with my family and I was in charge of Clark County. Right. And then we set up the Egyptian Church of Chris while they had the Holy Tabernacle Ministry and I was there. That's the man that they killed. Mm. And the mother is the one who owns the land, not my, not my wife and not me, and that's on record. And that's why they try to foreclose on the land, but now that's another conflict of interest. How can you foreclose with people you have a conflict of interest with because you went to court against killing her husband while he was out uh, by leaving a sponge in him, and, and she won the case? Right. If you don't mind, I have, um, I have a law that says uh, a, a lawyer who served on a, a case. Yes. Um, it could interfere and can't be a judge presiding over a case that is a conflict of interest. If yes. you don't mind, I can read it for Very you. Very quick. Okay. Um, this serves as a conflict of interest and violates Title 28, United States Code, Section 455. Now, when anybody look those up and bring them up on the computers and send them and type it out and send it to the people who should help us. Right. Disqualification of justice, judge, or magistrate judge. B, two, stating, where in private practice he served as a lawyer, in which he served as a lawyer um, in your... Um, right. that's father-in-law case. case. He's the lead lawyer for, what's that, Macon General? Yes. The, um, the, uh, Oconee, yes, Oconee Regional. Um, Oconee Regional Hospital where her father was killed by mm -hmm. the doctors leaving a sponge in him. Millersville. Millersville, Millersville, right. and that's Baldwin County, and that's where Massey, who was there at my arrest, who, who, who spearheaded my arrest, that's the sheriff of that county. Right. That's Seals, buddy. Okay, where in private practice he served as a lawyer in the matter in controversy or a lawyer with whom he previously practiced law during such association as a lawyer concerning the matter or the judge or such lawyer has been a material witness concerning it. Also violating code of conduct code of conduct for United States judges, Canon 3. A judge should perform the duties of the office impartially and diligently. Now let's establish that the state and the Fed case ran together. They ran it together because the Fed used the state witnesses. So when the Fed case falls, the state case has to fall at the same time. They can't pretend they got two different cases and it's the same witness. That's called a conflict of interest and it's called double judges. Conflict of interest already established by what you read. Uh -huh. Double jeopardy if they try to use the same people they used in the previous case. And most of them had already purged themselves while they was on the stand, because one of them said, namely, um, I think it was um, Safala Roach, that mm -hmm. she lied to the grand jury. Yes. Another one, Amanda Noel that, as well. Another one admitted that her father had coerced her into it. Another one was taken from a, was from a, from a mental institution because she's claiming to be clear. Her mother stand there. Her mother's name is Nicole Harding, mm -hmm. who got on the stand and lied and said, I told her to tell her uh, loan the money. That was never proved that loan to any money. And mm -hmm. they lied to my... Uh, what they call my accountant who, who uh, broke over half for 30 years and so, well maybe he did a uh, business under that name. He could have done this under that name. All those are lies. The truth is going to come out. It's our time. I just want to say that to the family and those people out there who want the truth. All the Wapians, all of y'all, whether they use y'all in the case against us or not, you're still family. We still love y'all. Come on. Let's beat the devil. Don't have my call. Don't have my call. Hold that. Hold that. Hold that. Hold that. Uh, it's March 6th, uh, 2004. I'm talking to you from the belly of the beast. This is Chief Maku, uh, Chief Black Thunderbird Eagle of the Massey Native American Mosaic Creek Nation. Uh, Register number 
nine by his own brother. And his father beat the heck out of him. And we had a stack of witnesses out there who had witnessed the beating and had witnessed the conversation between them in Brooklyn, how he beat the kid, but what he was doing. We had other people that was part of it and testifying of their involvement. We even had a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend of Khalid, who was willing to testify and come in and say that they was, him and him was having sex involvement way before I even knew it, who Eddie was in Brooklyn, New York. But, they, but the judge, of course, blocked that part of the information out. We have it. We have a record. We have the documents. We have the available witnesses that will all testify. But they put a block on that for the time being, of course. So, yes, it affected me in the case. But I still, he still, he'll always know our friend. I always love him. I mean, I'm hurt by it, but I'll, I'll overcome it. That's all part of it. I understand what the scripture says. Right. Now, another, I just want to go down the line and okay. different um, people that have affected this case tremendously. Okay. Um, now, uh, one of the named people in the conspiracy is your son, Jacob York. Mm -hmm. How does how does a father handle something like that? Well, his real name is not Jacob York. His name is Yaqub Abdullah Muhammad. Okay. Right. His mother's name is Ubeda Abdullah Muhammad, and he has you know siblings, brothers, and sisters. Right. Uh, it's a very touchy situation because his mother died of an aneurysm attack. Right. Me and I have been separated for many, many, many years. Your father, and she died of an aneurysm, an aneurysm attack, which is which her father also died from, and one of her brothers, Maddie, all died from Maddie Johnson. All right. He went off and told people that I was responsible for the death of his mother. This really affected the kid. You know, it destroyed his mind. Then on top of that, one of his brothers, one of the twins, which is my son Yetzel Lahi, he was at a party in New York. He was down here with me, living in Georgia. He said he was going up to New York to spend a little time with his sister Fatima because of Valentine's Day. He wants to let her know that he is going to move down to stay with me in Georgia. You follow? And when he went to New York, he got involved with them, hanging around, living with his brother. Uh, uh, Jacob's house, he called himself Jacob or Jake York, Yaqub, living in Yaqub's house with him. Yaqub eventually threw him out of his house. He got involved with another member of his family and ended up in a party and was, you know, shot fatally and died. You follow? I think that also affected his mind. At the then, then he was involved with people like Little Kim and them. I ain't going to tell you about Little Kim and her dress habits and the vulgarity and, uh, you know, the, the lewdness of the... Uh, and involved with that corporate, he called himself Yorktown Records or Yorkville or something like that, Yeah, Records. And he was hanging out with the Junior Mafia and hanging out with that whole hip-hop hot crowd, tough guy, stuff like that. He called himself Gangster and he's involved with a kind of uh, bank fraud and forging false checks and all kind of things and trying to, you know, deceive the, trick the government. So he came to me at one point and asked me for some money, right? He wanted me to help back him to back Little Kim. And I told him, I cannot back a person like Little Kim with my reputation. I'm not going to put my reputation on the line. And while well, she's nude and stuff like that, I ain't got nothing against her and her career. That's her life. But it doesn't sit into our lifestyle. And as you imagine Native American more, and I didn't want that to reflect on our community. He got very mad. He started cursing, stomping around. And, you know, he left and went off. Him and um, Sakina Parham at the time was kind of close because they used to be boyfriend and girlfriend when they were upstate. See, Jake York or Yakub was Ada's boyfriend. He was also Sakina Parham's boyfriend. And they had gotten caught several times upstate having sex. You're right? And they got in trouble for that. And he was mad about that. He was running a record store that I once had up there in uh, Liberty, New York. And he was caught stealing money out of the store. And he got in trouble for that. I did everything I could to try to shape him into a better person. But down inside, he had this desire to go his own way. He became an avid hater of me. And he became one of the, the campaigners of this whole case. Of launching this whole thing. And getting these people together and threatening them and scaring them. He was on payroll. And he was on the payroll at the FBI. Now, a witness got on the witness stand who was his best friend who was there when the deal was made with FBI agents. And he was also the one who was on testify that Jake came to him because they knew he was good at forging checks and tried to get him to forge checks for him so he could use that, those forged checks to buy a house because his credit was not strong. His credit was around 2000 He needed to be 24000 to get covered from the bank. And the guy refused to do it, which is a friend of his called Damien uh, Pryor, who was up there at the court to testify about this. And in that testimony, he testified how Jake York was on the government payroll. They got to Jake York with things he had did in the past, right, and then turned him. He already had a dislike for me, and he used that, he used that as an excuse to try to topple our organization and topple me. So he got to him and then told him to, to solicit people. And then he went around getting people. Meanwhile, while he's soliciting these people, like uh, Tia Thomas, she was that guy, Hakeem's girlfriend. And so they, he pulled her away from Hakeem, and he's having sex with her. He's having sex with... Um, Kareem Ahama, he's having sex with Keenan Park, he's having, he's having sex with all these people, and they all testified to it on the stand. Yes, Jake York was the one having sex with all these people, and then they all lived in this house together. The thing is, now, as 
if he had hired this guy that was supposed to adjust checks so the amount of money would be suitable so he can get this loan from the bank, and the guy refused to do it, but then he eventually got the house anyway, and we have the records to show his accounts that he did, only had $2,000 in the bank, and we checked the, the records in the bank for the person of the house, and the records were up, then the forgery was actually done. This guy, Damon Pryor, didn't do it, but he forged it, and he brought this house along with Barbara Noel, which is Arthur uh, Lopez and David Noel and Amanda Noel's children. That's the ones who are the ones, you know, they're all in this case. You follow? I know. So it's a bit, it's a, like a, pl a plot, it's a conspiracy. Then he got together with a bunch of these people and invited them down to South Beach, Florida, so he could get it together. They rented buses, they transported miners across the state line, but nobody said nothing. Out of, out of, coming out of Georgia, all the way down to Florida, so they could, you know, get together and plan their plot, get their story together. When he came back off the beach, South Beach, Florida, they went straight into um, the FBI's agency. Jake went back up in there and started letting them know who he had and how he got them coerced and. And how these people all scared, and he told them, that if you don't do it, we're going to get you in jail because you was involved with this, and, and we already know this, and we already know that, and they got a whole bunch of stuff, and putting the thoughts in the people's head. And they started writing, and the, the agents wrote their own PO2s, and made these people me try to memorize these PO2s so they could use them on the stand. Mm -hmm. Things didn't go their way because everybody didn't comply. Jake couldn't convince everybody, a lot of people saw he was full of it. He brought down a bunch of hip-hop groups, they were down in the South Beach, they were getting drunk, they were smoking marijuana, and we had a whole bunch of witnesses that were minors who were willing to testify on what went on in South Beach. The judge blocked it. The judge blocked it. Some of the girls who were minors who said they had sex with them down there, the judge blocked it. The judge blocked the fact that they were smoking marijuana and, and, and using crack down there. The judge blocked it. The judge blocked it the fact that they had parties where all the girls got naked and they were having a big audience and they videotaped it and we were getting access to the video. The judge blocked it. You know what I'm trying to say? Yes, so true. Jake was being used. I'm saying he's my son, he'll always be my son, right? And he said, I hope he's my son. <laughs> I said it like that, right? But he'll always be my son regardless. You know, I can't say I'll ever hate him. That would be, that would be inhuman, right? But I know they manipulated him and they used him. And that's what they want to do to top his organization. He had no concern with his organization because he was in the hip-hop world. So he didn't have nothing to lose anyway. You right. follow? But they had him binded by things he did. Right. And then that prompted him to really go out and do a lot of devilish men. And right. then in, in the course of trying to uh, topple me. Right. Now, there's another key person in the whole conspiracy that keeps on coming up, and that person's name is Habiba Abigail Washington. Yes. Um, she's named as one of the primary co conspirators along with Jacob York. Mm -hmm. um, she, according to the case, was very close to the organization. She, at one point, was even running the organization dealing with the finances. Uh -huh. Now, how, what is your feelings on her role in, in the whole entire case and things of that nature? Um, okay, first of all, her. when they speak about Abiba Abigail Washington, Abiba Abdullah, Abdullah Muhammad, right? Um, she was more than just a part of the case, right? She was somebody I was very close to, trusted a great deal, right? And loved a lot. We have two children, a son named Inlil, a daughter named Sussex, two beautiful children, all right? Um, close to the whole family, all right? Um, I know her mother, I know her father. In fact, her father, Nathaniel Washington, which name you so short, was on the stand to testify on my behalf. Never to bad mouth or talk bad about his daughter. He didn't never say anything against her. You know what I'm saying? Bad. It's just that he said he knew that when she came to him, she was 17, about me and her relationship. And then the prosecution tried to make him look bad by saying he didn't feel strange that a 40-year-old man was trying to marry a 17-year-old uh, girl. And he said, well, she came to me. And then he came to me and talked about it. And we live by the Bible law. We don't live by what you're calling your system of things. We live by the Bible law and our tribal laws. And our tribal laws, we don't have the same principles where y'all pretend y'all have all these ethics and y'all pretend y'all have all these morals to the public, but behind closed doors, all kind of things like the Clinton situation is going on. And I can go on and on and on, the Catholic Church, etc., etc. et cetera. All right? So let me leave it like that there. As far as I'm concerned, Abiba Abdullah Muhammad was threatened by people and coerced that they were going to take our children away from her and put her on a spot. She's really a beautiful person. They put her on a spot, and I can tell because I was in the court looking at her eyes from the stand after knowing her since she was a kid, right? I knew that they were manipulating her against me. You follow? And I can see the regret at a certain person in her eyes. It hurt me just to sit there, but I could feel her touch me heart to heart. You follow what I'm saying? And say, this is ridiculous. It's out of hand. You know what I mean? There's nothing in our life that involves this much to go this far where they're trying to put me away, her, the father of her children for life. So I don't see her as a bad person at all, as people would like me to see her. I'm not mad at her. I'm not angry. I'm, I'm hurt somewhat. But I realized after I saw her, I needed that. When I was down in Brunswick and I was in court, and I saw her eye to eye, I needed to see that. And for me to be able to look inside and say, they have cornered her. 
Uh-huh. It may have been mad when she left because I distrusted her for certain things. You know what I'm saying? Right. But in actuality, I can see that she didn't mean for it to get like this or go this far. That they all got tricked by Harold Richard Seals and by Jacob, who was threatening them on what's going to happen to them if they don't cooperate with the government and all that other kind of stuff. And I, I understand that. And they received uh, what they call favorable concessions. They paid them all kind of things to coerce them to top of the organization. But I don't think those people really thought it was going to go this far. Especially, I don't think she would think it was going to go far. They were trying to put me away for life or as many times they tried to kill me and torture me since I've been incarcerated. I don't think she anticipated all that happening. For all as far as uh, RICO and all that stuff, they threw the RICO together at the last minute. It wasn't even in the original indictment. They just threw it together because they needed some way to hold this case together. Then went to them and told them, what we need you to say is he told you to, to structure money or whatever, you know, at a certain amount of time. And, and they give given the dialogue and they got to say it on the stand. And that's it. Because by the time she was re-questioned by, after the prosecution finished, and the time she got before the defense prosecution, the whole thing changed. When they stopped putting the receipts up, she was saying, I don't, I'm not saying that he told me that day to do this, but that things changed, but the judge had already had, the judge and the jury and all that was already pre-stacked, you know what I mean, it was already set up anyway, so it was going to go on regardless of what was coming down, but we got all that on the minutes, and everything is down, and we're getting the transcripts so that that could be exposed for the, for the appellate, but I don't have any uh, hard feelings against uh, Habiba Washington, or I, I call her Habiba, right, at all, okay? Okay, um, now we, we discussed some of the older um, people involved in this case, but there's a lot of... Um, there's no children. That's just right. the why. I'm glad that somebody knows that they made it look like little children. All these people are adults. Right. They had to create a law to get them in. And they couldn't have done it without the RICO. Right. And that way they could get these adults to get up there and say, this happened to me when I was a kid 10, 15, 20 years ago, and tell the public, they make the public think some kid is sitting up there. Right. So that they can, make, they can get a hate group against me. Right. That was a tactic. Now, how do you feel about those who um, testify that basically grew up or spent their whole lives within the tribe and practicing the tribal customs and the culture and the way of life of Nuwapu right. that testified against you? How does that make you feel? Well, when I was in court and I was listening to individuals talk, I got a different perspective of it. When I saw David up on the stand, uh, David Noel, uh, Tariq, and I heard them questioning him, and he, and he admitted that he, you know, recanted, and it didn't really happen, and then he said, and then he yelled out, it did, because the, the FBI, uh, uh, prosecutors looked at him like, you better, you better change that, because you just told, we got you on that stand, don't forget, we got your mother, because we're going to get your mother for trying to embezzle him and bribing him, and we got the, we got the actual document to the computer, where your mother, under the name Bell Keys, and we traced it back to her, was trying to bribe Mr. York for money, while he was incarcerated, to make this thing go away, and how your sister is here to testify, and his sister's older sister came in, and testified how David went to her while and visited her and asked her for pencil she can write these letters, right? So he can write letters and let the world know that this is a hoax and it shouldn't it's, it's out of hand and it was all about money and he was being coerced and, and then now now he found out his mother because they gave him a prison, his mother was in so much danger and she was in such a threat she was gonna go to jail. And Don Baskins and uh then um I forgot his name, Mr. Bright in the state turned it around as well as Wood, you know, and Miss, Mrs. Thatcher in the federal turned it around. So when I saw David on the stand, I saw him being questioned and I saw how he was, was attacking him and putting him on the spot. Then when the prosecution came up, how he recanted, we had two, uh, three letters to prove it, how he met with Manny and them and told him he didn't want to do it. But then we realized Manny and them came out of Garland's office and he was a, a man in there who was supposed to be a private investigator and trying to trick David by bribing him with some um, baseball tickets to try to destroy the whole recantment. We realized now that that was part of the plot. But when David walked by me in the court, he looked at me in my face and after the court, he even tried to call my sons and all them and tell them, you know, that he wants to talk to them and talk to the family. This has been happening recently. They know that because they monitor everything we're doing. So I have, I have nothing against David at all. Okay. All his sister Amanda, she got on the stand, and she, and they, all these people, I understand what Amanda and them, I and them were just vicious because they was caught up in a money game. The kids were influenced by their older brothers and sisters to lie with them. Right? Arden then was gone for money. Arthur was gone for money. Uh, Sakita Parham was gone for money. Abigail was tricked into it. Some of them were just vicious people that, you know, that was angry and all kind of stuff. And Arden, we had a letter with her at the child molester in, uh, let's say, Abdul Salam, which is Wally, uh, Wally or Bruce LaRoche's son and Mary uh, Eddington's son, has a charge getting ready to come up on him for child molesters because he, he molested my grandson, Isak Muhammad, which is my son, uh, Isha's um, son, and Fidaka. And there's charges that, that, that we have in the defect that might be coming out, that will be coming out against Abdul Salam uh, soon. If on his case, when he was on the stand, he messed up every which way, his life was wrong, he put a studio in a house when it's in a building, all kinds of different things. It was very obvious in the minutes that they were being coerced by these people and, and 
crime and the thinking they was going to get something that they can't possibly have. And after it's over, the government tried to foreclose and take everything and give them nothing. No money for psychiatric evaluation. They wasn't concerned about their health. They're not even concerned about their futures and what these young men look like. Putting them on a self and putting themselves in these sodomistic states of mind for the public. they got to grow up with that to follow them. They don't care. These people, these races down here will go back and leave them out there in the world after all this is over with all this on their back and millions of followers and whoppies are angry and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I'm doing is taking and whoppies. No, I am not angry at them people. And I don't want you all to be angry. I don't want us to fall for the devil's trap where we turn on each other. That's what they want us to divide and conquer. The brain always work that way. I don't have nothing against any of them. The ones that are malicious, they'll get theirs on their own because that's how it is. The most high I take care of them. You know what I'm saying? The ancient ones will work against them. But the other ones don't believe for one minute I'm mad at any of them. If that makes me sound crazy, oh, then I'm crazy, but I'm not mad at them. I understand this is a systematic elimination process to stop my books, my doctrine, and the growth of our tribe and our indigenous status, which they know they're having a hard time getting around. That's why they won't call me everything but by my tribal name, the Abbasi. You know what I'm saying? Right. All right. Okay, Mr. York. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to um, finish up our interview by asking you some questions. We left okay. off um, talking about um, the land and ownership and dealing with um, the case. And started we blocking were... everything. People started coming down, selling all that stuff. Um, transport, we had, we had deals made, but they wanted me to do it through Horton Home and Putnam County, and we didn't want it because their houses are poorly made because we had people working there. So we started getting our houses from Milledgeville. Right? And they got mad at us, so they stopped us from putting their houses on the land, and that made people who had already come there to double up and triple up on, each, on top of each other. And they thought, so we said the best thing to do to make it safe for everybody is move the kids into brackets of ages until we can get past these zoning laws and get our houses and all the families can move back with their families. Right? And that's why in their testimony you find sometimes they say, well, I'm living with my mother, or times other ones say, well, I didn't live with my mother, I live, yeah, we live with my mother, and father was all living together. Because there was pretty time we all was living together, everybody's houses was down there, and the families were living in their houses. Because I was set up for, even for my mother, when, when my mother retired down here with me. You know what I'm saying? But then when they found out how we got permission to put up 19 houses, we got the lot squared off, and we got the pipeline, the sewage put in, that's when seals them came in and started blocking everything, so we were stuck, and all the house, the growth of more property stopped. And nobody else could get any more houses. They blocked everything. So people who were already there, who had already sold everything, who came from the north, who came from Florida, who came from Alabama, who came from Mississippi, came from different places. They don't come from the north. They came from different places. They were stuck. So everybody had to double up and triple up just to survive. And that's why they keep saying I moved into a trailer. He lived in a trailer and he had a house. I moved into a trailer, I had a little teeny small trailer, so the house that I originally had owned, more people in their families can take over those. And that's why they said there was families in there, not just his family, but different people and different people. And then when the little kids were born, the little ones, we made sure we had a nursery set up. But by the way, they threw tear gas in that nursery on, on May 8th without, without a second thought. Mm -hmm. But we had nursery set up so the kids could be separated because the adults, adults get the colds and the cough and we don't want them to affect the kids. You right. right. Okay, so I mean, so basically it's true that the zoning violations hindered the growth on the land. Exactly, and it made the conditions, but you made it look like it was unlivable at times, and some of the buildings, the floors were raggedy, and we couldn't get them fixed, because you got to get a permit to upgrade, you got to get a permit to repair, you got to get a permit to do this. Got, they even told us to stop painting, right. and sometimes you paint because you can put on a latex paint to protect the wood or protect the vinyl or whatever, and right. they just don't stop everything, we put a stop order on everything, they just want it to degrade to the point where they can come and say, look how they're living. Mm. You follow? Right. They did all that purposely. Then they tried to hinder all of our businesses, close down all our businesses, so we wouldn't have the food we needed to support them being to feed ourselves. Right. So they were doing, all that was all well thought out. They did it first and then turned around, and, and what they caused, they turned around and said, we, they used against us. Right. So we were trying to stay together, hold together in love, and make their family plays together, stay together, mm. and in due time we'll overcome this devil and all this wickedness, and we'll be back on our feet and get everything growing again. That was our plan. Mm. So people were willing to make that sacrifice. They turned that sacrifice, you know, into something bad. And then the people who, the kids who didn't understand, they took it the other way. And then parents, the parents would explain to them, because the parents are something I ain't got to explain to you, you're a kid. And I'd be like, you know, everybody needs to know what's going on out here. Mm. So we have various leaders, people in charge. Some people, women was in charge of, of the food. Another one was in charge of the people who move on the land, another one. Another brother was in charge of the construction and repairs. There was a whole bunch of different people in charge. They had their own control, and I was not controlling them. Mm. The only thing I was involved in was the religious teachings, right. the writing of the books. That's right. what I was in. I wasn't involved with the business office, and they admitted to understand that women ran the offices. They did all the money, all the banking, all that. They would drive me to the bank for me to sign because, because the charter was in my name, and then I would sign, and that was in the bank. If the bank was going to charge you, they would say, yeah, we see him coming in. Some of the time, every time we ever see him in, he's coming with a group of them. They would have one of the paperwork. He wouldn't understand the paperwork. They would talk to them, what kind of accounts. I would sign my signature or post office box. I signed my signature, and I would leave. 
And then from then on, they would be doing all the transactions, everything. I had nothing to do with money. I would tell people I don't want nothing to do with y'all's money. All I had to do is teach the truth. Right. And I write books, and that's all I do. Right. That was my part. They both had their own part. Some brothers security, some brothers repairs, some brothers went out to work. Some, you know what I'm saying? Right. Some sisters sold, some sisters uh, worked in the office on books, some sisters cooked, some people took the kids, some people taught class, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And the kids had a very good education. Right. So basically the townspeople and those that did the zoning was by, you know, and permits and things of that nature. Drone Dean Adams and people like that. Right. They just feared the growth and what the organization or the tribe was going to do with the land. They were intimidated. They kept on trying to tell us, what exactly are you going to do? We want your full plans because you can't put a water park out. You can't do this. And we want to make a public access. We want to have access. We said, we're not making a public access private. We don't want anybody here. So they were concerned because they started seeing 30,000 people show up in carnival type of activity out there. Yeah. This bothered them. Because they couldn't profit off it. And they knew that people were coming and that was growing and it was going to expand and expand. The Egyptian thing was starting to get public attention, the media's attention. And it was taking attention off their little, they got their little town with a with blood rabbit. And a, they used to have a Sambo parade there, a Sambo gathering every year. And they have an Uncle Remus with zippity doo dye and all that, all that backwards stuff that they want to keep pumping from that town. They hated the fact that the color purple was done in there because it revealed the racism. That, right. that town there was the color purple. Mm -hmm. And there's a book out by a guy called David Mullen called The Chicken Come Home to Roost. Read about that book. It's a little small book. And you can get it from um, Barnes and Nobles or you can call our people and they'll give you access to it. It tells you all about that town and tells you all the people in the town and what the stuff they used to do with the racism and the lynching and all the different things. But I'm telling you, have more lynchings than most parts of Georgia. Right. Hey. We got the records and we did, we did the demographics on it. Mm -hmm. but now, I mean, I know this. Well, the, the whole thing of this, just trying to focus on the land and, mm -hmm. and I guess, the information um, of the organization mm -hmm. things, and just trying to halt that altogether. Mm -hmm. But is it true that when the, the, point of, the point of moving to Georgia was, of course, to be closer to um, the Native American landmark? Our tribal roots. Our tribal roots. And that was the main issue. That was the main purpose, yeah. Okay. So we could have went to Florida, but that's Seminole. We could have went to North Carolina, but that's um, Cherokee. You follow? Yeah. He chose to be in Georgia because that is Yamasi. Right. So basically, there's. I just wanted you to explain the different elements of the organization and things or the tribe because it seems like that's the type of confusion that they try to okay. keep in the minds of people. The tribe is on that. That's what we are. That's our culture. We're Native Americans. That's where we are born. Some people have, have come into the tribe. They would call honorary members. Others of us who have been Native Americans our whole lives. Right? Now, with inside that, that's just where we are. We have the Masonic Lodge, the Wapian Grand Lodge, right? We have the Shriners, the Almakdi Shrine. We have uh, 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 AEO, was an Egyptian order. And we, and we had the uh, Holy Tabernacle Ministries. We had the Egyptian Church of Christ. These are the two different churches. And the Holy See Baptist Synagogue. Those are three different churches that socialize with us. Not to mention we have people from the Ebenezer Baptist Church and Ethiopia, Ethiopian Church. You so we had different groups of people that make up this organization called the Rockets. You follow? And they have their own leaders, their own teachers, their own dialogue, their own beliefs, their own commitment, their own dress codes. Right? Okay. And it has nothing to do with us being Native American. Native American is what we are by nature, indigenous people. Regardless of what we accept as a religious belief, we have our own culture. You follow what I'm saying? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, that's what I'm, exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And they're trying to combine them two and make it look like it's, you know, Native American is some type of organization. Native American is not an organization. It's what we are. Right. We have always been. We was here before they got here. Mm -hmm. They came over to our land with this mess and their drugs and their pornography and all. They brought their, we didn't have, there's no such thing as native mes molestation and stuff, all that stuff. Drug use and divorces and, and rapes. We don't have that in Native American culture. Mm -hmm. That is their culture. They brought that from Europe with them and spread it. Everywhere they go, they spread it. Mm -hmm. And then they, try to, then they try to tag it onto other people so it look like it applies to other people's culture. Right. And it doesn't. I hear you. And that's the, I guess that's the misconception that's been brought out. It's because they always want to say, well, they're putting, they're wearing this now, or they're wearing that now, right. they're Egyptian now. Let me now. answer to that, too. They keep on, because people say they wore cowboy clothes. Native Americans wear cowboy clothes. Cowboy clothes came from Native Americans. The cowboy hat that you see comes from the Indian Joe hat before they blocked it. Mm. The cowboy boots and stuff are boots that are worn by Native Americans. That's why we have fringes. You see cowboys in chaps and have fringes and stuff on everything. Those Europeans who came here, they picked up on the dress code that the Indians were wearing. We don't wear feathers all the time. We walk around in moccasins all the time. I mean, only ones that live in certain environments, in certain climates. When the winter came, they changed clothes. When we rode cattle across the country, we call bison. 
we wore different. So cowboy clothes, cowboy boots, if you look looking at any of the pictures of us, are Native American clothes. If you check any Native American tribes across this doggone country, you're going to see they have on cowboy clothes. Nobody's wearing feathers no more. It's not the 17th century. You follow? Yeah. And the Egyptian clothes they just put on it, that is a part of a ritual, a religious ritual for a group of people who call themselves the Egypt, ancient Egyptian order. Right. Other than that, there's no other clothes other than regular clothes. He says, and he said, he changed clothes. What clothes? He just used the same thing over again. He went for Indian, went for, he went for Indian, Indian cowboy. Cowboy and Indian the same doggone thing. That's the end of that there. American clothes anybody can wear. And the Egyptian clothes they see people wearing, they only see them on the land doing that while they're doing certain rituals. Mm -hmm. Certain things that pertain to their religious beliefs. And that's their prerogative. If that's, this is America, you're entitled to your own religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I do. Well, that um, that completes the questions that I have for you today. I'd like to establish one thing, too. I'm totally innocent of all the stuff that they're doing. It's all big plot. I didn't sexually molest anybody. I wasn't manipulating any money, any RICO. All this is a big plot, and the truth will set you free. It's going to come out, and that's why they're panicking now with it. It's March 8th, 2004. This is a, yet another interview with my cool chief, Black Thunderbird Eagle. How are you doing this evening? Well, how about it? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. I'm still in the belly of the beast. Yes, it's soon to be free. I hear. <laughs> um, I want to talk with you about um, the evidence the prosecution said they had against you in the case. Yes. Um, a lot was put out in the media with different items that they had, and I just want to cover them one by one if uh -huh. that's okay. Um, first of all, I want to discuss with you this Pink Panther doll they said they found. <laughs> what what yeah. is the significance of that? First of all, let's just tell you something, right? Let's just tell you something about this Pink Panther doll. Pink Panther doll in the heading court, right? Okay. Those people got pictures of, of women on the house, on their walls. They got pictures, you know what I mean? They have statues that you can buy from various stores and people are nude. You know what I'm saying? They got all kind of stuff that are, that are, that's considered art. Just to, say, just, just to make the point. Not, not that it is, just to make the point. You understand? Mm -hmm. That it was that the evidence was so frail that they had to keep picking up a little pink doll and saying, and he had this, and he had this. Never tied it to me. No evidence that it was mine. No DNA that it was mine. Never even turned around and asked me, is this yours? Mm. You know what I'm saying? He just assumed it. Right. He said he found it in a place, but he said he found it in a bedroom, and then the picture they put up on the screen is not a bedroom. It's right. a front of room. Mm. And nobody lives in the room. The last people who was living there were people who was living after I had already left. Right. But they put it up there, and in the minutes you're going to hear him refer to that pink band that's being found in the bedroom. Mm. The, you know what I'm saying? Right. And then people are looking at that, and I'm looking up there, and I'm seeing all this blue. That's the color that sauna is. Blue rug and everything in there. Versus... A bedroom, which they say was, was was once black when I had it, but when it was, when I left there and someone took over there, we changed it. You see, that everything is beige and gold, and then I changed it. That a black rug, they changed. They put a leopard skin rug down there. You follow? Mm -hmm. But that's definitely not the bedroom. But right. But the, but the prosecution is calling the saying we found the pink panther in the bedroom. Okay. You follow? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Okay, and another issue was um, the pillows. They said that were in the well, that was funny. Georgia. You know what's so funny about the pillows? Huh? What's funny about those pillars is they kept pointing at two big pillars that was covered in leopard skin to match the rug that was put down by someone else, by right. the way. But when they made reference to the pillars and put a screen picture up again, and they was making reference to two pillars that was in my house when I lived upstate, they weren't even leopard skin, they were zebra. They were coming on this or witches were saying, yeah, that's the pillars I remember. And then they would pick and say, is that them over there? And they'd go, yes. So they would point up to a big picture on the screen with the jury sitting right there looking at it. It is zebra, and only like one fraction of the corner of it is in the picture. It's not even a full picture. Like, you know, just a small phrase of picture in a corner, right? Right. And it's obviously zebra print. There's a big difference between a zebra and a leopard. Right. Right? And then they would show two big pillars on the floor that were leopard, and the people on the stand would say, yes, that's the pillars I remember of state. And right in front of everybody, it's plain as day, it's in the minutes, right? Mm. Then, when one of the main so-called victims got up there, one of their key witnesses, they got up there and faintly said, well, one of the pillars were thrown away. And she referred to them as the F pillars, and I won't use the word. But she says, one of the pillars was thrown away. Literally, and this is the person who was in charge of the house, who ran the house, and said, one of the pillars was thrown away. Then, you look right there, and you see two pillars there. Right? And right. then they bring this girl in, and she says, yes, I covered the pillars. Right. They brought her in after the prosecution had rest, and they saw they had really lost the case, so they had to try something else. So they brought her in, and she said, yes, I covered those pillars. You follow? Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about the person who was in charge of everything down there was saying that I, I threw one of the pillars out, meaning not I, but themselves. They threw one of the pillars out. The person who was covering the pillars said, yes, I covered both those pillars. So there was two pillars there. A new pillar was added, right? Right. And that's why they say they can't find no DNA because they're looking at this. They don't have no pillars. And the pillars that used to be in my house were zebra. And the pillars are there, but they have me, 
next to no pillars. Other right. people laying on leopard skin pillars. Right. On, all together, taking pictures on the pillars. Me, nowhere on any of those pillars. Right. Is there, in fact, me or none of the pictures anywhere. Go ahead. Right. So basically, and another thing they, they didn't, what I wanted to address is any physical evidence, um, things of that nature. Did they find any physical evidence, like you mentioned, DNA, anywhere? They found no DNA, and that's why they didn't enter it at all. They found no DNA or nothing. They took the beds out of my house. They took the sheets out of my house. They took the blankets out of my house. They took the pillars out of my house. They took everything, and they found no DNA. And they found absolutely no DNA. If someone was having sex on that pillar, like they said, that I was having sex up into the night before I got arrested on that pillar, or on that bed, there would have definitely been DNA of mine there. Everyone knows that. Every forensic, and you don't have to be a forensic expert to know that. Right. So basically, they didn't have anything to corroborate the allegations. None. They had nothing to corroborate the album but hearsay. They had no evidence to tie any of the stuff they were saying to me whatsoever. And they knew it. That's why they closed the court down. Mm. We were talking about the lack of evidence that yes. on the prosecution. They had no had. evidence to tie me to any of the allegations. They had none. No okay. physical evidence, no medical evidence. The kids, so-called, there was no kids actually there, but they called them the kids. Their actual statements didn't collaborate didn't match up what was being said, didn't match up with me. Mm -hmm. They couldn't even place me in the right place. They couldn't even place me. They had the buildings wrong. Some of them were saying, in his house upstairs in the bathroom, there no, was no bathroom upstairs in my house right. when I lived there. And then they said I was in the so-and-so. They named places that didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. If you visited that place where I used to live, you see, this was impossible. Right. They mentioned a big office upstairs. There was no office upstairs. Mm -hmm. The whole area is no, long, no beginning from 12 by 12 circular. Right. And there's two floors, one above the next. Mm. They were making reference to it as if it's a house. Mm -hmm. You follow? Yes, I It wasn't. Go ahead. Um, another issue that they tried to, well, they did bring up in court was the, the videos, the XX rated DVDs and videos found at 404 Shady Dale Road. Right. Um, Here's the funny part about that. They said videos throughout the case. Right. And they presented a DVD. Mm. See, the reason why they had a problem with the DVD is because during the time that they were making these allegations, you couldn't duplicate DVDs then. Right. So they could, I couldn't have possibly had a replica of myself on a DVD doing anything, because during that period of time from 1988, you wasn't able, you just started being able to duplicate DVDs in 2003. Mm. So how could I have made DVDs? So they presented to the, to the jury a, a suitcase with DVDs in it, most of them was regular movies, but it wasn't mine anyway. But most of them was regular movies, and a few of them were the adult porno, which was still not mine. Okay? Right. And a person who wanted to come on and tell them that's mine, and had petitioned the government through letters, and went down to, to make it and said, those are mine, those are not his, I live in that house. They t totally would not let that person get on the stand. They ignored that person. They could not tie me in. Then the person who was going to say, some of those films, they know where they came from, because they were there when the person brought the films. And it doesn't mean it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. they, and they were, you know, there was a party to purchase them, as well as order them to the mail. And that mail, it came in the mail to a specific person's name, because they had ordered these books. And we put the books up on the screen. They could see the post office box, whose name is on the post office box, because they put a, their name on with mine and several other people, because we was all receiving mail at one point time. But this person's name is receiving all this pornography, all these pornography advertisements, and that person eventually admitted, those are mine. They made like that didn't happen. Right. There was no pornography found in my house in Athens. Mm -hmm. Then there was no videotapes found in my house in Athens that were X-rated. Right. But they was lying to the public, right, clear right there in front of the group. Oh, that's why I knew that jury was already picked and preset. Because they were saying videotape, 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 right? Mm -hmm. But they showed nothing but a DVD. They walked around saying, we got a couple little videotapes or something they had, some little clips they had from something that they couldn't tie to me. I wasn't on them. Mm -hmm. I wasn't videoing them. They didn't hear my voice in the background say anything about it. I probably wasn't even, you know, I don't even know what the environment of them was, but they wasn't right. me. You know what I'm saying? And they probably wasn't, they wasn't in my house. No video has no video takes of anybody doing anything in my house. Mm -hmm. If I were not on me on anything or any pictures at all of me. Right. So you had no DNA, right? The right. crime rate story, you had no video tape. They find no X-rated video tape. You understand what I mean by video versus DVD? Yes, I do. Or, or, or any other. And he's, he's working on a little 8mm for the jury that he didn't found and put together himself probably from his own collection. If I, well, I'm not on it. They can't say I taped it. My fingerprint ain't on it or nothing. Right. And they just come up and say those belong to you. They can, well, they can do it to anybody. They can walk in a court and just bring stuff out and go buy it or bring it from their home and say this belongs to him. Mm. And if you can't tie it to that, that new RICO law, that's why it's so shallow. It must, something must be done about it. Because mm. it gives them the power to just lie and bring in evidence that don't apply. They could not tie anything to me. Right. Whatsoever. Mm. And 
when Maxwell Wood and Harold Richard Seals was on television channel 13 and they were asked by someone who called a call in, they, they evaded the answer. I don't know what court you was in because I saw evidence. Right. Of course, they, of course they don't know what court he was in. Mr. Maxwell Wood and Seals and the judge made sure nobody was in the court so he wouldn't see that. Right. He's going to get on television and say, I don't know what court you was in. It was the court that the trial I was in. I saw evidence. Yeah, we all made sure nobody was in the trial but y'all. Mm -hmm. So people on the outside would be able to see that there was no evidence. Right. That's why y'all closed the court. Right. Go ahead. And you had brought up a, um, a point dealing with the pictures and um, some one of the, the pieces of evidence they put in was a, one of the alleged victims inside a bathroom right. was trying to say that it was your bathroom. Yes. They um, kept putting that up. They kept showing the same picture of this girl sitting in the corner in this bathroom. Now, I'm looking at the picture and I'm knowing right there that's not my bedroom, but I'm waiting for the punchline. Right. Right. But now, what they did then is they put another witness up on the stand and when they asked this witness right out of the sky, you see that person in that bathroom? They, and the person said, yeah. And they said, where's that person at? And that person said, oh, she's in one of the trailers. She said, no, 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 that picture right there. He said, yeah, that picture right there. Isn't that another kind of bathroom? She said, no. All the trailers had them kind of terms. They come. When you buy those trailers, double wide, you can get what they call the master bathroom with the big round plastic tub. And the person is actually sitting in one of the trailers on the land, not in Athens, in my house. Mm. And it was real clear. And so they, they hit that real quick when they realized that, and they got that person off the stand real quick. Right. So they didn't get a chance to prep people properly. Go ahead. And these were all, I mean, what I just asked you was basically the key points of evidence they were trying to produce into the court. So what is it, what is the evidence that the jury had to deliberate on if all this was... They had nothing but stuff that they were tagging and just saying. Nothing. They had nothing tangible. Mm. Right? And the, and the funny part about it, when they were deliberating, when they came to hung jury, the jury didn't ask for any evidence. They asked for the holy tablet of scripture that had nothing to do with the case and wasn't even entered into evidence by, by the prosecution or the defense. Right. They had nothing. Plus, you had a RICO that the government made so complicated that no way in the world you're going to tell me those 12 people can straighten that out in a couple of minutes because we came back with a hung jury and that was supposed to be the case. And the judge panicked, took a break, went to the back, talked to the jury, brainwashed them, threatened them, then came back and read a small portion of the court order on what a jury should deliberate to. Mm -hmm. Just the part saying you better come back with a decision. Told the one person that was saying, no, I disagree, which made the hung jury, if you don't agree with us, we're going to pull you off because I already made arrangements because the judge said ahead of time, we have this on record, that I'll even settle for 11, 11 jury, 11-man mm -hmm. jury. Mm -hmm. So he already he said that before the trial started, and if one person pops up and says no, it had to be a one black person there who says no, you understand? Right. Then he, said, able to, uh, he would have been able to throw her off anyway and put another white person there or someone who's already also pre been pre-picked. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was all set up. Right. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, in listening to what you're saying, you feel that... I'm, you feel that you, did you feel you had a fair trial? Of course not. There was no such thing as a, I, was, I didn't get a fair trial from day one, but let it on down in Brunswick, mm -hmm. no fair trial. Court was closed, military, flamethrowers, scaring people away, threatening people, passing out seals, and his people are passing out uh, bogus subpoenas to try to scare all the witnesses because they couldn't rally them. The government was afraid to call most of the so-called victims because the victims, we had to call them because had they called them, they would have got on the stand like they did because we called them one by one and they were saying nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. The jury is sitting right there listening to this here. More people stand up and say nothing happened than a handful of people who said something did happen, which was only four people, and each one of them were caught in a lie. But none of the people we put up there, we had parents of the people up there, the mothers, the fathers of the people involved saying, I know better. You know what I'm saying? I know they told me. I know it's so-and-so. Friends are the be best friends that say they would tell me everything. Relatives, a brother to one of the people saying, they comply to me all the time. I know better. I know my sister. Mm. You follow that? Yeah. So I know I didn't get a fair trial. I, I said that to the judge when I was down there. That's why I don't want to be a part of playing this game with y'all, because y'all don't play fair. Right. You know what I'm saying? He had no intention. He was selected and picked with an agenda. Mm. And I was like, rush this case through because it's going on too long. Get, find that man, Malachi, or whatever he's called. Find him guilty, put him away, and then go after those people and get them to walk inside of Georgia. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's what, the, that's what the racist agenda was in this case. It was no fair trial. Nothing about this case was fair. From the time they started picking the jury, the judge picked the jury himself. He hand-picked them. We had no choice. And when we pick somebody, he just go, no. Mm -hmm. Then the people who came in, the funniest thing, they came from a room of over 100 and some odd people, and then they came into the little room where we called, and everybody heard about the case, you know, read about the case, or discussed the case, and were discussing it outside in the courtroom at the exact same time while he was trying to select the jury. Mm -hmm. The jury members were all outside discussing the case already. Mm -hmm and how I was already guilty before they came and they said, yeah, we were all discussed, he was already guilty. And he still put those people on the board, on the uh, jury. This is, no, there was no fair trial at all. No way near. Plus, the, plus they clearly said that Brunswick had been um, spoiled by, by Seals and them. And right. he said all of Georgia 
had been spoiled years before this trial started. Right. But then he moved down to his own town because he said he figured out after years of saying that that place, how did he know that place was not spoiled? He, he had to go down and ask people, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go down and ask people, have you heard of Malachi? They're going to say no. He said, well, nobody heard of Malachi. Because then, then, then you, and, and you did that before the trial. So if you went down to try to find out if the place was spoiled by asking people if they heard in the Wapis, if they heard of Malachi, if they, you know, you know what I'm saying? Right. And then by that time, those people did hear about it. Right. And then when they come to Charlie, would have already heard. So there's no such thing as I went down here and checked to find out if the people knew. How can you find out if a person knows without asking them? Mm -hmm. And once I ask you about the person, then you know. Right. So, you know, it was a big hope. So it was a big, this was a big charade. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, now, with all that, I mean, with all that you've been through, with the violent arrest, with the torture for two years. Torture plus, is the word for it. I've been, I've been treated like an animal. Mm -hmm. I mean, the unjust judicial system, the betrayal by family and friends. How have you been able to remain so strong in this fight? I have a purpose. My purpose, I'm here to teach right now. I'm here to correct the lies. I'm a reformer. That's, that's my purpose. I'm a teacher, a master teacher. That's what I do. I have to keep that in the forefront of my mind at all times, that whatever's happened to me, that's what the ancient ones want to happen to me. That's what the Most High wants to happen to me. Now, the devil can mess with you the way he messed with Job in the Christian Bible. You follow? Yes. But that's all part of it. Now, I have, but I have as many people on the outside of the board that do love me. I have more, more than a one family member acting fool or two, but I have a whole bunch of others that are with me. I don't have a hundred kids. I don't have 70-something wives, and they didn't produce any DNA, or they didn't do any DNA. They said, we, we came across a magazine, or they came across a book with a bunch of pictures, and it says family, so he said, that's every woman in there and every child is mine. Uh, I, I outright another lie. Right. You know what I'm saying? Another one that lies to try to dirty me up. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm, I'm strengthened by those that do love me. I right. got people behind me. I got people that I don't even know write me from all over the world. I right. get letters from everywhere in language, some language I can't even read. Right. I'm supported. It's in the United Nations. It's in Hague. It's in Brussels. It's in the Congo. It's in Liberia. It's in Ghana. It's in London. It's in Holland. It's in Trinidad. It's in Jamaica. It's in Barbados. It's spreading, through, it's spreading all across the world. They think this little small town that played this game don't realize this is becoming a world event. Right. And our jurisdiction is at, at, is at the peak of all of it. The tip of the permit is our jurisdiction, and we have all the documents, all the laws, and all the evidence to confirm that we are your massive Native American Moors of the Creek Nation, and I am, I am the chief of that tribe, and we are what they would call Indians. Right. You follow? Yes. And they have no authority over me. They have no authority over anybody in the case. All the people in the part of the case, according to them, are tribal members. Mm. And, and according to our documents, they prove they're tribal members, so we have our own court system, we have our own constitution, we have our own laws, and we were here first, long right. before them. We had a war back in the 15th century. They didn't get here until 1776 to start setting this stuff up. Right. We was already living here when they came here and started stealing our land and making treaties, knowing that the Native Americans couldn't speak English and was putting X's down, and found out later, legally, our X is not recognized. Mm. So that's another law we're getting ready to present to them. So even the people who yes, or whatever, they made a so-called treaty or deal with the Nazis from Savannah and down in, down even in Brunswick, the, right. do, the, the documents are not legal. Right. And we got legal documents to confirm it. That's what they're afraid of, and that's what's trying to speed this case up. Hear them get me to a PSI. Hear them get me to a trial. Hear them get me sentenced. Close the case down. Shut it up. Blast them all over the television. Get a bunch of idiots out there yelling and screaming who would be doing that anyway, regardless of what, you know, regardless of who it is. Yeah, people doing that for everybody. Come on, There's always the idiots running around saying, I know it. I know it. That's their job. Right. They were born to do that. But the truth, the truth is what's holding me up. The right. fact that I know that it's fun to watch them play this game and know that they know, hey, this is the truth. Right. And lying on this man, right. lying on this organization, and I'm persecuting these people, and torturing this man, strapping him down, and putting him in cold places, and starving him, and not giving him his medication so he will have seizures and fall out, trying to physically kill me, put me in environment with dangerous people, and then put statements on television, and put it in, on a channel where everybody on television is watching, because they, they make sure the news comes on when anybody's in the day room eating, so they time it. Mm -hmm. they, they time your food schedule to be with the news, so you'll have to watch what they say. So everybody's standing, eating, looking up, and then you're over there and they're saying, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, and it's all one-sided. It's a very dangerous environment. They put me in a hostile environment with the, with the, with the host to kill me. And then all kind of slander state, uh, statements on television, and it just it still didn't work because people knew me as a master teacher. That's right. All right? Okay. Well, that's all I have to say for now. Okay. Well, we appreciate you taking some more time out. All right. We'll make another tape if it's necessary, but we will get the truth out. All right. Okay? Quite okay. Quite Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today is March 
11, yeah. 2004. That's correct. And we are, um, need to ask you some questions about some of the latest news we're hearing about. I will be 14 or what is it, 14 or 15 days away from the uh, sentence of the 26th. Right. Okay, right, so go ahead. Um, I was calling because I heard that they were going to be trying to close the transcripts of the minutes to the trial. That's correct. What is, what is that about? Well, actually, you see what happened is, first of all, they had to close the trial from the public so that no one would see what was going on in the courtroom, right? And then when Mr. Wood and Seals was on television and people started calling in asking about the evidence and about the witnesses, on the incident, their witnesses wasn't real victims, but just FBI agents and GBI and sheriff's people and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Their backs became against the wall because they couldn't answer. And so Ambassador Wood said, you must have been in a different court than I am. So he realized at that point, these people are waiting for the transcripts or the minutes so that the public can put it up. And so we st now they knew he was waiting to get the transcripts. The transcripts we needed was, A, the ones pre-trial, where the judge was making, making most of the bias statements, making covering up for the prosecution, assisting the prosecution, and making outright derogatory statements against myself, where he took away my constitutional rights because he wouldn't give me a continuance when he knew I just got a new attorney, Adrian Patrick, a brand new attorney. He knew I just got him, and this man couldn't have enough time in six days to get the case together. And the, as I said earlier, the prosecution had it for two years. So he, working with them, immediately said, no, let this young man work by himself. You follow? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't even let anybody assist him in the court when he had, well, can I get somebody behind me to have a whole bunch of boxes? Because the Dolan firm gave me 30 something boxes and stuff that ain't nobody been in. They haven't even went to my dust on me. Can I get someone to come in the court, work behind me? He was told no. Meanwhile, the judge, Ashley Rose, allowed the prosecution to have Jelaine Warden, who's a part of the state case. You follow? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have Thatcher from Washington, D.C. Then they had another woman up there named Tracy Bowen, right? But they had all of them there. They was allowed to run in and out the court and assist Maxwell Wood, uh, Moultrie, and Thatcher, giving them five other people sitting behind them with the press leaning over their shoulders. Mm. You follow? So they can assist them. So what happened is the truth is now starting to come out, like they say. The chickens are coming home to roost. Right. As uh, they would put it. Now they begin to see and realize that we ain't waiting to get the transcripts. They also realize we have specialists that are on it. Uh, NLPA? Yes. Out of Cincinnati. And they're on the case. And their people dissected the uh, so-called PSI and saw all kind of mistakes and heights and upward departures and stuff that shouldn't be there. Right? Now we got some special lawyers out of New York that are working. And we got another lawyer out of Savannah that are working. So they now know we're going to have people going through these minutes with a fine tooth comb. Right. And each transcript and can find every contradiction and every mistake that they make. You follow? So what they're doing now is telling people, not only could you not see the truth in court, but now we don't even want you to hear the truth in court. We're going to block the minutes because they know each of so As we get a transcript, we're going to put that transcript up on the Internet for everybody to see what people said while on the stand, how they was cross-examined. They went as far as saying they want to knock down their own experts, not just our experts, but their own experts. They're actually trying to block their own experts mm -hmm. because they had a situation that came up in the court case where they were saying none of the kids that they claimed was being sexually abused all these years had any physical damage. Mm -hmm. So they had to bring in uh, lying experts who could say, you can have no physical damage being raped from seven, eight, nine, and ten years old all your life for, for how many years is that? For almost um, five, five eight years. Years. 10, 15 years of being raped on a daily basis, according to their own statements, two or three times a day, four or five times a day, and have no scars. And uh, then the prosecution, Mr. Wood, made that a major point. It doesn't matter if you have no scars, because whether you, have, whether you come up normal or not, then you still, it's still, you can be normal with no scars and no trace of scars, no, uh, what they call that, for keloiding, no nothing, no damage, and be, have been molested, or you can't. Then later on, when Mr. Mochi started to close, his argument, he made a point to, to, to dig in on one subject, saying one of the people there had a scar. And all of a sudden, one scar pops up that's very important. They know that's going to pop up in the minutes. They know their experts made all kinds of mistakes. They know the agents they put on the stand, like Jelaine Ward, reaffirmed that there was never anyone that told her I ever transported anybody across the state line for anything, especially sexually. Right? They knew that the mothers got on the stand and said, I, I took my daughter or my son across the state line. He ain't had nothing to do with it. We didn't even leave, live in Putnam County when he was living there. And then the no people got on the stand and said, Malachi didn't live in Putnam County during this whole period of time. He ain't been over here for, for two years. They see all of that. They see the mistakes. They see the errors the judge made when the judge was making poor decisions. He was making emotional decisions. And he was being arrogant and being racist all at the same time. Then it came out what's going on in Gwynn County. We just found out it's on the news in Brunswick. You can go to our webpage and 
cartoon, and you see in Brunswick, they have down there what they call uh, what they call corrupt jury pools. Right. People who've been brought, people who've been people who've been paid, people who've been threatened and put on that jury pool so they can control them. But, so what they try to do is they want to lock down the jury deliberation when the judge was picking the jurors. Right. They have to lock that down because they're making statements that nobody heard about this case and he puts his life on the line and his career on the line and then you come to find out every jury that walks in the room says, yes, I heard about the case, I heard it from the Brunswick News. The Brunswick News was sponsored by, uh, I think it was done by Seals. Seals was one who was responsible for the Brunswick News knowing because he called down and spoke on the telephone and had it in the paper before right. the trial, before the pre-trial, and before the parade. Right. So they had already spoiled it, but the judge had to move on because he was under orders to do it. You follow? So in actuality, yeah, what you're saying is true. We have a situation now where they're going to really try to see the public because they don't want nobody to hear what went on the court. So first they made it so no one can see what went on the court. Right? Right. And now they're making it so no one will hear. You know, they see no evil, hear no evil. Right. And therefore, we will not be able to speak the truth. That's right. And there will be, everybody, the world will be deceived. We're not having it because the Most High has its own way of working. And what happened is we already got the first two transcripts of the pre-trial. I don't have them. Other people got them. The attorney don't have them. Other people got them because they say only the attorney can get it. And they, that means only the attorney can look at it, only the attorney can check it out. But we have several attorneys. Right. We don't have one attorney. That's what they think, there's only one attorney. Right. But we already got two very important, those here pre-trial, they're the 30th and the 16th in detail. And as our experts are going through them, there's so many contradictions and mistakes that that alone is going to further heighten an investigation into the illegalness and corruptness of this particular case. If I was, I run too fast for you. No, not at all. Maybe I've known all that. Well, basically, at this point, they're trying to... Oh, by the way, also the sutra has for a torture. Right. They were trying to let us go to a limitation so we would miss that by giving us a deadline, but we made that too. That's in, so the torture suit goes on, and that's not just a national suit, that's an international suit. It's in the United Nations, it's in Geneva, it's in Belgium. I mean, we made it a worldwide thing. Everybody has documents in their hand, of it, so it doesn't stay in middle Georgia in the small mines and rural this area through, through old primitive racism. Right, and at this point, in the, we're going into the the, um, the sentencing phase of things. Right. What do you see that they're trying so hard to do at this point to keep the truth from coming out besides just the closing of the minutes and things of that nature? Okay, what they did was very interesting. When they, they never expected us to be able to respond to their PSI the way we did. Mm -hmm. Well, the experts, they was depending on us using one person. Mm -hmm. But we fooled them, and we responded to everything that they have. They saw that, and they panicked. So now that's what made them come down with, let's close it down. Because on the 10th, they sent a document out saying they want to add some more witnesses into the federal PSI. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know on the same day we was found the answer to the PSI. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Now what they got to do is fool the public by rushing into a sentence, make like they don't see none of this stuff, put it off, let the judge sit up there. He has to, he has to address a certain thing in a certain period of time by the 23rd, which mm -hmm. is what we can't discuss right now, mm -hmm. right? But then knock all that down and then go on to their sentence. Give me a sentence to the public, broadcast it all over the television, make it look like Malachi got sentenced, and all that stuff, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. then hide it when we come after him, and the public won't hear it, because the media down here, of course, Middle Georgia, Megan Telegraph, Channel 13, Channel, whatever, it's 20 something, all of them are part of the good old boy circle. So right. they keep it clock, locked down on what they want. They only put on television down here what they want, the program they want, or, and the media that they control every day is only local. So that people down here will never know what happened. I'll be out here somewhere, to know, you know, in a, a federal place somewhere, while we turn over in this case, and the public will never hear, they think. Right. But because we're public people, we're literate people, we're going to make sure everything we do goes up on the internet. Okay. And we're going to get the transcripts, even if you close it, because we're going to file what they call the Sunshine Act. Right. The Freedom of Information Act. He's locking all these things down because he don't want the public to hear what went on in pre-trial discussions. I forgot what day that was when I was down in his um, office. He, 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 sealed, he sealed it anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we got we got some of them. Some of them he said, he, everything that can be detrimental to him, where he's contradicting himself, or where he's being biased, or where he's outright violating the law, he's locking away and sealing down so the public can't see it. But there's laws in this country that mean, called the sun, like I call the Sunshine Act, like I said, which gives you the right Right, to file. It's like the stenographer who can block it down. The stenographer tells our brothers today, right, that well he's not going to continue because he heard that they're going to lie. How do you hear? Who told him? Someone had to call over and tell the man who actually is supposed to be doing the transcripts. And that's before the judge had even stamped it. Right. Or approved it. So that means they're so in cahoots that they're all calling each other saying, stop these people from getting these transcripts now. They heard, I listened to my telephone calls and transporting them to TJ 
together that we already got two major dates. We got the 30th and we got the 16th, right? Not to mention, we got other motions where the judge mo moved on jurisdiction, which he had no authority to do, nor did he answer it properly. But we got the ones where we made points of jurisdiction and we made points of age dealing with a certain uh, individual where we caught the indictment where indictment was incorrectly written. Oh, he had a attorney working was called Ben Davis, right? And he, put, he had trapped Moultrie and the court came to Moultrie's aid. But first the judge said, I'm going to have to go with Mr. Ben Davis, mm -hmm. Mr. Moultrie. I'm going to have to go with Mr. Ben Davis because what he's saying is not true. Then the judge gave Moultrie a chance to come up with something. We checked the docket. No doctor with Moultrie ever responded to that, and they went on with the trial anyway. So they have so many things, and so many ways that they violated the law in this case, that they've done it to themselves. Now they've got to try to hoodwink you. But the sun is coming in. The sun is coming out. Our people are going to be out. We're going to have signs. Right. We're going to be marching. We don't violate the law, and we're non-violent. Mm -hmm. But we will be marching, and we will have signs, and we will bring from across the state to have sort of thousands of them out there marching with signs until we get a reaction on all these violations. This is a corrupt case. Saying I'm innocent of these charges, they know I am. I've written 407 books. I scared the living heck out of these people because I'm so literate and on the growth of this organization. And then on top of that, I'll try. I am not the leader of all the New Orleans. I am the chief of the Amalgamated Native American Moors of the Creek Nation, which also, by the way, comes up in the minutes for the 30th, mm. right? And confirms it, all, all, all those confirmations. You follow? But right. they want to make me the leader so they can do this kingpin thing and do this Rico thing, which they don't have any legitimacy to it. Right? Right. They're just trying to override the people with their self-righteousness. Think because they say it, you must believe it. That's the whole slave master mentality. Just because somebody, somebody there who's a European says it, it must be believed. Right. And that's why it's everything to block the evidence in the court. And now, now that the public now that didn't get a chance to see it with their own eyes, which, 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 which violated my Sixth Amendment right and the First Amendment right, mm -hmm. right? They, now they're going to make it so you can't even hear it. Mm. So they can go on and try to do what they want. We're too many of us. We're too powerful of people. We're too dedicated to what we're about, and we're not. We're not. We're not the kind of niggas they bred. Right. By far, they, they will have to. They will have to reckon with us. We will deal. We don't do violence, but we will make the world know. And, we, and it's growing every day. Well, thank you again for taking another time out. My pleasure. Out. All right. The truth shall, shall make you free. That's right. All right. Take care. Welcome back. This is March 5th, 2004, speaking to you from the belly of the beast. My name is Maku, Chief Black Thunderbird, Eagle, also known as Dr. Malachi Ziyok L. The Chief of the Amasi Native American Moors of the Creek Nation, Registry Number 208-1999. Go ahead, there's a question you'd like to ask me. Um, yes, how are you doing this morning? I feel well. That's good. Um, well, we just completed an interview um, prior to this one regarding to the ch um, before the trial. That's correct. Um, so I'd like to um, ask you some questions um, that maybe the public um, wasn't aware of that took place during the trial. Okay. Um, the trial started January 5th, 2004. That's right. And it was a closed courtroom. What right. is your What is your um, stance or your position on why the courtroom was closed? Well, the judge has placed their purpose. Ever since June 30th when I stood up and I made my declaration of jurisdiction status and they knew I was I had a genealogist tracing out the charts and these genealogists had put their seal of approval we had the whole family chart for me straight on back to the Massachusetts Indians all the way coming down to Cherokee all the way down to the with the Seminoles and of course our family tribe in Massey. They knew we had all the facts of jurisdiction. Right? They knew that every time I stepped in court, I pointed out my jurisdiction rights and how they had no rights over me. My inalienable rights were being blocked. I don't live by their laws or by their government. They knew that was coming. And so what they did is whatever lawyer they threw at me, and they were giving me lawyers that I didn't, that I didn't hire on, like the Garland firm, but it was their place, their sole purpose to draw rich black money so that they can give them pleas and mess their careers up. Right? I didn't hire those people. I didn't sign any contracts with those people. I didn't make any verbal agreements with those people. My lawyer was Leroy Johnson, first black senator in Georgia. They pushed them out the way and they jumped on it so they can sabotage this case. The purpose of this case is to establish certain precedents in the state of Georgia. One is this is the first time the feds ever got involved in what they call a sex case. You follow? Yes. And second, this is the first time Middle District Georgia got involved with a RICO case. So they were trying to set up precedents with this organization as they call us the Nawapians and, and avoiding our Yamasi Native American tribal name so that they can keep it as a religious organization. And this is why the case was all in court based around religious and religious belief and who 
who I say I am and who they believe I to be so that they can eventually, after this case, set a precedent to go after all of the black ministers in Georgia, like Creflo and all the other prominent black ministers, so they can come after them, somebody can come out the framework 10 years, 15 years, and say he did something to them, he felt them, or he did this thing, get three or four people to collaborate that was on salary by the government, by the way, because we found out the witnesses were on salary, receiving favorable concessions, which came out in the court. Right? I know I didn't answer your question yet, but I want to get this on point. Okay. Right? Uh, receiving favorable concessions like Jake York was paid by them. We know that to be a fact. And, they, and he was sent out to scare other people, to tell other people, we got information on you, and if you don't say this, and we're going to take your kids away, we're going to lock you up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they got him because he was involved in all kind of drug trafficking and things in New York with that organization he belonged to called the Junior Mafia and his involvement with Little Kim. If you look on the back of her album, you see him there as Jake York of York. Records that's involved with a certain group of people that's, and, you know, and then his own best friend came forth called Damien, and he told the secrets and revealed the whole plot. Now, mm -hmm. to answer your question, but now that that's on point, right? Mm -hmm. Why did they close the court? The judge had to close the court because they knew they didn't have the witnesses. They had boasted from day one that they had all these children that had been molested. And they said, they're going to put them up there and they can't wait. Because I remember when I was in Atlanta, when Mr. Bright came on with his new indictment, the first thing he said in the newspaper, in the Atlanta Constitutional Journal, mm -hmm. and in news today, he said, I want to put every child up there because I want every part of this case heard. Mm -hmm. That was his whole new thing when he came up with all this new indictment. Mm -hmm. As time went on, they realized that as they called people and interviewed people, that most of the people that they, were, that they had as victims were saying nothing never happened. Right. And they had to be isolated down to a handful of people who had corrupt records. For instance, Sakina Parham had charges against her for abusing my son. Mm. And she knew that she had filed child support in Clark County for me, but not in Putnam County, along with uh, um, Pauline Rogers. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to court in um, Fulton County with Pauline Rogers, and I won legal custody of my children, and then... Uh, Sakina Parham got scared because she knew once she comes back, she came to court there and they found out she had abused my child, that I would automatically get my son. So she withdrew and joined in the club and joined into the clique. Mm. Then you had Barbara Noel. She had bought a house while she was on welfare. She was receiving welfare in Athens and receiving welfare in um, somewhere in Georgia. We got the, got the documents, right? And then she went and purchased a house of $135,000 with Jacob York. Jacob York went to a Damien Pryor, who was one of his best friends who used to adjust checks for them to make fraudulent checks, and we got the records and the proof and the checks and the documents, and went to him and told him how he needed this house so he could get these girls to come off the land so he could set up a halfway house so he can coerce them to bring York down. Mm. You with me? Yes, I am. So then what Damien did is said, I'm not doing it. He got mad at Damien, but not before Damien was allowed to hang out with him at some of his uh, gay and freaky parties and be able to video it, okay? Okay. Now, Barbara Noel, which is uh, also, named, also named as Belle Keith, we have a document on, on her webpage, which we trace, had traced back to her, no doubt, where she's making a bribe while I was incarcerated in, in, on the lockdown in uh, Atlanta, where she's trying to bribe us and tell us how to launder money. This is how they got their tailoring or laundering money concept to bring in a RICO. It came from Barbara Noel. We have the document where she wrote and said, give me a certain amount of money and put it in this kind of, in this kind of money or this and break it down like this and everything will go away. We got a bunch of letters from her son admitting to me that he's very sorry that his mother and them put him up to do this for a lot, you know, for money, and told him how now that they're out of the community, they can't survive, and they don't know how to do anything, and they need to go, and the community should be paying them, and so they just get money out of the community, so then it was easy for Jake to solicit them and get them in. Then the same thing with the sister was having mental problems all the time, so they tied her in it. So now they got a package of people that he didn't convince that this is how we're going to work this. They all lived in the house together, they rehearsed their stories, and they started soliciting other people who was what they called dissidents or disquanted members who were put out for various reasons. Right? Most of the times it was something like Ada, which is um, Nicole uh, Lopez, which is Barbara Noel's daughter, the oldest daughter. Uh, each one of the children about different fathers. Mm. Right? She, a letter surface where she's having a party with a bunch of teenage boys underage while she was overage, and she's admitting having sex with them and drinking and smoking marijuana and stealing a bunch of different things. That letter was entered, a portion of that letter was entered, I should say, into evidence. Mm -hmm. Before this, they planned on having an open court, make a big scene out of it. The judge was smart, so what he said was, I'm going to move this down to a town called Brunswick. So it happened that Brunswick is the same town that the Amassi Native American Moors had their conflict with the Confederates, and he happens to be, Judge, 
fact, you all happen to be a descendant directly of those Confederates. This is no coincidence, no, right? No. And he took it down to Brunswick where he practiced law and lived for 20 years. This is no coincidence. He chose the jury himself. I sat there. Every time we would see somebody, they would say, he would say no and just and then pick somebody else. He had already had these people picked. The people outside in the courtroom, because when you have a jury pick, you're sitting in a separate room. Outside in the courtroom, the people were gathered over 200 people waiting to be selected. As they were coming in, he would ask them, this Ashley Royal, right? And we have the minister this here. Did you hear about the case? They would say yes. The whole purpose of pulling the jury is because they're not supposed to hear about the case, so they're not biased or prejudiced. They would say yes. Where did you hear about the case? I heard about the case from the Savannah newspaper. I heard about the case from the Brunswick newspaper. I heard about the case on the radio this morning. And did you hear about a guilty plea? Yes, I heard that the man pleaded guilty, so he must be guilty. He still put those people on the jury panel. Mm -hmm. After he came in and said they were discussing it outside, inside, court before they came in. And this, we got, I mean, I don't know, about, about, I guess about, out of the 40 or 50 people that he did bring in, everyone said they, not one person said they never heard nothing about the case, or never heard nothing about the Nwapis, or never heard nothing about Malachi New York, or, or what they called the cult. Every single one of them admitted to having heard something about this case. He still put them on the jury panel, and then he shuffled the jury panel in a way where it looked like there were some blacks up there, which would make it somewhere near a jury of my peers, but by the time it came down, those were the, those were the, what they call the sit-ins. And they were pulled off. And the one black woman who was left up there is the one woman who said, this case is a, ha is a, fa is a, a farce, and I know it's going to get overturned, and I don't want to be a part of it. So she, re she resulted in a hung jury. And But what he did is he made all the juries anonymous so nobody could find them. So he could pick them and get rid of them so nobody can trace this out. So he set it up like that. So they moved it down there. But he moved his excuse that he'd been monitoring the Nawapians for years as a judge in the Middle District, right? And he said they've been getting unfavorable press. He, he, this is, we have this in his own motion. Unfavorable press for years. So now if, they, if we've been getting unfavorable press in the Middle District for years, how did Sheriff Howard Richard Seals or Frederick Bright pull a grand jury out of what they would call a tinted environment? He said the only place I could find in the state or in outside the state would be down in Southern Brunswick. Well, Southern Brunswick invited, invited our lodge to come down into a parade, unbeknown to them, so he turned around and said that we passed our flyers. But not one of the people that was called into the judges' chambers, not one of them said that they said, saw it or read about it in a flyer. The judge himself introduced two people, said one is a furniture man, one is a friend of his. He never, he never had those people show up in court. That was further hearsay. Right. Point being, they closed the case down once they read our net and they saw that we had over 3,500,000 people who were reading the case. And we were putting the details of the case up there about the people, the letters they exchanged, their confessions, their recantments, their diseases that they have so they can see it. Everybody where their family comes or who their fathers were and about Jake and his history. And meanwhile, the judge admits on the court, I was on the net and I read their stuff on the net. He admitted that while in the court. So he saw the facts. He saw that they had a disease, they had a venereal diseases, chlamydia, and herpes, and I didn't have it. Right? He saw that there was no DNA on anything that they claimed. He heard one of the, one of the so-called witnesses say there was two pillars and one was thrown away, yet they had two pillars in court. So they actually created another pillar to put it in, because some of the other witnesses kept saying two pillars, but the person who took over the house in Putnam County when I moved the clock, right? That person there changed the house, painted the house up, fixed the house up, and I guess put enough, created another pillar to, to, to match. So he saw all of that, and he said, we got to close this case down so the world don't see it, so we can dictate on our televisions what we want the public to think. So we can make, uh, we got witnesses on the stand, and we can make like what they're saying is true. And that's a, ta a tactic they use to close this case and put it down there in that small town, and then put a military flamethrowers. They had all kind of weapons so nobody could get near the court. They had me locked down in what they call a uh, holding cell. A holding cell is supposed to be a temporary spot you sit while you wait to go to trial. You shouldn't be there more than a couple of hours. I had to live there on the floor for three straight weeks. My medicine was messed up. My facility for cleaning, is, I wasn't getting proper cleaning. I was only allowed to walk from one room, which is about 20 feet, into the court and back. And bad food and then arrogant marshals with attitudes. And I had to stay there for the whole three weeks through that trial with no mail, no contact with family, no telephone, no business, and only one lawyer who, who he wouldn't even give a continuance so he had time to fight the case. Because they knew once I finally got the right to fire the Garland firm publicly because they, they said I hired him and I didn't, that I needed an attorney. And the judge wouldn't. The judge royal would not. And I said to my constitutional rights would be violated. I need a continuance so we can go on and fight this case. I want to work with this man here. And they said no. All that's a part of the motion. I'm going to call you back so we can continue this. Okay. So we have about 20 people who they contacted by phone.
phone or invited to parties and tried to get involved, and they said no. And these witnesses are all standing by with their testimonies that have been written down as affidavits. The judge tried to block it. Damien Pryor, one of his right-hand men who came in the court to tell him, I was there, let me explain to you exactly what took place. I know the whole case, blah, 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 blah. The judge heard his statement, which we have in a minute, and then said, no, we're not letting the jury hear this. The, the medical doctors came in and explained about how these children had no damage, there was no tears, no scars, and they made a very important point, because they had a bunch of white doctors up there saying, well, scars heal fast. The difference between black people and white people are negroids and corpusoids is that negroids keloid. We do not heal the same way. We always have scar tissue left because we have a, a strong a strong amount of hemoglobin and plasma in our blood, so we keloid, so scars are there. So if all these children were being lifted from that young age, they'd have to be some scar. Now, one girl ends up with a scar, but she's one of the girls who gets on the stand and admits that she never had sex, but she's a twin to another girl who doesn't have a scar, a scar, and that scar was way up in there, and they proved that it had nothing to do with sexual contact. That was some other illness, but they tried to make it look like that for the public when they came on the news. They was making it look like they had all these kids on the stand when they didn't have anybody on the stand. Their 308, which is supposed to be their statements, were created by the FBI agents, and then they put, the witness they put up there couldn't even collaborate the statements that was in the PSI, and they were literally turning around saying to them, well, I never said that. And I never said this, and this is supposed to be their witnesses. I didn't say that. I don't remember that. No, I had a boyfriend. We had sex. Another one gets up. Her mother gets on the stand, and she literally says, but you told me after you left the land, while I was in the doctor's office, you was being examined, and you were still a virgin. How did you end up in this case? And, they, and my, my, one of the prosecutors attack, started attacking the mother for telling the truth. She said, I'm only telling you the truth. When my daughter was getting ready to leave the land, she said the last thing she said she wanted to do is I want to run down the hill and say goodbye to Baba. And she said, I couldn't understand. If you're telling me that you're leaving this place because something happened to you, why would you be going down there to the person you're claiming did it to you? That don't make no sense to me. And the mother said that on the stand, and we have to minister to that. And then she admitted that when they got out of the place and went to the doctor, got an examination, that she was found to be a virgin. And then we have a diary when she left, and a promiscuous just comes up in a diary while she's in the bathroom having sex with two or three boys, and she wrote this herself. They didn't want to let that in as evidence, but we got that in as evidence. So you can see that the case was well set up. It was a well plot. The whole plot is to get established in Georgia a precedence to go after Christian ministers, to go after black, wealthy ministers in their big churches, and they're trying to use us as an example. That's why they wouldn't let us remain a large or fraternity. They had to turn us into a church and a cult. And without how many times it keeps proving we wasn't a religious organization, they would pull us back. Every time it was proven it was a tribe of Indians, they would pull it back to religion, religion, religion. It was pumping that during the trial to the point where, out of all the evidence that the jury asked for, they asked for our holy book, something that wasn't even entered into evidence. They didn't ask for any of the documents about DNA, or the documents or the medical records, or the, or the statements. They asked for a holy book that was not even a part of the case, and the judge had to turn it down. They asked us. He said, sure, they can send it. The prosecution said, no, don't send it down. And the judge said, no, because the prosecution and the judge was all working together through the whole case. That's why we tried to get the judge recused three times during the case, because when the prosecution was failing to find things, he would, he would tell his assistant, look this up for me on the sidebar, whisper it, and then give it over to the prosecution. And we was like, wait a minute, you can't do that. He said, I do what I feel like in my court, because I'm the gatekeeper here. And he just said, we knew right then it was a setup. I know I'm talking fast, and I'm trying to get as much as I can on tape for okay. your questions for the tape. Go ahead. Um, so basically what you're saying is the, the closed courtroom, um, a lot was going on that the public could not could not see. A whole lot was going on. I mean, the, the attorney, uh, Adrian Patches, on several cases said, listen, I need to present my witness. The judge said, we want to know everybody that's on your witness list. And he said, I'm not giving y'all, everybody on my witness list so y'all know where to go sabotage. Meanwhile, Sheriff Howard Richard Seals and his cronies, who was over five hours away from Putnam County, while well, Putnam County, by the way, a prisoner was breaking out of their jail, right? There was five hours away down there, and it wasn't authorized, and it wasn't deputized. They were passing out bogus subpoenas to all of our witnesses trying to scare them. How do we know they're bogus? Because we backtracked the dates and the log to see whether there was any docket numbers to the, to the uh, court date, and there was none. The whole purpose was Sheriff Howard to signal to them what they were sending his sentence men out, and they see that person there is one of their witnesses, and that was one of the so-called victims that's on their side. Here, you're going to be subpoenaed to be this here. You're going to be subpoenaed to be They threatened the ch uh, Kathy Johnson, and they brought, they brought in, which is really my son, and they put him on the stand, he said, nothing never happened to me. And they, then they put an agent on and said, he told me something never happened. So he said, really? Hold him over to the next day. We hold him over to the next day just so we don't want to put him on the stand again. We said, why not? He wants to come back in and he wants to refute what that, that person said. Because he said, nothing never happened to me. And the medical record shows nothing never happens to him. And he, he has very negroid features, so his keloids would definitely show. Mm. You know what I'm 
there, and so they, when they brought him up there, because he told the truth, they took him to back to a, uh, what do you call it, a boarding home, and wouldn't let him come outside now, because he told the truth in court. Public they ain't, they ain't seen that. First he was allowed to come out, all of a sudden now they lock him down, and say, because you told the truth now, you know, we're locking you up, because they can't, now his statement is still in the PSR, and it's not supposed to be there. Uh, this is the kind of thing they did, yes. The purpose was close the court so the public would not see what's really going on down here. Wouldn't see who had the evidence. Wouldn't see everything was in our favor. There was, like I said, no DNA. How can you say this person was screwing on this pillar every day for years and there's no DNA? And you said up until the day before, up until night before the arrest, which was May 8th. So you can't say that the DNA expired. If you're saying that, it would still be there. Uh -huh. You follow? No DNA, right? I have none of the diseases that they claim. Most of them, uh, certain girls and big girls, because none of them were kids. They brought in a bunch of adults. They brought in four people, and they were all 17. One of the people they brought in, they brought in from jail. She had been arrested, and they tried to keep this from the public, for possession of a deadly weapon and a stolen vehicle that she had stolen. Her mother was on the stand and lied, and knew she lied, while on the stand said to the jury, I only bribed Mr. York. I bribed him, and, and laughed, and said, I told my mother all kind of lies because I was afraid. This is, in, this is actually this. I lied to the grand jury. Sister came and said he came to me. I didn't go to him. He spent a week with me crying, telling me how they're putting him up to this and he don't want to do this. And then he said, get me a pencil and paper. And he wrote this, these, these letters and then sent them over. And by the time they got to Garland them and to uh, Manny or, or Aurora and them was also working with the system, pretending that they were my attorneys, they turned it around and, and sabotaged this, this boy's perfectly clean uh, recampment by telling at the end of this, your mother might still go to jail. If you could go to jail, your sister's going to go to jail. They're going to go after your other sister, the one that's a child molester. They, and so they scared the boy again and made him, made him, and they fabricated another letter. And they bounced back and forth with three or four recampments. I mean, ridiculous stuff. They had to hide this from the public so they could put on the news what they wanted the public to see so the facts would never get out. But they didn't take into consideration that we're very literate people. And we go to the internet and we got international involvement. We are all the way from Africa, all the way to Europe. We're in Hague. We're in Belgium. We're in Holland. We're in London. We're in Liberia. We're in Ghana. We're in the Congo. We're in South Africa. We're in Eritrea. And we got officials and throughout the Caribbean starting to write letters. We're getting letters from all the governors. And some of the letters have come back saying, we know there's something shady about this case. And these are elected officials saying there's something shady about this case. They can all see it. Because the way they close it down, put military with flamethrowers around the courthouse in Brunswick, there was not one incident whatsoever. The Nawabians never had an incident. Now they're starting this new trend of arresting niggas on the streets and telling them to say that they're Nawabians. And say that you did, say that you did. They gave them something away a couple of days ago and they said they arrested some Nawabians and they had dogs and marijuana. A, Nawabians don't have dogs. That's another mistake still. So when they say Nawabians cut a dog up, we don't have dogs separately. And B, we don't smoke marijuana or drink alcohol of any of any type. So they, 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 these are these are people they're selecting, putting them in the costume so they can keep putting on the news, so they can try to keep their case sustained. Because the sole purpose again is to set a precedence in Middle Georgia, but to go after all of the rich ministers. They, they, they're just using us so they can go. After, if you go to Atlanta, they got some big big churches with thousands of followers, and and a racist Georgia wants to go after them because they're getting too powerful. People like Crypto Dollar, uh -huh. a bunch of them up there. They need their churches, they're getting too powerful, and, they, and when they get that many blacks in one place, they'll be able to vote. And their big, biggest fear is them voting, priority votes. You well, follow that? Yes, I do. Because they're trying to turn Georgia into a republic state, and 90% of it is Democrat. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Okay, so what you're saying is there is a lot of testimony and a lot of um, evidence that did not even make it into the court um, that the judge would not allow or the jury the jury was not allowed to deliberate well, on. Privilege to it, right. Right. In fact, they put in the post in the newspaper, the judge, they said that the prosecution has 47 witnesses, and we only had 42. The difference between their witnesses and our witnesses, our witnesses were human beings, people who came to testify, and some of the so-called victims who came to testify on my behalf. Uh -huh. This oh. was nothing but FBI agent, doctors, so-called specialists, and their doctors, are so, their doctors are so ridiculous that they said, if there's no scars, there's molestation, and if there is scars, there's molestation. So the attorney asked them, what's the, what's the purpose of the examination? And, and the doctor, so-called specialist, couldn't, co couldn't comment. How can you say, we got the minutes to that now, uh -huh. how can you say that if there's no damage, there's molestation, and if there is damage, there's molestation? This, that's a, that's a no-win situation. Right. That's the kind of stuff they were trying to hide. Because right. they could not, they couldn't tie me into anything. They couldn't tie me to this so-called. There was no videotapes found in my house. Uh -huh. No sex rated 
x-rayed anything. The most that they found was x-rays of none of it was tied to me at all. They right. don't, I, when they raided my house, they found money. They didn't find money under my bed, first of all, because I have one of those mechanical beds and you can't go up under it. First of all, nothing to do with Putnam County. I didn't live in Putnam County. I have no interest in the property in Putnam County, and I, and I don't own it by far. It's owned by different people with property. I said, I don't want nothing to do with the property. I haven't been around there for two years. I just was coming back around this uh, 19, uh, what, uh, 2002 for the savings day, and I was helping them shop, and that's, why they, that's when they arrested me in Baldwin County, because other than that, they checked the record, they'll find I hadn't even been there for two years. I, didn't, I hadn't even visited the land. Hmm. If I was old, they, that's all part of a hoax. It's a lie. It's a scandal. They got to pull down us. I have about 407 books. My books are profound and thorough and factual, and they know it, and they see how fast organizations are growing worldwide. They're intimidated by me. They're intimidated by my intelligence and intimidated by the growth of this organization. They tried to declare me Jesus. I never claimed to be Jesus. They tried to declare me God. I never claimed to be the God. I say all of us are children of the Most High God. Right? Whether right. you want to call him God, or you want to call him Elohim, or you want to call him Allah, any name that makes you feel happy, but the bottom line is, I don't claim to be Jesus Christ, and I never did, and it's written in my books, I don't claim to be any of the things that they had to use to make it a religious thing so they could take the, so they could eventually use this to get against other people. So they try to pull us down, try to, try to destroy those people's land, that beautiful Egyptian village out there. People need to go out there and visit that Egyptian village and see why them white folks out there are so upset and want to tear it down. That's a small minority of racist people in a small town of Putnam County, and they see that this was all done independently of them, and it's sustaining itself. Then we moved to Athens, we started again over there to start another thing when I broke away from them, and they came out there and attacked us there also. Okay. Well, what I, the next question I would like to ask you when you call back is regarding the RICO and the money structuring charges, because it seems like that, that's a charge that doesn't really make sense of how it made it into this trial, and maybe you could enlighten the people on um, the reasons why it was, okay? I'm going over. All right. Today is March 14th. It's another interview with Chief Black Thunderbird Eagle. How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing well. Good. I'm um, asking um, some interview questions today regarding um, some information dealing with the pledges and things of that nature. Yes. What, what is it? What are the pledges, and how can people out there better assist you in this time period dealing with your fin you know, financially? There's no pledges that I'm behind. Right? There's only those people who want to send their stuff to the Emancipated Native American Moors of the Creek Nation. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, BIA number two zero eight dash nineteen ninety nine. And it's going to take in care of America. But they don't make the money on it. Make it in Malachi, New York. Mm -hmm. and don't don't put don't put the Z or L. Just make it Malachi, New York. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have, that's our fundraising. Everybody else, a lot of people meant well. They had a lot of programs. They got a lot, of, but they're not to send their money to those people. They're not to buy their tapes. If it's not coming out of my office or my people, don't buy their tapes. Don't don't participate in no pledges or any other type of gift or thing that's going on out there because it's not coming from me. Okay. Everybody that's coming for me is gathering on the land on a regular basis now and trying to get back to unity. Okay. We're trying to get the family back in the power of love. Right. And everybody's starting to do that. A few people are still striving because they really never were in on the inside anyway. Just look at their dress. Look at their dress code. Look at the way they carry themselves. Look at the things they do. Look at their habits. Like right. Says, you should know the spirit. Everybody, not, when you see that spirit, test that spirit to see whether it's of the most high or not. Okay. And then you can see it. And the family has to look people guys, and they all make up their mind if they're either they're with us or they're not. Because eventually, we're going to stop them from being a part of AEO. Eagle, what is yeah. your what is your position on the gossip against the people that are on the land? I think that that's necessary for people who are trying to make some money and manipulate people who are devoted but too far away from the land. You have to stay in touch. If people would stay in touch with the land, call down, go up to their website that Rick and, and the family and the land is putting up, they'd be in touch with all the good things that are happening. And break away from people that are giving you all the impression that they're doing things for me their own way because it doesn't exist. What about this gossip that we're hearing um, referring to the attorney? How do you feel about your attorney? Me and, me, me, me and my attorney is close. He fought his butt off. You understand? Now we're going for the appeals. We're going for other things that are working in our favor. The ancient ones are revealing things every day. We can beat these devils. We will beat these devils. But everybody has to work together. I like Adrian Patrick. I don't agree with everything the way he did it. But I'm not an attorney. I'm a book writer for right knowledge. He's an attorney. I respect him more than you know. Okay. Part of it, I still think all the funds should be generated towards the family. Okay. And then from them, we can decide to pay him. Okay, and then dealing with that topic as well, 
um, your tribal members, um, some of them were hearing that they want to help, but there's some confusion in regards to pledges, and they know that um, the tribe has a tribal legal defense fund, but with the pledges and other things that are going on outside, how, how, who are they supposed to give their money to, or how can they better assist you? This is a tribal a fund, right? Yes. It's been launched out from my daughter, Rochelle, or from Rick, or, you know, to Hager, or the people who are on the land. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Then they're making it out to Malachi York, and they're making it out to your Massey Native American Moors of the Creek Nation. Right? Right. That's, and that's in the 1845 Louisville, um, Georgia box. You're right? Yes. Other than that, anywhere they want to send their money to anybody else, they're doing it their own risk. It has nothing to do with them whatsoever. Okay. And also dealing with um, the pledges and things of that nature, what exactly is the pledge and why is there so much confusion? I can't say I even understand it, because when it first happened, I was talking to Sister Tara Bodhi about it from the Atlanta Gossip, and we were having a good conversation about it, and I told, her, I told her, she told me they raised millions of dollars in pledges, and my answer to her was, if the pledges are not real, they're just a bunch of words. If you got a million dollars raised, then turn that over to the people in Putnam County, you know, or, or the office over there, turn it over to my daughter and them to the doing the case. If not, then just stop it. And somewhere online, they edited the tape and picked out the parts they want and made it sound another way. My statement was, if you really raised a million dollars, then turn it over so all these lawyers can be paid and I'll be all out of here and stop playing games. Not do a million little things on the side and then keep promoting it on the tape and keep putting it on the internet and taking bites and pieces of art. Cross corner every morning for about two weeks. So it's very easy for you to take pieces. That's exactly what my lawyer, Adrian Patches, was telling me not to do. That's why he said don't put the tapes out. He said because if you put the tapes out, people can edit what they want out of what you say, piece it together, and make it sound another way. I told them, and I still tell a lot of gossip, stop taking pledges of any form or any fashion. Stop collecting money in any form or any fashion. And any other organization or any other group is out there professing to be, you know, be working with me, I'm telling them to stop doing that. Right. Now, if we want to maintain our relationship as a, a family and a tribe, then co work in accordance with everybody else. Stop all this individualism, and by all means, if you, if you mean well, mean well, but if you're a con artist, it's going to come around. Right, and what's most important is your freedom. That's and what should be right. And we're near right. the door. They, they made so many mistakes that the door is open. Just today, everybody got to work together. Right. Now, what, going back to the case and things of that nature, because that's what's going to open the doors, what, what is it about the people or the beings that are putting this, these, uh, this case together against you? What is, it, what is it that we're truly up against? Well, we found out by doing some research. We have some people doing some intense research. We found out that Woods, Seals, and Royal, and possibly others, but we got for sure documents, which will be on the website soon, are blood-related. The blood I'm talking about is not red blood. I'm talking about reptilian blood. We're talking about a long line of reptilians. If I look, the war between Michael and the dragon is on. Right. This is it. You're in the midst of it. Either you're going to fight with us, or you're going to be so weak in your genes that you're going to be helping the leopards, or you're going to be helping the dragon and don't even know it. Because it says many people are going to fall to the way of the dragon. You follow? We are fighting the reptilians right now. This is it. If we win this here, we conquer the beast. That's right. So in, in saying that, I mean, the being that everyone's related and things of that nature, it still ties back into the tribe and them going after because of your indigenous status. Yes, yeah, right? the Branch Reynolds Plantation is one of the main spots where they raise all their money. And that's, they're, they're the ones that's intimidated by those people's land over there in Putnam County. And the only thing they can do is tie me into it. If people go read that book by David Ike, Children of the Matrix, or the other book called Biggest Secrets by David Ike, they read those books real quick, they'll see they comply with our doctrines of Vietnam and our teachings, this grand conspiracy, and even more depth, because he's a blonde hair blue eye talking about, he's talking the truth about them. It is, they don't believe the one that's coming from me, but he's telling you that they're reptilians, they're shapeshifters, that they're right. lizards, and how long they've been around, and all the families involved. Right. You got them sh showing the symbols of Satan, holding their hands up. They tell you all the families and everything else in these books. They're not that expensive. You can buy them at Barnes and Nobles. You can buy them. At, I know they have them out some of our stores. Right. You know, yeah. People need to read those books. They want to find out more about what's happening right now. Read the Rise and Fall of Elijah Muhammad by the Nation of Islam. Mm. You get a book called The Rise and Fall of the Nation of Islam. The Rise and Fall of Elijah Muhammad. They need to get that book and right. read it, and they'll see what's going on. This ain't nothing. This ain't no. This ain't no. You know what they call it? Uh, obsolete. There's a war between right. the people. There's a battle between good and evil. Okay, and, and and some more research that we, that has been done is dealing with um, your trial being held on Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. That's right. Now that was that was against the federal rules. Is that correct? They brought with in, in fact, while sitting in the court, the, the judge said, "Well, we're going to have this trial trial go on on Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday." And a lot of people, including uh, even the black marshals, all had the same look on their face, like, "What?" You know what I'm saying you would be doing this if this was George Washington's birthday. 
Ray, you know, General Custer's birthday, but you're going to do it on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Then we found out by doing some reverse, he violated a rule in the federal code book. Rule of the episode 56. Yes. And he had actually violated the law. Right. Not do that. And we're going to, we need everybody to make us think about it. Okay. Everybody to write Congress, everybody to write everybody and start saying, this man violated, he just violated the rule. And we'll put the rule up on the internet so you can go out. So you have it so you can send it. Okay. Well, again, it's been a pleasure in taking this time out just to interview you briefly on some of the topics that, you know, can clear things up in the public as well as know Tell how family, we family, I love everybody. Stay strong. We can do this. We got to do this. That's all we got left. And if everybody comes together, those people who are not working with us, eventually the doors of Tamarillo will be closed to them. The PEO will be closed to them. The Masonic Lodge will be closed to them. All involved with us. Not. They, they have every right to go on and do their own thing. This thing they're trying to make happen between me and, me and Brother Latif is, is not real. You understand? Me and Brother Latif ain't got nothing against each other. I don't think Brother Latif sees himself as a higher chief than me. If the people want another organization so they can do what they feel like doing, I don't think he sees it that way. I don't think he feels it that way, and that's why. I think he sees one chief. Right. I think people want that because they want to do little things that I don't complain. They, they want to stay with polygamy. They want to keep running Star and Crescent. They want to keep using, you know, L on their name and things that I said move away from. They want to steal. The people say, I'm going to travel with you wherever you go. You know, spiritually meaning, you know, I travel the land wherever you go. When it comes down to taking a journey somewhere, all of a sudden they stop going with you and stop along the way and settle in a little, a little part of your doctrine. Don't want to go any further because they like men, a lot of men who want polygamy and all that kind of stuff want to keep those old ways. And right. the women are falling victim to that. Right. You know, the family guide book was what brought us up to date to what we're doing now. You see, so ain't nothing, there's nothing negative between me and Lati. Once your talk falls in our family, but we're not the Once your talk. Right. We are your massive Native American Mars. That's our tribe. Yes, of the Creek Nation. And everybody who's with us will come up under that. Don't say to me, well, we and we want to make a peace treaty with you. We want to make a friendly treaty. You're making nothing with me. Either you're with us or you make that with somebody else. If I, you can go ahead and make that with the Washington's in, in, in Louisiana, but you're not making any kind of previews with us. 100% or you're not with either with us. Either you're with us all the way or you're not with us none of the way. Right. Now, what is your message to all the different organizations, civil rights organizations, tribes, and things of that nature that may want to come out and help? They better realize, they better step up now and make their point. All the churches better be careful because they're trying to set precedence to topple all black groups. There's a new movement out there called One Worldism. It may sound like some biblical jargon and stuff, but this is real. It's in place, and they're coming out after all of you. Just like they set me up and lied, and they can plot against you. They, one, they can use pedophilism, they can use childization, they can use recall. They got a whole bunch of new laws they got set up where they can set you up and tear you down. You all better all get together so you can fight as one block. So as a, as a, as a, a body, they can't hide you or tuck you under anything. We will fight. We will be seen. We will be heard. The Wapians will be heard. That's how, that's what we do. Um, another question I have for uh -huh. um, Chief Black Eagle is a lot of people are saying that one day we're Native Americans, one day we're Muslims, one day we're Christians, one day we're Jews, and a lot of people are saying they're being left behind as far as the doctrine is concerned. What What is your explanation to that? Well, it changes. Because what I was trying to tell them is anything that's real is alive, it's growing and changing. Anything that's standing still is dead. Right? What happens in our organization is what I was trying to do from day one is cover everything that has poisoned our people. Everything from Christianity to Islam to Judaism to Egyptology to Sumerianism, anything that they confront, extraterrestrialism, whatever they confront with, they're not going to be some people that are trained weapons who stay with me strong side by side and walk all the way. They cannot be shaken. They can handle anybody that approaches them, whether they're Freemason or Black Muslim, our brothers in Nation Islam or the Hebrew Israelites, our brothers the Moors. We we we're able to converse on all platforms. You follow that? Right. But we are a tribe of Native Americans. Those of us, those not listen. I'm not saying everybody that's in Wapping is a Native American. Some of them are not Native Americans, and they don't have to help us in the Native American part of thing. Those that know that they are, then hurry up and get on on the, on the boat. Those that want to say call themselves Nubians, those who want to call themselves Africans, those who want to call themselves Negroes, those who want to call themselves Latinos, those who want, whatever you want to call yourself. If you don't want to, you know what I'm saying? That's your, that's your problem. But our doctrine has been growing. It's been growing because I try to be unlike most teachers. Most teachers will teach you their philosophy, and that's it. I don't have a philosophy. I don't have a doctrine other than facts and truth. So therefore, I spend my whole time doing not one thing, teaching facts and truth about everybody's doctrine. That's why there's a Mosesism, a Christism, and a Mohammedism. And then I'll talk about Christianity, and I'll bring your, your consciousness to that, and then take it to a higher level of it so you can question it to make your mind work. You know what I'm saying? So when people approach you, you're not so easy, susceptible to crap. Because there's a lot of fast-talking, shrewd people out there. And if you've got enough doctrine in you to right now, ain't nobody can fool you. Now, two 
know uh, a little tree grew up here can stand against a storm, let alone a little breeze. Most of these weak niggas that have fallen away the wayside, they never was there anyway. So the slightest wind made them fall. But the tree grew up in he got his roots so deep in the ground, and when the wind comes, the sentiment and pride and jealousy and envy, and I heard this and I feel this, and they said this about him, and I don't know whether to believe this, and I don't know who to trust. Those niggas, those weak people fall. When the strong people, the wind just blows right on past them because they see that my miracle is my work. My miracle is not floating around the sky. My miracle is not making apples appear and disappear. My world, my miracle is in, now it says 407, it'll be, it'll be 500 soon. But right. my work is in my books, in the way I wake people up, the way I dove into facts and clear things up. If I, and that's what I'm here to do. I'm here, I'm a reformer. I'm here to reform them, I'm here to get rid of the lie. That's all. And that's why the devil wants to stop it, because he's the father of lies. Just read your Bible in John chapter 8, verse 44. He makes it very clear. He's a liar. That's his nature. So when you start trying to beat up them lies and reveal who he is, man, he goes crazy. So y'all uh, people out there in the y'all are with us. Come on home and get this thing together. You know, people who want to do your own thing, they never was with us anyway. They was, they was always straddling the fence. When you say nay, they say nay. We say yay, they say yay. They go back and forth. That was their game all the time. They just want to be a part of us so they can manipulate the land, manipulate the dress, manipulate the doctrine. A lot of guys, they use the doctrine to pull women. And, and, and then they sneaking around smoking marijuana and getting high and we do not drink we do not smoke we don't drink alcohol we don't smoke any kind of cigarettes or, or any kind of drug we don't use any kind of drug we don't believe in going out messing around with a whole bunch of women chasing girl after girl you're going to marry somebody or you're not we don't believe none of the stuff that they're making look like our doctrine a lot of and a lot of the people out there helping them support to make it look like our doctrine you follow yeah. our doctrine is factual that's what we're about we're about facts when we get to the end of the facts then we'll be standing in right knowledge Mm. Well, that definitely clears up the, any any confusion in that regard. Yes. So basically the whole entire format is so we can accept and bring all types of people. Right. And, and all those folks is out there pretending there's something different and still using our books, still using the word else. One, one person saying El Kalum, another one saying Anu, another one saying Allah, another one saying Netru, another one saying Anunnaki, another one saying, you know what I'm saying, Elohim, but they're still using what I taught them, but yet they want to be different. Right. They L this or somebody L that or that you know, this is a dark fight and they are still using what they learned from me, but they just but their pride won't let them just say, you know, let me stay up under the teacher. Right. Because they get the eat this the same thing Paul did, the same thing Peter did, the same thing uh let's say Bukhari and Shafi and Abu Bakr in the Muslim world did. It'll keep going on. There'll always be those people that the men get a little bit of doctrine and their heads get big, they gotta impress their wives and impress their girlfriends, and they gotta no longer respect the source. Right. They come in and then they got to pretend and then they create a fabricated, what they call a generic form of the doctrine. Where they add what I say and then they say, well, I agree with that, but at this point I don't agree with this. And they start adding their own, you know, philosophy to it. And that's where the devil leads you off the path. Okay, well that definitely clears up any confusion. Okay. And I think, you know, is there anything else that you would like to tell the people? Just tell the people that, you know, if you'll overcome this piece this time, you read your Revelation chapter 12. If, you're going, if you really want to overcome the dragon this time, you have to come together. Your powers want to be in your love and your unity. They want to learn to trust one another in order for us to get out of this position. Right. All right? Okay. Thank you very much. What do you do? Hello? Yes. Yes. Is this Mr. Malachi Z. York? This is uh, Maku, Chief Black Thunderbird Eagle, Chief of the Massey Native American Moors of the Creek Nation, BIA registry number 208 front slash 1999. That is when we registered with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Our Constitution of Declaration of Indigenous Status has already been in existence since 1992. Yes, but they refer to me sometimes as Malachi and even to insult me, Dwight. Yes, um, Chief, <coughs> I, I would like, I would like to, um, Excuse me. It's okay. Uh, I'm suffering from the flu, like so many other inmates in here is suffering from the flu and they're not getting them proper medical attention. They're not giving them uh, anything for the flu. They're giving them things like um, Tylenol and they're requesting stuff and inmates are really work on some spitting up blood and everything. It's just uh, total, there's no medical staff. So do the doctors administer the doctors administer the medicine? No, in, no, no, they got officers giving they don't no doctors giving out no medicine here. They have officers coming around giving out medicine. Do they have licensed degrees to do that? I don't that? think they do. Not, 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 I don't think they have a license. I can't say what they have in their back pocket. Right. But I don't see it. I don't see that order. Mm, so they've never presented that. Well, have a button inside the door. If you lock down, there's no way for you to get the information outside unless you bang or scream up, scream up. And then I've heard, I've heard men bang and scream all night, coughing and choking, and they didn't even open up. Mm. Um, I want to get um, back yeah. into the reason why, why um, <laughs> I guess yeah. it's such a threat that 
um, the Putnam County officials and things of that nature have been undergoing, I guess, since 1993, since um, the Massey, um relocated to their rightful land. Yes. So what is it? Um, you've written over 400 books, is that correct? Yeah, about 408 books, and I'm still writing. Okay. And I've solved many problems. I dove into facts, nothing but facts. I'm not interested in opinions. I'm not interested in faiths. I'm not interested in beliefs. I talk about religion, but I, whether it's talking about Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, I don't care. I go into the facts. I've done in, intensive study, travels around the world. I'm fluent in several languages, and I've translated books. That's what I do. They're so intimidated by the fact that that which I teach is starting to spread like wildfire. It's bringing people to a certain amount of consciousness. The kind of consciousness it does is the people in the European organization that they call us, which is the United Native American Laws, the Greek Nation, are actually doctors, lawyers, policemen, firemen, politicians, teachers, um, lay persons, um, uh, uh, private vendors, restaurant owners, you know, entertainers, movie stars, you, know, you name it. That all this the fastest growing organization is not racial, is not restricted to the blacks as seals and what have you believe. There's many people in our tribe because the Native Americans have mixed in with so many different people in America that we have different nationalities that are blended in. So we have levels whether you're full blood, whether you're pure blood, full blood, half blood, whole blood, you can still be up under the same banner of the tribe. So it's really a, it's really a very, very racial thing that they're doing and they're afraid, they're petrified of what I teach and how well it's working to civilize people. In fact, the United States government wrote me a letter from the federal institution asking me could they use my books in the federal facilities to help inmates. Certain books in particular with the mind and the potential. The and one man that they call a, a, a criminal, uh, is a man they wrote a letter to, which can be made available for your office, right? Made a letter to ask him can they use my books because because the, the, the books are so helpful to the inmates. Mm -hmm. I stop inmates from wandering around trying to sneak and smoke. I stop them from using vulgarity. I stop them from doing all kinds of things. And it makes them want to study, start reading, and look forward to a better life. And that's what they're afraid of. Right. And during the time period where they're alleging these crimes took place, how many books were written during that time period? I can't even tell you because I never stop writing. You have to talk to people who work on the books with me. Mm -hmm. I write books like, I try to put my books on oh, that. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many books. That's how I, I live my life day and night. I work on books. If I pass out, and I get back up in the morning, I start again. That's me. Right. I live for books. And so this this is known because I know that I've done research and I've seen um, the amount of books that just came out during the 1993 period of which yes. moving to Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess being being that, what is a new uh, I'm not going to ever define that word to anybody. You know why? Because that's the question I'm putting before them. You keep referring to us as new My question to them is what is a new -opian? And if you say a, a, a follower of Malachi's York, that's not it. That's not a definition. What is a new -opian? Because if you call a Christian a follower of Christ, it's because his name is Christ. So you can't call new -opians followers of Malachi, but they would, call, they would be called Malachites, not new -opians. So now I'm not going to tell you all what new -opians is, because one day I want to use that in court to say, you've been identified as a cult, a semi-religious cult, a fanatical cult, and using the word new -opian, don't know whether you're spelling with a B or a P, don't know what language it comes from, and don't know what it really means. You follow? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you keep throwing it in the public just to avoid using your massy Native American laws of the Creek Nation to identify that we are Native Americans and indigenous, the true people of this land. We call this land Moo Land before you got here, or we call it Turtle Island before the European tribes came here and, and, and infected it with their disease, or, or with their disease of hate and racism and war and drugs and pornography and all the things that they use against us that they brought here and established. Okay, now our... Are New Orleans, are they limited to Georgia? No. Uh, all the no. There's New Orleans all you, you go on the internet, you'll find New Orleans in London, you'll find New Orleans in Holland, you'll find them in Africa, you'll find them in India, you'll find them in the Caribbean, you'll find them in South America, you'll find New Orleans everywhere of every nationality. No. Okay, and all these all these um individuals have read um the over four hundred and eight books that you're writing and still writing. Well I assume they read some just got involved and gotten involved because the books are not written under the Wapian. The book is written under the Imagine Native American laws or some books are written under the Masonic Lives and I write for, for different... All the books are not written for the Wapians. Okay. Now, with um, 
with it, I heard about, um, I know the case was moved to Brunswick, Georgia, uh -huh. and I know the, the closing of the courtroom issue is because um, what I've re read is that the Yamasee Native American Wars of the Creek Nation were invited by the Brunswick Downtown Development Authority to participate in parade. Um, what does that have anything to do with you? How does that have anything to do with your court case? Well, what happened is the Judge Royal actually got involved because he felt that that was tainting the environment. See, he picks and chooses what's tainting me. Right? They were invited down there as a tribe of Native Americans, and they clearly stated to the people there that under the umbrella of our Native American name, the Massey, there are different organizations within us, like the Masonics, the Eastern Stars, the Shriners, the Amakti Shrine Temple, the uh, Egyptian Church of Caress, the AEO, Asian Egyptian Order, the Orders of Melchizedek, and different, different people from different, uh, have their own fraternities that belong to our tribe. And that's how it was written up. When it got down there, they saw all these people in these Masonic aprons and this, you know, and they were like, wait a minute, y'all told us this, but there were Native American, the tribe was represented there in the plane also. So was the Egyptians and everything else. This scared them because pub the public got to see us in our true light, what we really are, and not some fanatical cults that they're all going, humma, humma, humma. You follow? And it scared them, so they jumped in and started standing on foul suits, and they lied, they implemented my name, Chief Black like Eagle, and classified me with the Grinch, and I'm filing a suit against them for that. And then the, the tribe is filing a suit against the Brunswick, so stepping in, because we had to deal with the city, and the, 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 the county stepped in, where most of the racism takes place, and the mayor, and the DA, and we filed suits against them, they're trying to block that, so they had the same judge from middle Georgia step all the way down there to southern Georgia, and try to get involved in that, so they can derail it. But in the process, all they did is gave more advertisement to Brunswick, and now he still wants to carry the trial down there, still pull the jury out of that same area, that he openly admitted himself was already spoiled. He's totally violating all of my constitutional rights, and he's violating all the laws and procedures that go with getting a fair trial. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in doing that, they mentioned something about some flyers being passed out and things of that nature. Yeah. And I also heard that, um, was Sheriff Howard Richard Seals down there that is? Yes, we found out Sheriff Howard Richard Seals, and his boy, we got pictures of him and his people. They had located them over 250 miles. They jumped over about 30-something other sheriff's departments to be down there in so-called uh, undercover clothes, right? Uh, and they could have been one passed out the flyers. What I noticed when I saw a copy of the flyer under my name, they had my age as 18-something or 17-something. Nobody in my tribe would have done that because they know my, how important Because that's when I was born the year the Constitution of the United States was established, June 26, 1945. That's the year I was born, so that's a very important word. We know what that meant. So we wouldn't have, you look on that under the picture that I saw of me, somebody made a copy of it and put it in net. They pasted it together and put it together and was stupid. That was all part of seals. I believe the judge working with him and all that there. The cost is there so they can close the court down because they don't want the public to hear this trial. They don't want the public to see this trial. And if I was such, if I thought I was such a, uh, 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 evil man, why would I want my trial public? You know what? Shouldn't I be trying to hide this? As vogue as that sounds, with all that stuff they're saying, all that lust and all that sex and all that racketeer, would I want to have an open trial? Wouldn't I be saying, great, I'm glad to have a private trial? Right. In fact, I'm saying, give me an open trial. I want the world to watch this trial. Tells you right there that I want the public to see it. And the fact that they don't it tells you right there they have something they're trying to hide from y'all. Right. And I know that um, throughout this whole entire time, um, the tribe, the Amassi Native American Moors, the Creek Nation, have always been there in your support, um, whether they can get in the courtroom or whether they can't. That's right. Now, I've seen the signs and I've seen um, different um, protests and actually peaceful protests just right. sitting in the First Amendment. Huh? Um, how does that, how did the judge say that would affect during the trial? Well, what the judge is trying to imply is that the protest will influence the witness. Well, actually, Don Baskins from the state case is responsible for putting the witnesses' names and their pre twos in the public. Had a copy of a bogus plea on on the eBay broadcasting it with everybody, all these kids. I keep saying kids, but they're not children. That's a fact. Let it be known that none of them are children. Okay. And nobody under age with a child, no one under age ever reported being pregnant, or no one under age ever reported being pregnant and having an abortion while while it was under the aspirants of our organization. So, but he's doing all that there to use as an excuse to derail this case, to keep it from hitting public. Because Monday is going to be a frightening day to them when they finish their open statement, and they're going to see the power and the amount of energy and the lawyers we're bringing and all the inf other, other evidence we have. they got to keep the public from knowing that, otherwise the case is really over. Hmm. Now, um, this, this whole entire case, began because of an anonymous letter. That, when was that? That was way back in 1997 by Pauline Rogers, who they don't want to use now because after doing it, they found out that she had already admitted and came over to our side and did affidavit video things telling the truth of how she was bribed, how they offered her money, and the different things they put up to out in Clark County, how her and uh, Sakina Parham was, was meeting in the library with, with um, the constitutional general, Bill Osinski, and different things like that, and setting these plots up. And so now that she didn't tell the truth, they don't want to use that. But the worst thing about it is the fact that that letter was sent, if it made me such a dangerous person, when we read her 302s, right? If it made me such a dangerous person,
person feels, let me roam the street from 1997 to 2002 and leave all these kids in that danger because his statement was he didn't have enough evidence. So what, by evidence, he means he needs me to do more things. So maybe he's saying, I need him to do more things to children so I can get a stronger case. Mm. And wouldn't that endanger the children? Mm. So that shows right there that they are violated. That's called reckless endangerment. This man, is a, he's a dangerous man. Damn it. And whoever worked with him on the case, whether it was Jermaine Ward, Baskins, but whoever worked with him in that period of time was saying it's all right for this dangerous man to roam the street from 1997 to 2003. And he's a dangerous children. He's a pseudo pedophile. He does this. He does that. He does that. But we ain't going to arrest him yet because we need to catch him doing things. So when we catch him, we can use any court. They come up at the end of the day and we speak down the court. Mr. Richard Mo Moultrie stands up and says we have no videotapes from Mr. York doing anything with anybody. Oh, yeah, we have a couple of videos of him going in out of Red Lobster. Mm -hmm. They never mentioned right before Red Lobster we went into a Bible store and bought Bibles. That's they don't want to tell people. They want to cut off what they want. But there's nothing me doing anything with anybody. There's no videotapes of me doing anything. There's no pictures of me with no children. Children in any form or fashion. So if you've been doing this since 1997 in the generation of 2003, how is that possible you didn't catch me in any, any uncompromising situations ever in that period of time? How is that possible? And um, if I'm not mistaken, they, they didn't find any DNA evidence or the medical evidence. They found no DNA evidence. They took pillows and blankets and sheets and stripped them and had to admit there is no DNA. If I was performing all these illicit acts on this pillow, there would be some DNA. If I was doing it, they found a stuffed animal up the hill with a phallic on it and said, See, if, if you're saying the pedophiles used their tools, it wouldn't have been up described in some hill and some shed. It would have been with me in my house in Athens. Mm. Then they say that they found films, which is probably cartoon animated sex films. But then they have the deal too, so they're so called these witnesses are saying, I used to watch, I watched and destroy all his films. Mm. So if I destroyed all my films and you watched me, then whose film did you find in Athens in that little closet or cupboard that you said you found it? Mm. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, who, who, whose film was that? And it had to be the only person who would know to put something and where to put it at. Mm. Because she was the one who was taking care of 155 House and running the business over there. And running the bank runs and everything along with, uh, with him, Hustler Harden or Nicole Harden. Right. Right. So basically, without with everything that's been said and done, they basically wanted to go forward with this plea to hurry up the case. So they right. tortured you. Right. And then once you yeah. once you made the plea, mm -hmm. yeah, and once you um, basically realized the plot and the ploy and the fight for your life and the right. torture, and your family was more involved because you had access to the phone and right. things of that nature, then the, the, it began to shed that that attorney Ed Garland was really behind this whole thing. I thought he was a part of it. Once I got a chance to get to the media, get a chance to get to a ton of women, they didn't let me get to a ton of women to talk to my family. For well, five minutes, the best I could say, how y'all doing? Is the kids okay? You know, so once I got a chance to see that Kathy Johnson was out, she was back on a medication, even though her condition has degraded uh, terribly, which is going to be a problem, and that uh, Lamkin and, and um, Mary was back out, and I was the only one that they were still torturing. As long as I was safe with that, then I said, now it's time for us to put up our fight, let's get rid of these lawyers, and let's get on the ball and bring the public's eye to this. Right. And that's what they're trying to block right now. This is a very, this is a very um, tremendous case. Well, let's bring everybody in. Let's bring the black bands, the parties, bring the black Muslims in, let's bring the Hebrew Israelites in, let's bring the NWCP, let's bring Rainbow Bush Coalition, let's bring Gabio, let's put them all on the spot, and let's bring Sonny Perdue, who on videotape said he's going to address this situation. Mm. And we have a videotape them saying, don't let him off the hook. Right. Thank you. So as an indigenous person, you are claiming your indigenous status. Yeah, my indigenous status is Native American. That's right. I'm claiming it. You have only this. All right. Well, I have to know that I'm a Native American. You must. I'm the chief of your must. Native American Moors and Creek Nation. Our land stands from Alabama to the tips of North Carolina, all the way down to the tips of Florida, straight on across the Savannah. That is our land. All the Europeans, or Europe, they're not Europeans, they're Euro-Americans who are here, need to go back home where they belong, because all they brought with them was a lot of trouble. Hello? Hey. Hi. This tape is on. Yes, it is. This tape is being made January 1st, 2004, while still incarcerated in Jones County Jail. Right? Before waiting to be transferred to Brunswick to start trial on January the 5th. This is Maku, Chief Black Thunderbird, Chief of the Massey Native American Moors and Creek Nation, registry number with the Bureau of Indian Affairs 208, front slash 1999. Yes, Chief Black Thunderbird Eagle, I have another question for you. Uh -huh. um, the way the media is talking about this case has considerably changed. Uh -huh. um, what is your position on that? If you, if you really listen to it, you can see from way back in May 5th when they went out in the public and they told people in 2002 we got all these charges, this man's a convicted felon, he's an ex-rapist, and you know what I mean? And he's a pseudo pedophile and da 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 cult leader and uh, such and such, and he uh, pretends himself out to be God and all that there. And then the 
charges jumps into transporting minors across the state line for sexual purposes, and then all of a sudden now, it's a RICO charge, and a minor, that was not a minor at all, right? <laughs> and it is all, all has been watered down. The public's not hearing that the drama has been watered away. They're going to have to confront the public, the pu respond to the public with the truth. They've now watered it down. Mm. And it's simple things like child molestation charges and RICO charges. Mr. Young can be charged with child molestation. What happened to all that drama and all the facts? What happened to the fact that they found that I'm not a convicted felon and never was? So I have to return the guns. What happened to those people? All the different things that over this period of time has come to pass and has come to be true, right? Yeah. And all the lies that they perpetrated by the media has become to be untrue. Why is the public not being told that? Right. Because that's I know why it's changing. And that's why they're watering it down now. Because when they get into the court and it gets black and white, and it's going where he's never been a convicted felon. Mm. He's never raped anybody. Mm. He's never did this. He never did that. Mm. I'm saying he didn't transport a minor across the state line. He has no RICO violation. What the heck is going on here? Right. Then it's going to become clear. And right now, these are the longest days in their lives, too. Trying to figure out what they're going to do between now and the time this stuff is public. Right. Now, I noticed in, um, like, May 8th of 2002, um, they basically denied you your presumption of innocence, even at the, without being... Judge uh, Hicks. Judge Hicks, yes. Judge Middle District of Georgia. That was May 13th of 2002. Now, right. he also put on the record that one of the reasons for your, well, continued detention was for the fact that you had a criminal record and you were a felon. But isn't it a fact that a lawyer in New York sent some information down? That's right. A uh, lawyer that I have up there, um, I'm trying to think of his name. I believe if I'm right, it was Jonathan Marks. Jonathan Marks, attorney, uh, Jonathan Marks, called down during the, during the period of the court case, spoke directly to Ma Mr. Manny Arroyo on the phone and prayed up on the spot that I was never a convicted felon. Right. And that was supposed to be it right there. I should have been able to make bond. But Mr. Garland being with, working with them was not about letting me get on bond. And if I got on bond, I'd be able to work on the case. Right. Now, was your bond um, ever, the bond decision that was denied, was that ever appealed? No. It had 10 days of appeal, but I asked him, Mr. Garland, why didn't he appeal? And he said, well, he knows those old crackers down in that little town and they're not going to ever give you bond. Mm. He, now, was just, he was taking it upon himself and being working with them. I've done research on the um, other um, child molestation cases that have come up in the last five or six years, and the Catholic priest, and now even as recent as Michael Jackson, he was given bond for $3 million. Now, did they ever, did the attorneys, um, Ed Garland, ever explain to you why he did no. not go for he bond? He kept, he kept saying, literally, they're not going to give you bond. In fact, the Catholic ministers are back on, church, back on television last night about, about the same complaint. And they said they're not going to disclose any information about them because it violates their religious rights. Mm. They're very careful calling us a religious organization because that would become a clause for the thing to be going to undercover. Mm. So no, God was never intended for me to get on bond. After we said it meet repeatedly. He never intended, they never intended to let me in the street. They put this whole thing up. In fact, Judge Hicks actually got there and compared me to Jim Jones, a known murderer, and um, I think David Koresh. Mm. Right in open court, I think you're like a Jim Jones or a David Koresh. In open court, this is the magistrate judge. He just took away our presumptive evidence in front of everybody, and God and them didn't know about it. Mm. Now that is a travesty. That's a, a definite justice. A definite well, that injustice is going to be addressed in the file for suit for ineffective counsel that's being done against the Garland firm. Right. I'm going to stop blacks from wanting to go to that firm and trust in them. Right. Now you have, um, there's also a torture civil suit out. Um, I've learned about that, you know, looking at the news. What is your, what is your position on the torture civil suit? I'm let the again? public know that uh, regardless of how this trial goes, I've been tortured. I've been treated inhumanely. I filed it with, uh, with, um, with the Hague. I filed it with the international community in, uh, what do you call it, Geneva. It's on record day. It's on file with an organization called the NGO, which means non- so I'm an honorary member. My number is Iron 900. Right, the organization is the same as the uh, what's called International um, League for Human Rights. And people, we have people there working. The paper documents have already been filed. There's a, a bunch of other things that are going on. That the people in this case, the judge and his, and his, and his clan of friends, don't have no ideas going on with the international community. I've been filed about the way I've been tortured and treated, treated inhumanely. How my constitutional rights was taken away. How my right to fair trial, my right to speedy trial was removed. Everything was removed, just totally, just so they can proceed on with what they want to do. And it will not go on invest. Right. Now, Judge, I'm still with the judge. Judge um, Austin was recused from this case. Um, what, was the for, what was the reason for Judge Austin's recusal? He was recused from this case for some well, violation. First of all, I never understood what the PSI and stuff was. But what happened is the judge came in, and he was part of the 
the Klan so bad he wanted to give me more time because he figured by the time they looked, found out that I wasn't a convicted felon, the so-called numbers on the PSI dropped. And I would have been put in, I might have got out based on the amount of time I had already served. Because when you serve, serve time in the maximum confinement in effect, most lawyers can get that double time. If I also put that, that year and a half when it came out to be three years. And so that, based on the charges, how far my PSI uh, number, number went down, I would have been out. And they saw that, so they said, let's up with the part. But then in the process, he gave himself away, and it reflected they had a private meeting. We was trying to figure out how to go up to 20 years so they can guarantee I stay in prison. You follow? And in doing that, he, he violated a rule called Rule 11, which I later found out. Like I said before, I didn't know nothing about all this stuff until I got locked up and started getting a chance to study in this last minute. He violated Rule 11 or something, uh, where a judge is not supposed to interfere with the uh, 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 probation procedures or the PSI procedures until after the hearing. And then they had a private hearing, and I wasn't there, and I should have been there physically. So Garland and them all working together started trying to protect themselves, and they rearranged everything and went through the stage and phases that we're at now. Right. Now, you, you, sound, you sound very well learned in the legal as far as your case is concerned, mm -hmm. but um, what, is, what is the reason for that? The attorneys never came to see you, and I know that some people, they're, as inmates, they don't have access to the phone and things of that nature, or even access to family members right. to help them out. So how were you able to get the information you have now about your case if the attorneys weren't coming to see you? Well, what happened is I had uh, I, uh, a certain point they gave me access to a visit with my, uh, my daughters, right? And then they would bring me um, information about the case, and it would be with inside religious documents. So I'd say, here's some religious paperwork, and they'd say, okay, here, and they'd let me have it in, in, in uh, Manila envelopes. And I'd have to study it, answer them, and then when I finally got access to the phone, which is very rarely, my family will confirm this, I did the blast out as much as I can. Then I would talk to other inmates that, that I finally got a chance to be around, because at first I was not allowed to be around anybody except for the first couple of months when I was locked in the cell with all these criminals, and they locked me in the cell by myself. So I was, you know what I'm saying? So eventually I started asking people questions, asking this here, people started helping, then lawyers started coming on, people started sensing my daughters and them went crazy out there trying to find, trying to reach me and get things out to me, so they started calling people and getting things done. My sister was being manipulated by the violent gang, and they were trying to get her out of there, and then they started calling people and getting things done. So they started calling people and getting things done. So they started calling people and getting things done. And so that's, that's how we had this fall. Now, um, what, and being in the facility, of course, under the worst of conditions, yes. but what have you experienced about the legal and criminal justice system? It's amazing. They've got a whole system set up now just to lock people up. It's a whole game. If they're putting away people by the hundreds of thousands, whites and blacks, they got two different parts. One is crack for blacks and, and felonies, <coughs> uh, excuse me, for whites. Right? And they're locking these people away 10, 20, and 30 years. Boys, 19, 20 years old by conspiracy just on the fact that someone gets up and says, yes, that person saw me. There's no verification, no proof, no videos, no exchanges, just some person saying it. Yeah, that guy did that. He sold me this here. And that person could be an outright criminal, make a deal with them called immunity, right, for some charges that person did, and that person to point the finger out and have, that, and have another person put in jail for 10, 15 years. It's that easy. Mm. Yep. Now, what is your experience on, um, like, the attorneys do other, I mean, what is your experience in visualizing other inmates' cases, basically with your own? I'm How watching you inmates get destroyed in here. Mm. They're destroying people's lives by the hundreds. It's a, it's a racket. Like, it's like a manufacturing to make, see, part of it is to take away their right to vote. Because when they get a felon, they become a felon, they can't vote. Mm. So you got to make sure every young black man is arrested, every Latino man is arrested, every person of color is arrested with a felony regardless of how small, so they can't be a, a, a vote problem. Mm. You follow then they, they, they get them infected in the drugs that they bring over here. And only, I mean, most of these, not even are drug dealers or drug users. They, that's the only way they can survive. I mean, it's, and they just take them to the system that's lies and set up as an ongoing circle. I see people commit suicide, hang themselves, people stabbing each other up. I mean, it, you know, there's gangs in there and they have they different signs and they're being on the right side. It's, it's, it's a very sad situation. Right. And now, created it. and now with the fact that um, I'm going back to Attorney Ed Garland. Yes. My thought. Um, wait, he never visited you. Um, how many times would you say he visited you while you've been incarcerated? Wow, about, I guess about three times. Three times in the matter of And most of that was accompanied by somebody. He'd never say so. He'd never say anything. He'd have them do all the talking. Okay, now, now have any of these facilities ever allowed you to get legal mail otherwise from concerned people that just care about your case? No, it was blocked by legal mail. They would make sure I only got something from Ed Garland, and now I realized that that was done through his firm, and he never really said anything. So he wouldn't let nobody else in. There was all, I realized now these officers here were all working with him, so if anybody else tried to let me get any legal mail, which I was supposed to get legal mail from my family or any other legal institution, like the Presumption of Innocence Organization or Foundation, they actually open their legal mail. And they still to this day open your legal mail here. And tell you, by law, they're not supposed to. So the only package I ever get unopened is Garland's package. So, okay. It's a 
back and they all working together. Right. But as far as the, the whole continuance and things of that nature, what was the Judge C. Ashley Royal's position on you? Um, the judge was doing everything in his power not to get a continuance because he was afraid. He did not want a continuance because he knew with a continuance I have a chance to work with some attorneys for the first time. And he knows if I, I'm articulate. If I can work with those lawyers, we got the same thing. So he's trying to make sure these new lawyers, who by the way happen to be Native Americans or what they might call blacks, right, colored people, right, were, were, were hindered. So when I said, by law, I have a right to have a continuance, so I made them to work with the lawyer because you said I was getting evaluated because I would not cooperate with my attorneys. That, that's your own statement. So now I'm saying, hey, I got attorneys. I'm going to cooperate with them. Give us some time to get the case together before we can rush. But because he's from Brunswick, he had this thing set around New Year's, having a good time, and going home. If I, he, just, he just totally ignored it. So I'm going on anyway. I don't care what anything's on it. We have to, we have to show him that this country is not governed by him. It's done by laws, and he just falls in it. He's not the government. This is definitely a battle. It's definitely a battle. It's a war. So you're not another, another year massive war. Uh, we are running uh, 1715. Right. We're running another one now. Good. Okay. Like you will persevere. We will. We will. We will try. Definitely. What do? Nicole, are you alright? Yeah. Okay. okay. That's still under weather. And you get the flu, and nobody gets any medicine. You get pneumonia. Nobody gets fever. They got everything. And they just they try to give every tough time or or medicine off for everything, and that's a generic. And the ladies, these are many men, elderly men working on their sick, sick and you can see his eyes when they can't breathe or the pneumonia. And they just give them and they ask for medicine. They have people giving them medicine that are not even nurses. There's no in house nurses out there. Mm. Okay, but anyway, okay. we'll make it. Most high will take us through this. Decision. That's right. Um, now, it's my understanding that the federal government has gained jurisdiction over this case because of the move that you made from New York to Georgia sometime back in 1993. Um, what, is your, what was your reason for moving to Georgia? Well, actually, we moved back down to Georgia because this is where our roots are. Our family is Griffin, Georgia, for one. Out of Georgia, all the way up to, up to as far as from Virginia, from South Carolina to Virginia, all the way up to through New York, with the Shinnecock, and all the way to the Pico, and as far as Massachusetts, Massachusetts Indies, where a lot of our families settled. But our original roots we knew was down south in Georgia, at a place called Al Tabaha, right? And I always longed to come back home. So when I finished my uh, retirement in New York in 1988, I moved upstate, and I encountered so much, the weather was so harsh in upstate New York, because freezing up there in the Catskill Mountains. I couldn't live with that weather, so I told Kathy Johnson, let's find a place right down where our roots are. So we found out that Rock Eagle Mound was there, so we said, let's get somewhere right there, Rock Eagle, because my name was given, given to me by my great brother, uh, Black Eagle, which is Black Thunderbird. And we wanted to be near our own tribal ancestors, the old ones. So we moved down here. Yeah, I moved down here. She didn't move down here. I moved down here, but I was rushed down before I was supposed to come because it was a temper fascination of my life. By Ahab's, right? And so that made me jump up in one night and grab my son, uh, Ishmael, or whose real name is Dwight, by the way, which is not my name, and Hagar, one of my daughters, already from Kennedy, and come down here uh, to Georgia, to uh, Putnam County, where we had found the land. We bought the land from a man who was from Holland. Uh, he was Dutch, very nice gentleman. And the land was beautiful, it had nice lakes on it, didn't have much property on it. And I said, it's a good place to bring the family, so we uh, was all settling down here. That's the only people that came that I was bringing down here. Okay. <laughs> now, in, um, in the move, but at some point in time, you did move from Putnam County. Did, it have, did that have something to do with um, the civil... I did an harassment by Sheriff Howard and Seals and his clan members. That they continued to harass us and stop us and intimidate us. And I didn't want it to break into nothing violent or someone to get hurt, especially myself and my family or kids. So I decided me to relocate to another part of Georgia, where our seat is also, which is Clark County in Athens. So we went over there, we lived there, we ran an apartment there for a while to begin uh, search out a house. Then we found an apartment, we moved to the apartment, and then from there we made it, uh, we did some research with a real estate broker and bought the property, and then moved to 155 Mansfield Court, because it was a large enough house, so we figured we'll set up a business in it, because it's legal to have a business inside your house. So we set up a legal business, went downtown, registered the business as a mailing business, we distributed our books and stuff that we had done for me when it comes to our uh, organization, and set up there. And was doing well for a while until Seals found out where we were at, and then he started his mess over there too. Right. Now, but the
the property, um, as far as I've as far as the research that I've done, in February 2002, there was a civil case, CV 1-1, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. And at that point in time, that's Judge Hugh B. Wingfield. He put on record that that was not the property in Putnam did not belong to you. Is that that's correct? That's correct. And in fact, he made a statement very clear that I have no interest, which is very important because that takes off all the monetary in, 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 uh, interest. He said he has no interest in the property. Right. I have no interest in it. Let me gain. Nothing to lose. Right. I not give me the right not to visit there. I can visit there like anybody else, because I wasn't restricted or banned. Right. Uh, but it was not my property. I did not own the property. The property was owned by the Evans family, uh, the Richardson family. Okay. Now, since this case developed, I'm talking about the, the immediate case, um, yeah. I've done my own research in the characteristics of a pedophile. Uh -huh. And I remember back in May that Sheriff Howard Richard Seals classified you as a pseudo-pedophile, which blatantly violated your constitutional you know, rights he, being presumed innocent. He's a very sick man. Right. But some characteristics that I remember are that individuals live with their parents or remain unmarried. They always are secluded and avoid um, being in the public and things of that nature. Now, what is it about your way of life um, that proves that you do not fit in this profile of a pedophile. Well, the funny part of it is that, um, first of all, sure, how would you feel them said they was investigating me from 1974 when they first got the letter from Pauline Rogers, right? Mm -hmm. And when they asked him in court about what kind of uh, investigation they did, they said, we have to investigate him going in and out of restaurants. Well, that's not hiding from the public. Right. Uh, we have to investigate him going back and forth on multiple trips to Disney World in the midst of thousands of people. Right. And, uh, and that's not secluded or private. That's public. Right. Other than that, I took adults down there and, and wedding couples and even paid people was way there as a wedding gift. But right. I think, well, I love Disney World. It's a very exciting place. Right. Okay. I've been keeping up with um, the various news articles involving your massive Native American wars of the Creek Nation. Yes. Since the migration to your homeland here in Eatonton since 1993. Yes. Um, in these articles, they classify the land as a compound, yes. described as a cult. Right. I've been on the land myself, and I've seen no gated entrances or right. armed guards as the right. media may want to portray in the minds of the public. Correct. Why do you feel the media has painted this picture? Well, because they were doing it during the period of time that they was uh, doing the daily Koresh thing, and Seals began to be trying to pack with that um, David Koresh and uh, the star people, I forgot their names, and you know, the cult of, of music, which I usually call Cajuns killing themselves anyway, or you are not, they're not, they're not Caucasian, you are Americans killing themselves, right? And or Christians killing themselves. So he felt it was an ideal time to mix the two, and that's why he punched out that time, and then he started calling the land uh, a compound. That's another mistake they make when they, in the court, that Mr. Mochi to make statements, and he says, some people are stealing spirits, and saying the people from the compound, we wouldn't call it compound, or, Mr. Or, or Dwight, and no one would call me Dwight, because they know that's not my name. Little things like that, that are revealing that the conspiracy is coming from seals, you know, disguising his officers and going out and passing out flyers, and you know, a whole bunch of, you know, the internet, and, and trying to incite the judge, who was, was on his side anyway, so it doesn't take much. If I, so, I think the whole concept of making it look like a religious cult was very, um, was, 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 uh, what do you call perfect timing. It was suited for the time with David Koresh and uh, a bunch of other crazies that was out for uh, your Americans. So they needed something out there that was under your American to balance the, the scales, and they, they, they chose thus. And they right. turned it in, as you said. There's no gates, they're not gated in. Anybody who lives on that land or stays on that land can walk in, in any of the four directions, north, south, east, or west, and walk right up the land. They're not confined there. Families are free to walk there. Visitors come on, there's no course to walk on, there's no there's a gate that you pass through so people know you're coming in to tell you where to park your car, where a legal security guard has always been there, like any other park or recreational or private venue where people want people to be, you know, directed in the right direction so they're walking people on people's private, uh, into people's private houses or whatever the case may be. Right. Now, um, what is a, what is the United Nuwabian Nation of Moors? Well, United Nuwabian Nation of Moors is um, a collaboration of all the different organizations that were talking about liberating themselves. It, it involved people that are Hebrew Israelites, it involved people that are Black Muslims, Bible Fiber Centers, Garden Goddesses, uh, Libyan Islamic Hebrews, and so Nation, uh, I was going to say, Nation of Islam is correct. Uh, Egypt colleges, you know, African, Yoruba, everybody. You know, you know, it was like a place where a nation set up united, the Wapian nation of Moors. Right? The word united is, is self explanatory. Like I said before, I will not give you all the meaning of the Wapian because they keep using it. I'm one day going to put them on the spot and ask them what does it mean. Right? So united, the Wapian nation is obvious. And Moors, Morenos, which is a Latin word, meaning brown skin you know, or brown, which is opposed to the word negros, which also means black. So it's talking about a group of people who came from Morocco and here and settled here and mixed in with the Indians who were here already, which is us. You follow? 
Okay, I put that. all of that to make it like a unity amongst everybody. Okay, now, are you indeed the leader of the United Nawabi Nation? No, no, I'm not a founder of the Nawabi. That's another uh, hoax, an idea for Mr. Howard Richard Seals, and, and more slander and defamation of character, by the way. I'm not the leader. They look on Sun Ra's album back in the 60s. They look on, uh, what's his name, Carol Saunders' album. They'll find on the back of the album the word Waffle was already there before. And there's books written back in 1963 and on record in Washington, D.C., behind the nine ball, quite a bit of books, they, they don't have me down as the author or the publisher or, a, or part of that publishing company at all. You follow? So that's, they, there was something new and it was exciting. They grabbed it. They knew nobody out here would know what it is, so they wouldn't really investigate it. And so they threw the name out there. No, I'm not the sole leader. I was a teacher and I was a lecturer. I still am a teacher and I still am a lecturer. And if they ask me to come to lecture on certain subjects, I make myself available and I'll answer questions. If they decide to donate towards me a free will offer free services, I appreciate it. If they don't, then that's the word of my side. Right. Now, um, as a black Indian tribe, correct me if I'm saying this wrong. Yeah, we don't, uh, have, we don't like to be called black, but we'll live with it. Now, are there other... people don't understand. Okay, now, are there other races that make up your tribe, and what oh, is yeah. your position on racism? Oh, yeah, because our tribe is broken up from everything from, from uh, what do you call pure blood all the way straight down to, you know, full blood all the way out. And the people intermarry different races of people, they all belong to the same tribe. You know, you're mafia. It's, it's not restricted to any race. Mm -hmm. It's not a black thing, as they call it. Okay. And what is, because I know they, uh, the public likes to portray um, groups of this nature as having something to do with racial issues, and what's, what's your position on racism well, itself? Well, my position is real clear. Some of the books I wrote that they won't make public, they won't let the public know about, for instance, um, are there black devils? I wrote a whole book, because so many people have been calling white people devils, as long well, as I can remember, on the culture, through the cultural uh, revolution, that I'm saying, wait a minute, we got a whole bunch of black people that devils do. Mm -hmm. and black, the devil does not come in shades and colors. The devil could be black or white, it could be any dog on body. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I make it very clear. Because I made a statement many years ago, no one wins the race in racism. I think the thing is, it's very convenient for people like Seals and them who are, who are obvious racists to use that because it looks like a black organization, because we identify with Egypt, because we identify with Native Americans and the darker skinned to make it look like a racial issue. It's convenient for him to stir you Americans to get them upset, to make it look like there's some black group out there doing this and blah, 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 Right. Now, I've read in many articles that, that they state that Nawabians, um, quote-unquote, have claimed to be Muslim, Christians, and Jews, mm -hmm. and have been classified as a religion. Because, you see, you can be a Nawabian, and you can be a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, you can be a clown, you can be a police officer, you can be a sheriff, you can be an ice cream sandwich, you can be anything you want to call yourself and still be a Nawabian. That's why I'm not going to tell them what Nawabian means, because they think they know. Okay. Yeah. Nawabian has nothing to do with religion. Nawabians are not a religion. Okay. Now, have you ever said, or are you uh, really saying that you are God? Never, ever have I. Well, first, first, let's establish the word God has no, no, no real strong barriers because it's a German word. The good, it just means good. So, if you're talking to a Muslim, you would use the word Allah. If you're talking to a, a Jew, he might use the word Adonai or Hashem. If you're talking to, you know, a Buddha, he might use Buddha. If you're talking to Zoroaster, he might use Zoroaster. You know, it's all about the word Allah. You know, but the Americans, Americans are very... And uh, they're not allowed to 
to drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes or listen to hardcore or vulgar rap or those things or wear explicit clothes, anything of that nature. We, as Native Americans, have a culture that we believe in, and part of it is modesty and modest apparel. If all of these kids wanted to get involved because the land was so open, so they would see street kids come on, and the girls would have all these blonde hair and extensions and wigs and perms and the tight pants and all that, and they would be attracted to that. And that, was, that caused a problem. By the time the estrogen set in on these kids, you know, I mean, they, they started going to that teenage stage, they started rebelling, fighting with their mothers, sneaking up the hill, seeing boys and all kinds of things, and I just couldn't take it no more. Now, why do you feel there is a conspiracy to have you incarcerated, either by the government or by what I understand to be those who left the tribe? Okay, the children are, are tools being used by the state first. The government is also being manipulated by the state. The government stepped in, right, to do a state of favor. They know the state was lying to them. How much it feels and a handful of his cronies down in the Okamoki Circuit area, which is a bunch of, you know, the lake people, a bunch of racists out there who have been racist. We've done research on their whole history. There's been clans and Confederates and Sherman march through there and they're trying to hold on to the old good old boy uh, uh, mentality. They hated us from the day we popped up. So he just had to wait for the right time. He tried everything from every kind of violation from the doorknob is too low to the lights in the wrong place. There's no exit sign. There's no, and was closing everything as fast as we were built. He was closing as fast as we were built. Meanwhile, I had applied for my indigenous status. I could eliminate being involved with him at all. But I had to go ahead and continue dealing with it until them people would come through. If I so he was blocking everything, he blocked everything, he'd take us to court and take us to court, he was losing, he was losing, he would lose, they would lie, and they would alter the permits, and then they just went on. When they realized that that was not going to work, when the judge finally exonerated me, he had to come up with a good one, so he looked for the disgruntled children that had been thrown off the land for all kinds of things that I don't want to discuss right now, and use them. Hmm. So again, the government's part is that they will be manipulated by the state. The state wants to just stop us and our doctor because seals himself took the time to read our books. Hmm. And he knows who he is and what he is. Mm. To us, and therefore he wants the world to stop getting the books, but it's too late. It's far too late. I have a 407 book circling in different languages, and they're constantly coming out. Right. There's no way they can stop this, this doctrine from spreading now. Right. And now, the more attention they're giving us now, what they're doing now, has made the organization increase by millions already. Mm. They, they, they've done it, they've done their own sort of disservice by, by, just by, by torturing me. Mm. Mm. They put me in the martyr position. They put me in the, you know, the great person, the great person position. They're doing it. Right. Now, um, I, I came across a video, and I, uh, I thought it was going to be a, a, one of your lecture tapes, but it was actually a video during a Dr. York era. Um, you had um, music videos out probably like in the mid-80s, right. 90s. Right. Yeah, had a modeling agency, uh -huh. had my own video company, uh, my own production company. I had several groups out with, with tapes on the charts. I produced quite a few prominent artists. Right, now I'm on, I'm out in my record soul overseas, all through Europe and all through the Far East and even here, climbing the charts, and okay. I've got New York to love, man. That's right. <laughs> now, um, you also did quite a bit of traveling during your time. You've been to how many different countries have uh, you been to? Well, I've been all, damn near all over the world. So okay. <laughs> That's, that's nice. Now, is there anything that you would like to say before we end this interview that will make the public see your side of the story that has been blatantly misrepresented over the last two years? The, the main thing I'd like them to notice is why would they want to close the court if they have all this good filth and the public loves filth, all this lust and all this violence and all this pornography and all this uh, child molestation, why would they be trying to hide that? They're not trying to hide the people because the people are not kids no more. Why are they trying to keep the public from hearing this case publicly? Because I remember Linda Bright, when he jumped on the case with the new indictment with 200 and something charges back about a year and a half ago, the first thing he said in the article in the Atlanta Constitution was, I want to make sure that everybody hears every detail of this case. That came out of Mr. Fred Bright's mouth in the newspaper. You can look it up. So now all of a sudden, what happened? Now all of a sudden, they don't want anybody here. They want to hide down in Brunswick, close the court, select the jury, cable and TV so they can edit, edit away the truth. They're trying to hide the truth from the public. I want the public to demand to want to see every detail in this case and monitor every detail so they can see that it's a lie. There's mm. a plot to stop our indigenous status as Native Americans. Mm. Well, I really appreciate you doing this interview, it's and I know that you will. This will be a victory for you. Thank you very much. All right. What do? What do?